already got the marks on the seat. Uh, are you using? Yeah, they, they don't have the marks. Are you using the same thing? Yeah, that's the reason why we could use the 66 oh. cases on this one. Are you using the same uh, stuff that might be together to the IU? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
State ready? Yes, Your Honor. Defense ready? Mr. Fitzgibbons, defense ready? Yes, Your Honor. All right, good morning, everyone. We have uh, this morning case 18 CF 7525A. This is a sentencing hearing for uh, Mr. Cameron Heron. Everyone's announced they're ready to proceed. Uh, I have, there's a motion for downward departure that has been filed. I have read that motion. I have read uh, all of the exhibits to the motion. Uh, Mr. Fitzgibbons, uh, it's your motion and you may call your first witness whenever you're ready. Is there anything you want to tell me about the motion before you call witnesses? Well, just a brief uh, opening statement. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Go I ahead. speak from here or the podium, wherever you prefer. Wherever you're most comfortable. This will be fine. I don't, it won't be lengthy. Yes, sir. But, Judge, as the court noted, uh, we have filed uh, a uh, motion for downward departure and a uh, uh, sentencing memorandum along with that. Basically, that document, uh, number one, legally triggers our request to, uh, for the court to downward depart. And then number two, provides the court with an outline of what we uh, anticipate we will be arguing to the court with facts and, and cases. So we'll be supplementing that as we noted in the motion uh, during this hearing. The, uh, first of all, we have submitted uh, a few days ago uh, 43 letters approximately to the court uh, written by different individuals on behalf of uh, uh, Cameron. Uh, I would ask the court to make those uh, letters a part of the record and I provided copies uh, to the prosecutor. I any objection? No, Your Honor, I'm proceeding to them and review them. All right, then those uh, 43 letters will be uh, made part of the record and uh, will, will you provide me with a, a copy? Yes. Thank you. I can do that. Thank you, Judge. Now, basically, Judge, the uh, arguments we are going to make that are set forth in our memorandum, uh, and I'll just say these very generally because they, they speak for themselves, uh, uh, some of these uh, departure grounds uh, track the statute. They're enumerated, uh, provided for by statute. There's another group of those that are not enumerated and as we point out under Whiteside, that uh, uh, it's not an all-encompassing list, as the court knows this. And so uh, we give our reasons why they are legally uh, sufficient for the court to uh, uh, consider. Uh, the grounds are basically as follows. Uh, our ground number one is the offense was committed in an unsophisticated manner and it was an isolated incident for which the defendant was showing remorse. And we will provide testimony in regard to that uh, departure ground. Uh, the second departure ground, at the time of the offense, the defendant was too young to appreciate the consequences of the offense. That also is a specific enumerated uh, circumstance or factor that we'll present evidence on. Uh, departure ground number three is that Cameron Heron poses no future threat to society. That is not an enumerated uh, ground or circumstance or factor, but it's supported by uh, case law. Uh, the uh, fourth departure ground is a significant ground, and that deals with the disparity uh, argument that we'll address uh, in detail here at the hearing. Uh, the co-defendant, uh, John Barano, received a six-year sentence that was uh, agreed upon uh, in a plea agreement with the state and by the deceased's uh, family. The fifth ground is that uh, he, Mr. Heron qualifies to be sentenced as a youthful offender. We believe the court uh, at least needs to consider that uh, because he meets the statutory uh, qualifications. Number six uh, relates to uh, the extraordinary payment uh, to the Reisinger family of $6.4 million uh, by the parents and the Baranos uh, in this case. Then we have a couple other sections in here where we will be talking about uh, restorative justice, uh, the adolescent brain and all of the uh, work that has been done in recent years, the recognition by the United States Supreme Court that adolescents and young people are different than adults and explain some of the behavior they engage in when we, as adults, look at a situation and go, how could somebody ever do something so stupid like that? 
and that will explain some things, and Dr. Mayer will, will be addressing that. And then finally, we'll address the uh, uh, pre-sentence investigation report uh, briefly uh, prepared by the Department of Corrections. So that's our outline, Judge, that I will get into more detail as we move forward. Uh, for our presentation, uh, we intend to call uh, next uh, approximately 10 witnesses. Uh, some will be very short witnesses that will briefly describe their knowledge of Cameron Heron. Uh, some will be a little more uh, substantive and lengthier. And then after they conclude, Your Honor, then I will uh, have some extensive comments to make on the law and on the facts. So that's kind of our outline. All right, okay. thank you. Thank you, Judge. Our first witness now. Uh, I just forward. want to give the opportunity to the state. Uh, Mr. No, Hubbard, sorry, is there anything no. you want to want to say uh, by by way of opening on the motion? No, Your Honor. I'll reserve until our portion. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Judge, our first witness is Rob Mercado. Uh, all of, he will be appearing via Zoom. Uh, our other witnesses are present and will appear in person. Yes, sir. Thank you. Would you please spell this witness's name yeah. for the record? It is M-E-R-C-A-D-O. You said first name Rob? I have Rob. I, I think it may well be Rob. I'll yes, sir. OK. And this is the witness judge, so I'll put it up on that. Yes, sir. Say that again. Try that again. Can you say something to see if we can hear you? Trying to say something again. Yeah, but. Is it, it would be his microphone because it shows he's on mute. 
Yeah, I, I, we can hear you now. Hold on one second. State your name again. Good morning, my name is Robert Mercado. All right, one more time. Go ahead and state your name. My name is Robert Mercado. Okay. All right, we're working now. So go ahead. Will, will there be any objection to the court swearing the witness in uh, without the presence of a notary? No. Mr. Mercado, uh, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm testimony you give be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Whenever Mr. Cotter, good morning. Uh, my name is John Fitzgibbons. I'm Cameron Heron's lawyer. I don't know, you probably can't see me, is that correct? Correct. I'm standing at the podium in the courtroom uh, where before the judge. We can see you on the screen, so I think we can proceed, uh, and you can hear us all right and uh, uh, and understand me all right. Uh, yes, as long as you speak loudly, I can hear you. Okay, and I'm going to try to speak through my mask loudly. Uh, state your full name, please, and spell your last name for the court reporter. My full name is Robert Mercado. M E R. C A D O. Do you live here in Tampa, Mr. Mercado? I live in Eastern Hillsborough County. What kind of work uh, or business are you in? I'm self employed as a financial consultant. Do you know Cameron Heron? I do. Could you tell the court, please, uh, how long you've known Cameron and under what circumstances? I've known Mr. Heron and his family approximately seven years. And under what circumstances are they friends, socially, uh, business uh, acquaintances, or how? Originally, we met through a food pantry that we all served on together through our mutual church. And the family and I have become friends over the years. Briefly describe, if you would, the food pantry uh, operation and what, uh, who it serves and, and how it operates. So our church in downtown Tampa provides a weekly hot meal to destitute citizens of Hillsborough County. Cameron and his family would come every week, prepare the food and serve it to, the, to our clients. And that's how we got to know each other. Have you had the opportunity to work uh, next to Cameron? Absolutely. And have you had the opportunity to talk with him and become friends with him? Definitely. Are you aware of the tragic accident that happened in May of 2018? I am. During the time that you have knowing Cameron and talk to him. Uh, can you tell the court uh, 
what kind of young man he is in terms of his uh, demeanor, his friendliness, uh, other things that you have observed. In our relationship through our church ministry, I've known Cameron to be an outstanding volunteer and a role model for his peer group. I've also known him to be an exceptional student, church member, son, and an advocate for those that we served at the ministry. Do you have any other details you can share with the court? Uh, any examples of your dealings with him or things you've noticed? Well, I've always known Cameron as a young man with his, his priorities in place. Um, always concerned about other people, a leader in his group, and someone who selfishly served the community and took, took care of others before his own needs. Well, Mr. Mercado, that's the uh, extent of my questions. Uh, thank you very much for appearing today. Mr. Hubbard, do you have any questions for Mr. Mercado? No, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Mercado. You're, you're free to disconnect now. All right, Mr. Fitzgibbons, uh, next witness. Yes, uh, Tim Salter, please. just going to ask you uh, to maybe speak a little bit louder than you normally might uh, so that uh, the, the sounds get a little bit muffled with masks over all our faces. So if you just try to keep that in mind, we'd appreciate it. All right, thank you. Ms. Salter, good morning. Good morning. Would you uh, state your name for the record and spell it for the court reporter, please? My name is Kim Salter, S-A-L-T-E-R. Where do you live? I live in Amarillo, Texas. Do you know Cameron Heron? I do, I am his aunt. Um, Cheryl Heron is my sister. So Cameron's mother, Cheryl, and you are our sisters, is that yes. correct? Yes. How long have you known Cameron? Since, he's, since his birth. And have you seen him at, uh, on numerous occasions over the years? Yes, we we have uh, we've always gone there in the summertime wherever they had lived, and then they would come home for the holidays, back to Texas. When I say home, that's back to Texas. Texas, okay. Yes. And the Herons at different times have lived in uh, the different parts of the United States, depending on uh, Cheryl Heron's uh, job. Is that correct? Yes. So you have known Cameron then for the 20 years or so of his life? Yes. You're aware today that we are uh, before the court at an important proceeding involving the sentencing of Cameron. Yes, sir. And you are aware of the uh, events of May of 2018 that lead us here, correct? Yes. Uh, is there a statement or some comments you would like to make to the court? I would. And I, know, I would. Yes, go ahead, please. I, I really would love to just be able to speak, but it's extremely, um, it's very nerve wracking to be quite honest. <laughs> I taught uh, school for 29 years. I taught at the same elementary, and I retired in 2013. I taught second and third grade the whole time. I uh, was employed at, at a small school district where if, because it being so small, you had to work ball games, you had to work concession stands, you had to do senior trips, all those projects. And so I always got to know all of the kids. And then as I taught longer, then you really knew all the kids. And I just know boys are totally, are, are, are wired differently. They are risk takers, they, um, they act on impulse. 
and uh, I also have raised two, two children, a girl and a boy. My girl is 33 and my son is 26. And just the way that they, their behaviors are different as uh, my son would, you know, his idea of, of, you know, going swimming, he would do the backwards flips where my daughter, no way was she gonna do a backwards flip and she had gone to gymnastics and was trying to do that, but she's just not that, This it's the their wiring. Their wiring is totally different. And all my years, of teaching, boys just do things on impulse. And I believe that they, they truly believe nothing's ever going to happen badly. And so when it does, like in Cameron's case, it's tragic. And when Cameron got up that morning and was extremely excited about graduation, and went out and they were gonna go work out. And in most days, that's a pretty uneventful day. But I believe God had a different idea that day. And I'm extremely sorry for your family. Our family expresses so, so much remorse for, it, for them. I can't imagine what you've gone through. But I want you to know what a fine young man he is. Uh, it has been devastating for him and our family. And that I hope you can find in your heart to forgive Cameron and have leniency. Now, have you had the opportunity to uh, visit with Cameron and make any observations as to his uh, remorsefulness and his uh, sorrow over what happened? Yes, I you, mean, you can tell physically. I mean, he's such a, he's, he's such a wonderful kid that when you, when you saw him year, a few years ago, even he was, he was just so full of life. And in and, and, and great shape and everything. And when I came, and that's been a couple of years since then. And when I came just yesterday when I flew in, he's lost a lot of weight and he has trouble sleeping. I mean, it's a horrible, it's a horrible tragedy. That's what it is. And it's a horrible accident. And has he expressed to you his sorrow? Uh, yes, he he's such a he's such a kind-hearted child, and he always has been. He's always been that. He he just has a great heart, and he's he's always so sweet about us. So whenever I'd call him to just to just to visit with him and see how he was doing, he would always say, "Kimmy, how are you today? How are my kids? And I'd always, and I'd tell Cheryl, I said, I always feel so bad when I talk to him because I thought, I know, it, I know it's so terribly hard on him. Ma'am, that's uh, all my questions and uh, thank you very much. Yes. Mr. Hubbard, any questions from the state? No, no. Ms. Sullivan, Mr. Fitzgibbons, you can call your next witness. Yes, Your Honor. Keith Aschenbach. And Good morning. I'll, uh, remind you, I'll, I'll just go ahead and uh, remind everyone at the same time. Anyone that's going to testify, you just try to amplify your voice louder than you normally might uh, so that everyone can hear through the masks. Thank you. Okay. 
Good morning, sir. Uh, would you uh, state your name for the record and spell it for the court reporter? Sure. Sorry. My name is Keith Ashback, A-E-S-C-H-B-A-C-H. -E uh, Mr. Ashback, uh, what, do, uh, what kind of work do you do for a living? Um, I'm a high school teacher, and uh, I've been a high school teacher and a youth minister for the last 20, 23 years. Where do you teach at the present time? Tampa Catholic High School. How long have you taught at Tampa Catholic? I'm in my seventh year. And can you just briefly tell us where you have taught in the past? Um, yeah, I, I started at St. Petersburg Catholic High School. I taught there. Um, then I taught up in Ohio at, at Catholic Central in Steubenville. Um, then I returned to St. Petersburg Catholic, and for the last seven years I've been at Tampa Catholic. What uh, course or courses do you teach? Um, morality, sacraments, scripture, um, pretty much all of the courses in the theology program. Do you know Cameron Heron? Yes. How long have you known Cameron? Uh, I knew, well, I really started to get to know Cameron when I had him in class in his junior year, so since he was a junior, so. Have you had conversations with him uh, in the classroom setting and also outside of the classroom setting? Certainly, yes. And uh, would, you, would you describe to the court, uh, Cameron, his, uh, what kind of person he yeah. is? Um, so Cameron, uh, as a junior, when I had him in class, um, he, he was always a, uh, a fun kid, um, always smiling, uh, very caring for his classmates, also very deep, especially in the courses, the way that I teach. Um, I like to facilitate discussion, and, and a lot of times things will come up, and Cameron was always somebody who um, was kind towards everyone, uh, was a friend to anyone, looked out for his friends, and uh, just a genuinely good kid. Did you ever uh, observe situations where he would reach out to other people oh, and yeah. help them? Yeah. Um, my, my lunch periods are usually not lunch periods. They're usually <laughs> hanging out with kids and talking to them. And Cameron was a frequent visitor to my classroom. Um, where he would often uh, come to, to talk not only about his own problems, but ask for how he could help his classmates with different issues that they were dealing with. Um, his empathy for others was um, remarkable and, and um, much more than a lot of kids his age. How would you describe him in terms of uh, maturity and things like that. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've been a teacher for a long time. I am currently the father of a senior in high school. So here's the thing. Um, high school teenage boys are not very mature. And, um, and Cameron fits that bill. Uh, he, uh, typical teenage boy doesn't think past the refrigerator. Uh, they don't think past uh, what they're going to do right now, and Cameron was the same way. Uh, uh, although uh, a great heart and truly reflective upon uh, circumstances, not a whole lot of forethought going into what he was doing. Um, and so maturity-wise, I mean, I see that in my own son. There, there's just a lack of reflection and uh, forethought in terms of what are the possible ramifications for actions. It doesn't make him a bad kid, it just makes him a teenager. Which I'm, I'm not excusing, but it's just the way kids are today. And with some of your students over the years as they have graduated, <clears throat> excuse me, moved on in life and matured, have you noticed a change in your students as they mature? Always, yeah. Um, I've had kids come back to me years later um, and tell me, I had, when I was teaching up in Ohio, I had one kid come back to me and, and tell me, I, he shook my hand and he said, everything you told me was true. I'm really sorry I was such a, a jerk in your classroom. And um, those are rare moments for a teacher. They're important moments. And a lot of times it takes life hitting in the face uh, for, for any teenager. Um, it, it's, this is just tragic. I'm, I'm so sorry that this happened. 
so sorry. And <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> there, there came a time uh, that you uh, became aware of the accident on Bay Shore in May of 2018. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Did you uh, have conversations and or contact with Cameron after that uh, tragic yes. accident? Yes. And can you tell the court about that, please? Um, when. Um, when the accident happened, Cameron was actually in my classroom two days before the accident, um, after his exams and whatnot. Um, I was teaching and some of the other seniors had stopped into my classroom to uh, just say goodbye. And, um, and Cameron was there with a group of kids and I had freshmen in front of me and I asked Cameron, I said, well, I asked all of the seniors, I said, what would you tell them? What would you tell these freshmen who are about to embark on this? And what Cameron said kind of shocked me. Um, Cameron told them that he had transferred from TC and then he had returned to TC and he had spent his junior and senior year at TC and um, just told them how much it was such a special place and that they really needed to cherish the time that they had there because it was a family. Um, after the accident happened, uh, which was tragic for everyone, um, I reached out uh, and Cameron reached back and um, we talked on the phone a couple of times uh, through tears, uh, through uh, just him for periods, minutes on end, just saying, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Um, just really a kid who made a mistake that he had no idea what the ramifications were gonna be, what the cost was gonna be. And I've met with Cameron a couple of times. They've, him and Savannah have come to my classroom and um, talked and, and, and prayed and cried. And um, he's just, he's an amazing kid who made a stupid mistake. Is there any doubt in your mind that Cameron uh, is remorseful for what Not at all. Not at all. Um, one of the things about Cameron, if you get to know him, is what a kind and gentle spirit he has. His aunt spoke of this. Um, he wouldn't hurt anybody, which is why this is so, I mean, as, as a teacher, like there are, there are kids who are out looking for trouble. There are kids that are just boneheads. And Cameron wasn't, and he isn't, and his, uh, his gentleness and his compassion and his kindness just don't fit with this whole situation, which is what makes it so tragic. You lost your, your beautiful daughter and your granddaughter and, and that's something that can't be, can't be repaid, that's, that's terrible. And, um, and he absolutely feels that every moment of every day. That's why his aunt said that he can't sleep he can't sleep because he is so sorry. Now, um, as you know, we're participating in the sentencing proceeding uh, today, and the court will make a decision as to the future of Cameron. Mm -hmm. Do you view or have any opinion as to whether or not he would be any uh, future threat to society or danger to the community uh, going forward? Uh, um, I think that with absolute certainty, um, because of his tenderness, that um, he is not a threat to anyone. Um, he will be spending the rest of his days, I'm certain of it, that he will spend the rest of his days trying to, to do good in some sort of penance for the, the the horror that's become and the loss of life. Sir, thank you. I have no further questions. Mr. Hubbard. Yes, I do. Yes, sir. Good morning. Uh, is it Ashback? Ashback. Ashback. Um, the things that you've testified to, obviously, your contact during your time at Tampa Catholic was all with Mr. Heron in a classroom setting, correct? At classroom and then outside of the classroom, yes. Okay, well, did you spend any time with him on the weekends? No. Did you know of any of the activities that Mr. Heron and his friends were engaged in on the weekends or no, no. weeknights for that? 
Generally speaking, teenagers, yes, but not Cameron specifically, no. Okay, and at Tampa Catholic, there's rules, right? Certainly. And the kids have to follow those rules while they're there at the classroom? Yes. And it's a private school, so if they were to act out in class and violate rules, they could be removed, correct? Yes. Okay, so everything that you observe when you say things like he's an amazing kid are things that you observed of him while you were there as a teacher over him in the classroom at Tampa Catholic, correct? Yes. <clears throat> did you ever have any conversations with Mr. Heron about things that he did outside of the classroom? Um, kids, kids share what they'll share. I mean, it's not like uh, he would come to, I, I don't know the, how to answer the question. We, we talked about his life. We talked about his relationships. We talked about things. Yeah. Did he ever tell you about things that he did on the weekends or, or weeknights when he wasn't in school? If, no. Did he ever discuss marijuana usage? No. Was that allowed at Tampa Catholic? No. Was underage drinking allowed at Tampa Catholic? No. So if someone was doing that outside of the classroom, that would be a, a violation of the rules at Tampa Catholic, right? Um, uh, the, the rules of Tampa Catholic are for while the students are on campus at Tampa Catholic. Okay. So, so they're not dictating, Tampa Catholic's not dictating what the students do outside of the classroom or outside of classroom. We hours. have no control over that. Okay. And you never rode in the car with Cameron Heron, correct? No. Did you ever see the car that his parents had purchased for him his senior year, the, the Ford Mustang? Yes. Uh, tell us about that. When did, did you see it or did you see him? I saw it. it no, I saw it the, after the accident. I did saw it on the news. Did you ride in it with him? No. So you have no testimony about how he would have operated that car on a daily basis? Not at all. That's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Fitz, gets any further, back. Judge? Mr. Rossbach, thank you, sir. Thank you. Next witness. Dave, Dave Menendez, please. Thank you, Judge. Good morning, uh, Mr. Menendez. Would you uh, state your full name uh, and spell your name for the court reporter? Gabriel Melendez, M-E-L-E-N-D-E-Z. Uh, how old are you? I'm 20 years old. And you'll need to speak right into the microphone. Oh. We all have masks on, so sometimes it's a little muffled. Uh, what do you do now? Are you working? Are you in school or what? I'm currently in school. Um, I just moved back to Tampa from Orlando, so I am currently unemployed. And where in school? I go to Valencia College. And what year are you? I'm a sophomore. Okay. Do you uh, know Cameron Heron? Yes. And how long have you known Cameron? I've known Cameron for 10 years. Uh, when did you first meet him? I met him in seventh period on the first day of middle school. And that would have been about what grade? Sixth grade, maybe? Sixth grade, yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, did you become friends? Yeah, we, we became friends probably on the first day. And been friends ever since? Yeah, um, he actually took me home because I didn't have a ride. So, and that's how we became closer. Okay. Have you? Um, done things with them, socialized, uh, the things that you do with your friends? Yeah, we're, we're really close friends, so we always hung out. Can you tell the court uh, a little bit about Cameron? What, what kind of kid is he? Cameron used to be a, a very bubbly kid, very happy, never seen him without a smile on his face, um, very caring. Even after the accident, he was the one always checking up on me and, um, you know, he never, you know, he's a very caring kid. You know, he, he's very selfless. He puts everybody in front of him always. Uh, 
And you became aware of the accident in May of 2018, correct? Right. And have you uh, uh, had conversations with Cameron or noticed uh, any changes in him since the accident? So after the accident, I would say he lost that smile. Um, he wasn't that bubbly kid anymore. Um, but the things we did talk about about the accident was that he was very sorry and that, you know, he wished he could take everything back. And, you know, obviously he didn't intend to do anything wrong that day. And just overall, he's just very remorseful. And all he did was tell me that he was sorry and that he was sorry, like, every time we hung out, pretty much. Would some of these conversations be emotional? I would say so, yeah. He, he, he was upset when he would mm -hmm. talk about it? Yeah. Based on your uh, many years of knowing Cameron, uh, do you think that in the future he would be uh, a, a threat to society in any way? Before the accident, no. And after the accident, I would say no. Um, I don't see him hurting anything. And, you know, he has a love, he has a lot of love for everybody who comes close to him. and. I have never heard him say anything hurtful towards another person, nor I've never seen him get into a fight with another person. Um, like I said, he just has a lot of love for everybody, and I don't see him being a menace at all to society in the future. Okay, Mr. Menendez, thank you. I have no further questions. Mr. Hubbard, any questions? Please? No, you're not. Thank you, sir. Laura Escher, please. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, would you uh, state your name for the record for the court reporter and spell it? Yes. My name is Laura Escher, E-S-C-H-E-R. Ms. Escher, uh, where do you live? I live in northern Tampa in Lando Lakes. Is this where you uh, grew up? Yes. Where are you right now as far as work or college? So I am a junior at Florida State University and um, I've been home for the semester due to coronavirus. I'm in online classes. And what are you majoring in at Florida State? I'm studying international affairs. Do you know Cameron Heron? Yes, I do. And how long have you known Cameron? I met Cameron in August of 2014 in our biology class at Tampa Catholic High School. In your what, please? Biology class okay. at Tampa Catholic at Tampa High School. Catholic. And did you become friends? Yes. And good friends? Yes, definitely, through our class. Now, uh, you have written a letter uh, to the court, is that correct? Yes. Uh, now, you can either refer to matters in the letter or I'll just ask you some questions and whatever uh, is the easiest for you, uh, you can go ahead and do. Uh, do you, um, can you describe Cameron to the court. What, what kind of kid is he? So I, I have a statement written if this is okay. Okay, that would be fine. Okay. Cameron is one of the most caring, fun, and genuine people I know. Cameron is hardworking, driven, and dedicated to doing his best. He goes out of his way to help other people. He's the kind of friend who gets along with anyone he interacts with and is known among friends and family for his positive and friendly attitude. I can call or text Cameron at any time, and he's willing to talk to me about whatever's on my mind. I often look back on our time in high school together and wish that we could be in Algebra II or Biology class once more. I would love to be able to go back to laugh, 
play and enjoy that free-spirited time with Cameron as young teenagers. Cameron became like family to me throughout high school and during college. He spent time and connected with my family by going out together in the past. We've grown closer through thick and thin, and I truly admire his resilience and strength. Throughout the years, Cameron has been an example and model of fortitude through everything. Despite living farther apart due to my attending Florida State University now, I'm happy to say that Cameron has remained one of my dearest friends. Cameron's excellent moral character and loving nature are what makes him the great young man he is. Now to expand on that a little bit, and I, I believe you certainly touched on these, how, how, how generally would you describe, generally would you describe Cameron as far as his, as far as his uh, friendliness to other kids, his interaction with the other kids, and his uh, decency and things like that? I would describe Cameron as a, a very welcoming individual. He goes out of his way to include other people. He is extremely friendly and positive. He has the utmost care and respect for other people. He's consider considerate to people? Yes. Now you became aware of the <clears throat> accident that occurred in uh, May of 2018, is that correct? Yes. And have you uh, had conversations and discussions with Cameron uh, since that time? Many times. Um, I spent most of the summer of 2018 uh, in contact with Karen. I would go to his home. I spent most of that summer with Cameron and his family, supporting them and uh, being there for them. And by supporting uh, him, can you describe why it was necessary to support him? Uh, it was necessary to support him uh, because I knew the, the kind of friend and the kind of person that Cameron is. He's very gentle in nature, and um, I knew, and I know now, there is not a malicious bone in his body. He, um, he never meant for any of this to happen, and I knew that I had to be there for him because he's been there for me in the past. And was he suffering during this period? Greatly, yes. And describe that, please. Um, I remember um, in the summer of 2018, I uh, found out about the accident, and I was trying to get in contact with him or his family as quickly as possible to see if there was anything that I could do. And um, the call that I got the night that he uh, was able to come home was just devastating. The, the change in his voice on the phone and then seeing him in person was catastrophic. I've, I have never seen such a change in a person. He suffered so much um, and never meant for any of this to happen. There's a term that <clears throat> is often used called remorse. Do you believe uh, Cameron is remorseful for the events that occurred? Incredibly, yes. And why is that? Cameron would never hurt anyone. And this event happening, this, this accident is completely out of line with anything that would um, happen with Cameron. Cameron would never uh, mean to hurt anyone. Cameron's very gentle and kind and would, would never hurt anyone. Now going forward, uh, another term that we come across in the law is whether or not he is a, a future threat to society. Do you consider Cameron to be a future threat in any way, shape, or form? No, not in any way. 
Um, okay, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I don't see him as a threat in any way, shape, or form. If anything, I see Cameron as having great potential. Cameron is exactly like me. We, he and I share the same birthday, and we're both 21 in college, and we both have our futures ahead of, ahead of us. So Cameron is exactly like me. We, like he, he poses no threat, future threat to society. There's no threat. And you're aware that he is in college now during the duration of this uh, uh, matter. Uh, yes. Is that correct? Yes. Do you know where he is going to school? Um, I believe it is Hillsborough Community College. Okay, Ms. Escher, that's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hubbard? Just briefly. Uh, yes, sir. Did you, uh, were you aware in the senior year 2018 of the vehicle that Cameron's parents had purchased for him, the black Ford Mustang? Yes. Did you ever ride in that vehicle with Mr. Heron? No. Thank you. That's all I have. Any, uh, any redirect on that, Mr. No, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel Knox. Good morning, uh, uh, sir. Would you uh, spell your name for the court reporter? Yes. And, uh, and state your name first, I guess. Daniel Knox, K N O X. And are you an E or an A in Daniel? Uh, it's D A N I E L. I E L. Where do you live? Where'd you grow up? Tampa, Florida. What are you, uh, what are you doing right now? I'm a senior at the University of South Florida, and that is my, my entire, I'm a full-time student, so that's all I can do. Do you know Cameron Heron? Absolutely. And how long have you known Cameron? 10 years. Can you tell the court, please, under what circumstances did you first meet Cameron and uh, the nature of your uh, friendship over the years? So in sixth grade, I was a much different person than I am now, and that's when we met was in sixth grade. Um, I was an outcast among many, and Cameron left like a permanent mark on me because he didn't care who I was, and he treated me with the, like, the most respect and um, welcoming nature to himself that he has for everyone. And it left a mark, and from there we became friends and remained friends throughout those 10 years. And uh, to this day, is that to correct? To this day, yeah. Can you uh, expand on what you just said in terms of uh, what is Cameron, the, the person, the kid, like? Is he? Can you just describe his demeanor, temperament, friendliness, those types of things? Cameron is the most selfless person I know and the only person I could compare him to is my mother. And that is a lot for me to say. Um, it's like sometimes he's so nice that it doesn't feel right to me. Like it's just overwhelming. It's, it's a great feeling, but you just don't see it anymore. Um, he, the day he came back from jail, I got to see him. And the first thing that he said was, how are you doing? And that blew me away because I was concerned for him and yet he took the lead and asked me how I was doing even though I was unrelated to the situation. And it's, it's always been like that and I've been invited to anything he's done. 
I've never, you know, reached out in that way. He was always the welcoming side of our friendship, and he just made the extra effort for everybody, and including me, which made a big difference because, like I said, I was that outcast that people might not want to have associate with, and Cameron was much more popular than me, you could say. And you, have you seen those uh, qualities uh, in him uh, directed toward others uh, in addition to yourself? I, from what I've seen, it's been everybody he's ever interacted with. And it's just the most, the most utmost respect for anybody and the most welcoming nature and just being friendly to everyone he's ever interacted with around me and what I've heard and just an overall good heart. Now, you testified that uh, when Cameron was released from jail af after the uh, accident, uh, you had uh, dealings with him. How, how would you describe uh, his uh, attitude, his remorsefulness, uh, not only then but continuing through the duration of this case? When I, when I first saw Cameron after the accident, which was very recent, and then and up until now, so I've, I've been with him very often, like extra often since then. He has been a shell of his former self and it was not due to what he has lost. It was the, the remorse within him. And I know because I've been told by him that he would have, he would give himself to take back what happened. And that he had no motivation to tell me that. He was always asking how I was doing, but there were times where he would release how he was feeling and it was coming like deeply from within him and you could see physically how remorseful he was and you can see physically from his actions like not being able to sleep and just like not wanting to do anything how remorseful he was for the accident. And were some of these conversations uh, emotional? Very. Crying and things like that? Yes. Now, uh, one other question that uh, deals with the, um, is, is whether or not you, would you view Cameron as being a future threat to uh, society or anyone? No, not at all. I, the last person I would think to harm anything, including animals, humans, would to be Cameron because of how, how he cared about how people were physically and mentally more than he cared about himself. Mr. Knox, I have no further questions. Thank you. He, uh, any cross? Yeah, sure. Uh, Mr. Knox, did you ever uh, observe Mr. Heron and the black Ford Mustang that he received from his parents? Yes. Did you ever ride in that car with him? Yes. How many times? I believe once. Okay. In all the time that you knew him at Tampa Catholic and the time that he had that car, you were in the car one time? Yes. And when was that? It was whenever he got it. And where I, did you go? Uh, I, I, I couldn't tell you. I actually don't know. So nothing memorable about that one car ride with him? No, I, I got to drive it. Okay, so other than that, there's no other times uh, leading up until the crash when the car was seized that you observed Cameron Heron in that vehicle? I never got to see him drive it. He allowed me to drive it that one time, and then, and then it was too late to drive it again. Okay. Thank you, that's all I have now. Can you read a rep? No, Your Honor. Mr. Knox, thank you, sir. Greg Holder. Judge, can I approach on this one? Yes. If you could ask anybody to remain on. All right. Uh, if you just uh, remain for a moment, the attorneys are approaching.
case law from the prosecutor. Number two, we will establish immediately that this has nothing to do with his position as a circuit judge or former circuit judge. He lived a couple doors away and grew up in this area. Come forward. Good morning. Uh, state your name for the record and spell your last name for the court reporter, please. My name is Gregory P. Holder, H-O-L-D-E-R. And uh, Mr. Holder, you are um, a lawyer, is that correct? I am. And then uh, did you previously or currently hold a position in the judiciary? Previously. <clears throat> and what was that? I was a circuit court judge from January 3, 1995, county judge. And then January 4, uh, 1997, became a circuit judge and served as a circuit court judge until December 31, 2020. And you are aware that the questions I'm about to ask you have absolutely nothing to do with, their, with your tenure as a judge in any way, shape, or form, correct? That is absolutely correct. So following that, do you know Cameron Heron? Yes, I do. Uh, how do you know him? We were neighbors from the summer of 2005 until 2020 when they sold the home and moved to another part of South Tampa. So for about 15 years or so? That's correct. Did you know not only Cameron, but uh, his family? Very well. And they were what, a couple doors from you? Four houses down the street, and it's a dead end street. And can you describe uh, the how long, uh, during the time that uh, they were neighbors, uh, what interaction did you have Cam with Cameron and his family over the years? Quite a bit. You know, I saw Cameron and Tristan grow up from the time Cameron was five and until he was, well, 19. And Tristan is uh, Cameron's brother, is that correct? Yes, he is, the older brother. And can you describe the interaction in the neighborhood over the years, how often you would see Cameron, how often you would interact with him, how often you would uh, see his parents and the typical neighborhood stuff? Certainly weekly, if not daily. Um, the boys, when they were young, would come down. I'd be out working in the yard or washing the truck. And Tristan, the leader, and then Cameron, the follower, uh, would come down and what are you doing? Can we help? And I'd say, sure. And uh, in fact, Chris would come down and say, are they bothering you? I said, absolutely not. You know, my kids were older and were off doing their high school things, but these young boys just wanted to help and be involved. And so they spent quite a bit of time down there with my motorcycle, my truck, uh, helping out in the yard, you know, just doing things that kids do. And they were always welcome. And would it be fair to say that over the 15 years or so they were neighbors, you saw Cameron hundreds of times? Oh, hundreds, maybe thousands, I don't know, a lot. How would you uh, describe Cameron? Cameron is, and always has been, as everyone has described him, a very caring young man. And he was that way from the time he was young. I remember there was a time when we had a raccoon infestation in my home. And so my neighbor and I had BB guns and we would go out and shoot the raccoons trying to get them to go away. It didn't work, but Cameron and Tristan came down and 
and they saw me with a BB gun, a little low-powered BB gun, and they became upset. And so I said, all right, I promise you I won't shoot the raccoons with a BB gun. And I went out and I bought traps, and we trapped the raccoons. And so Tristan and Cameron would come down, I would take the raccoons in the back of my truck, literally drive these nasty animals out to MacDill Air Force Base, I would drop them off to make Cameron happy that nothing was being harmed. Can, was, was, um, how, can, how would you describe him as far as his, as far as his friendliness, his uh, decency, his personality, those types of things? As he's been described by Ms. Escher and, and certainly his instructor at Tampa Catholic, this is a very caring young man who was always respectful to my wife and myself and everybody in the neighborhood. Now, after the accident took place in August, I mean, in May of 2018, you became aware of that, is that correct? Absolutely, that day. And did you uh, have conversations uh, with Cameron about the uh, incident? Because of my position as a circuit court judge, no. I had conversations with his mother and father. I was concerned about his well-being. I was very concerned about his mother's well-being. And so my conversations were primarily, at least initially, with the parents. Now, when um In, in knowing him as you do, uh, do you have any information as to whether or not uh, uh, directly he was remorseful or not to what happened? Absolutely. You know, they, they drove right by my house every time Tristan and Cameron were leaving. And after the accident, obviously Tristan always drove and they would stop and we would chat. I would make sure they were wearing their seat belts and they always were. I would make sure that, you know, how are you doing? You know, as well as can be expected. And, you know, it was basically that last check before they pulled on the Bay Shore and went wherever they were going. Was Cameron pop popular in the neighborhood among the kids and the parents? Oh, extremely. Yeah, very well liked. Um, you know, just always there, helpful, friendly to everyone in the neighborhood. Was this a fairly close-knit neighborhood? Very close. It's a dead-end street. Everybody knows everybody. And the Herons, you know, were part of our community and part of our, you know, Gardner Court family. Now, uh, knowing Cameron, as you have over all of these years, uh, as a neighbor and friend, uh, do you have an opinion as to whether or not he would be a future threat or a danger uh, to the community? I have an opinion. And what is that? Absolutely not. He's not a danger to society in any way, shape, or form. And uh, the other part of the question, would he be a, a future threat? To, Absolutely uh, to not. And why is that? Well, as I've described, this is a very caring individual, and uh, you know, his instructor at Tampa Catholic mentioned penance. And I am Roman Catholic, and we believe in the sanctity of life. And you know, Cameron has expressed to me his remorse. The entire family has just been devastated as has the Reisinger family and the Robinoff family and the Barano family. You know, this is an event that has forever destroyed four families. And there's no way that can be put back together again, not by our criminal justice system. You know, this is something that Cameron will have to live with for the rest of his life and make amends for. Okay, sir, I have no further questions. Thank you. Mr. Hubbard, any uh, yes, questions? Uh, good morning. Good morning. Former Judge Holder. Yeah. 
Judge, you've provided over sentencings like this numerous times throughout your career, haven't you? Thousands of times. And you're aware that the Florida statute in regards to sentencing states that the primary purpose of the sentencing is to punish the offender, right? You know that. From Absolutely. I visited Florida State Prison. I've seen it. And you're also aware that underneath of that it says the penalty imposed should be commensurate with the severity of the offense, right? That is what the statute says. And you've sat through these sentencings and you've heard the same pleas that Mr. Heron and his attorney are making to this court. You've heard that probably hundreds and thousands of times, correct? That is absolutely correct. And there's been more than one occasion where you have exercised your discretion in not accepting that testimony and sentencing somebody to a lengthy period of incarceration in Florida State Prison, haven't you? I have, and I'd like to further explain my answer to that. Sure. There have been those instances where I have absolutely downward departed when it was appropriate given the individual defendant and his or her rehabilitative potential. We talk in terms, and our own state attorney, Mr. Warren, has publicly stated that we in Hillsborough County are interested in restorative justice. Restorative justice takes into consideration not only those innocent victims that passed on that tragic day, but Cameron Heron as well. Agreed, but you have sentenced juveniles, even juveniles, people under the age of 18, to lengthy terms of incarceration given the severity of their crimes and things that you considered at sentencing, have you not? Absolutely. Murder cases, I've given life without passion. Thank you. That's all. Can you read a reference? No, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Next witness, Mr. Fitzgibbon. Cheryl Heron. Good morning. Good morning. Would you uh, state your name for the record, please, and spell your name for the court reporter? My name is Cheryl Heron, H-E-R-R-I-N. And uh, you are the mother of Cameron. I am Cameron and Tristan Heron's mother. The, your family, um, <clears throat> are, are you married? I'm married, and, and today um, you call me on behalf of our family, so I'm speaking on behalf of our family. My husband, Chris, is right there. We've been married, oh no, 38 years, uh, and we have two sons, uh, Tristan and Cameron. Tristan and Cameron? Yes. Okay. So the family uh, consists of mom, dad, and the two boys, is that, that correct? That's correct. Now, you are uh, <clears throat> aware of the uh, incident uh, that took place uh, in May of 2018, correct? Oh, yes. And I understand there's uh, uh, a statement that you would like to make or some, something you would like to say to the court. I would. Uh, please do so. Thank you very much. Um, in April of 2018, we gave, my husband and I gave Cameron a new car for his high school graduation. It's a black, it was a black Mustang as you have mentioned several times. We gave Tristan a brand new um, truck for his high school graduation. That was what we did as parents is we gave them a new car or a new truck, whatever they, not whatever, but a, what, what was reasonable that uh, we could afford. On May of 20, May 23rd, 2018, less than a month later, I received a frantic, distressed call from Cameron. And um, he told me he had been involved in an accident. 
and it was clear to me that um, he was crying and I kept him on the phone until I could get to the scene helping him work his way through it. I said, you know, it's going to be okay. I promise you I'm on my way. And we talked that time and it took me less than five minutes to get to the scene of the accident. And he said, Mom, I've killed someone. And I said, no, no, Cameron. It's just, it, at that point, it wasn't even clear to me how the accident had, what, what had taken place. I said, no, Cameron, no, you're, you're mistaken. It's going to be okay. And I got to the scene of the accident, and they had um, Tristan and Cameron and John Barano, you know, in that middle part, the median part of the of Bayshore. And Tristan was sitting against the tree crying. John Barano was sitting on the curb with his head in his hands crying. And Cameron was on his hands and knees throwing up and crying. I feel responsible for this accident and I accept full accountability for my actions. If I could, I would step in front of Cameron and I would accept the punishment that you might render. That's how strong I feel about my involvement or my actions that, that, that led to this accident, perhaps. Cameron, you've asked several times, John, um, you know, what kind of child he is or what individual he is. And he, I would describe him as an unassuming um, individual. He's um, uncomplicated. He's, he's always enjoyed life uh, and, and our family is very close and very tight. And the four of us have just always enjoyed one another. He has many friends and our house was, was oftentimes the place where they all gathered. We had a playroom or, where they loved to play uh, video games and pool and uh, that's where everyone gathered. The friends gathered there and we were more than happy to have them at our house so we knew what was going on and we could monitor what was happening because there wasn't any drinking and there wasn't any marijuana use. And I can be assured of that because I was there the entire time. Cameron is everything you would want in a son. I couldn't ask for any more. When Cameron and Tristan were finally released from jail after the accident, their father had, Chris, had to sleep upstairs with, in the spare bedroom because they were so distraught. Uh, he, this went on for several weeks and I can only describe it as like a PTSD. And I'm not a doctor, I'm not trying to diagnose, but I mean, what I saw was both of them were so impacted and affected by this accident. They saw and continue to see the accident play over and over and over in their heads and I would hear screams at night from both of the, either of the boys as they were having these nightmares. They had anxiety attacks and panic attacks. It, this just past uh, almost three years has been the hardest thing I've ever gone through and the hardest thing our family, the four of us have had to go through. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, if you have some. Thank you, sir. And over these uh, almost three years, Cameron has continued to show extreme remorse 
he's, um, some have described him as a shell of what he used to be. And that's, that's a true th a statement. He's, he's lost some, so much weight. He's, um, he doesn't eat, he doesn't sleep. We've had to seek help from a, a therapist who's worked with us. And I have attended almost every single one of those sessions while not always in there, but I was there to support Cameron. He continues to suffer from the nightmares and that I, I you know, wasn't there, but the impact plays over and over in his head. It'll never go away. And I, he's gonna have to figure out a way to live with this for the rest of his life. And I can't tell you, I mean, there's this point where the risk of suicide has been very true and Chris and I have both tried, and, can't, and Tristan have tried our hardest to circle around him and make sure that suicide does, isn't a part of our lives. He's got so much to live for, even though he made a terrible, terrible mistake. It's tragic. But he's got a lot to live for, and he will be able, and I know he's going to spend the rest of his life carrying this memory, but he's committed to working towards retribution for his actions. And his father and I are committed to supporting him in this effort, however we can, whether it be financially, emotionally, or spiritually. We are very remorseful, very sorrowful, and regretful for what happened. We offer our sincerest apologies to the two families, to Mr. Rovano and the Reisinger family. We hope all of you can find room in your hearts to forgive everyone that was involved in this accident, not just the Herons, but the Baranos as well. It was an accident. It was an intentional act. It was just a tragedy, a tragic accident. Okay. One thing I wanted to ask you about just briefly uh, was the decision to buy the Mustang. Yes. How did that come about? How did you pick that particular car? It was, um, I don't even remember the year of it, but it was a late year, or it was older, and they was, it was almost like, I think, two years older. But it was brand new, and it was, had never been driven. It had very few miles on it. I, I don't remember exactly, but less than like 100 miles on it. But you went and to the, the dealership, and was there uh, something that attracted cost-wise or otherwise? Oh, it's very, it, yeah, with, with all the discounts, it was below market value. And I mean, that's what was most, uh, I guess, attractive to us is it was within our price range. And it was very, I remember it was, uh, well, I, I don't wanna, I, I think it was around 29,000. And that's less than market value. Okay. Now, one other matter I wanna address briefly involves the uh, payment of funds to the rice of your family. Yes. The, um, you have read the pleading that we have filed, is that correct? Yes. And the amount of money uh, that is set forth here of 6.4 million, that was a combination of insurance monies and personal contributions by the Heron family, is that correct? That's correct. And the personal, uh, first of all, the personal payment of 500,000, Yes. Did that necessitate a change in your residence? Yes, we had to sell our house. So, I'm sorry? Yes, we had to sell our house. And you moved to another? And uh, we moved to location. a much smaller house, about the third of the size, and 
that um, third of the value. Then uh, the other matter as part of this I want to address is the $5 million umbrella yes. policy yes. that paid $5 million of the $6.4 million. Yes. Was, uh, was there an exclusion yes. in the umbrella policy that would cause the insurance company to absolutely decline to pay that money? Yes. There's a, an exclusion for racing on the plug. And they uh, render, uh, when we ask for coverage under the plug and payment to be uh, rendered, they, the insurance company um, said they needed to do a full investigation. They um, only would handle it under a reservation of rights. And the reservation of rights stated that if racing was found, to, to be true, there would be no $5 million payment rendered. And that would mean basically the insurance company policies have provisions and they will say for certain things that they happen, we don't pay under this policy. Is that correct? That's right. And racing was specifically stated in the policy. Specifically excluded. That it was excluded. Now, did you undertake efforts uh, to uh, try to compel the insurance company yes. and did successfully compel them to pay the money to the Reisingers by hiring your own lawyers. Yes. And they. You, um, yes, sir. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean and I work. just want to move through this, but you hired several different civil lawyers, mm -hmm. including a type of lawyer who is known as a either a coverage counsel mm -hmm. and then or a bad faith lawyer mm. to basically um, make it clear to the insurance company, you better pay up. Yes, yes. And you were successful with that, is that correct? That's correct. Um, we had, um, I think at 1.5 different attorneys hired to try to get, make sure that the money was, benefits were provided to the families that um, suffered the great loss. Now, as part of the proceedings and the dealings with all the lawyers, uh, you, you didn't have $5 million to pay. Oh, no. Yeah. And one of the lawyers who was involved in this was a bankruptcy lawyer, correct? That's correct. And you received advice that mm -hmm. you could declare bankruptcy, mm -hmm. and then that would, uh, even if there was a judgment against you, say if the Reisingers had brought a lawsuit and won, won uh, $100 million, mm -hmm. you could then go into the bankruptcy court per your lawyer and have it totally discharged in the bankruptcy proceedings. That's correct. Now, you did not, the Herons did not declare bankruptcy, is that correct? That's correct. And why didn't you? Because I felt like it was the wrong thing to do. I yeah. wanted to, I, I just did not want to um, declare bankruptcy because it's, it just wasn't right. And I was willing to stand up and be responsible. And um, John, that's all that happened. I mean, that's what happened. Oh, but you need to speak up a little, please. That's what happened. Um, we did not, we were, they was recommended by our attorneys, both coverage uh, and uh, personal attorneys and the financial attorney to file bankruptcy so that we could um, make, sh so that we wouldn't be held responsible for money, any additional money. And we didn't feel that that was right. And so we didn't. We sold our house instead. And was that part of the, was one of the major reasons you wanted to do everything you could uh, to uh, make amends to the Reisinger family. Yes, yes. You were also aware during this time that the state of Florida had charged uh, your son Cameron with racing. Yep. So if the state's position was, was correct, that gave the insurance company a way right out, a very wide door 
to walk right out and deny coverage, and that would be it. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And that's why uh, it was so important to attempt to get this settled prior to any lawsuit, because I knew they would lose their benefits. No, I didn't know that, but I felt it was it was so. It was just my fear. Well, you, you, uh, the re what you just said, you knew that the insurance company would come into the lawsuit and uh, move to file a motion to exclude any $5 million umbrella policy because uh, racing was the heart of the case of the state. The two boys were racing. And you were concerned that the, st the insurance company would win and win very easily, correct? That's what I yeah, meant, yeah. Now, would you tell the court, please, why you know this and the experience that you have had in your uh, professional career in the insurance industry. Okay, um, I worked for an insurer for 30 years. I'm retired now, but I was um, in the executive um, branch for about 20 years. I had vice presidents reporting to me. Um, I handled litigation for um, several states. So I, I'm familiar with coverage issues, and I'm also familiar with the position that insur insurers can take to make sure they're not paying $5 million. That's a big, big sum. And as I understand it, was it at one point, were you in charge of California? Yes. And all claims and lawsuits and things like that? I was in charge of the litigation unit, extra contractual, bad faith, and, um, the underlying coverages as well. And your employer was one of the biggest insurance companies in the world. That's correct. And then did you then move, I believe, to Texas and handle? Texas litigation first, California second, um, and then Florida. Uh, three of the biggest states in America. Yep. Involving billions and billions of insurance coverage. Correct. And to sum up on this is, you stayed out of the bankruptcy court. You hired lawyers to put uh, legal pressure on the carrier to pay the five million. Yep. And that's where that five million came from. And then the 500,000 required you to sell your house. Yes. And this was all because of trying to help the Reisinger family. Yes, I, I just felt very strongly that they deserve the benefits that we had um, paid for. And I wanted that to be, that, that to occur. All right, Mrs. Heron, uh, thank you. I have no further questions. All right. Mr. Hubbard, any uh, questions from the state? Just, just briefly, because you, you make a big deal out of this sale of the house that hurt you financially. Is that basically what you're conveying to the court? Well, yes, we had to sell our house and move into a much smaller home. And you sold your house in June of 2019 at $885,000, Right, correct? yes. And then that same month in June, you turned around and bought another house at $640,648, correct? That's correct. So you went down to about $200,000 less home. Yes. Uh, and the original home on Gardner Court had five bedrooms, right? Yes. And the house that you bought only had four? Three. It's yes. not listed as a four bedroom, four bath, 3,000 square foot home? It is a three bed, we have three bedrooms. I'm sorry, three rooms, that's all I have. Can you redirect? I know, Your Honor. Okay. Ms. Heron, thank you. Thank you. Your Honor, Cameron Heron. Your Honor, we, uh, we may want to stay at the podium. Uh, yes, sir. That, okay. That's, that's, um, Tell you what, let's take about five minute recess. Okay, thank you. And then we'll, we'll come back and hear from Mr. Hammond.
One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Test, test, test.
State ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Defense ready? We are, Judge. All right. Uh, Mr. Fitzgibbons, you can call your next witness. Yes. No, well, he will not be testifying. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Judge, I have a, a, just a statement that I'm going to read on behalf of uh, Cameron Heron. Yes, sir. And uh, uh, to begin, I would like to apologize to the family that lost two beautiful souls. The amount of remorse, sorrow, and regret that I feel is unfathomable. But I could not possibly imagine how you feel. I know that nothing can be done to turn back the clock, but I will and would do anything in my power to fix it. I am so sorry for what I did and what I caused. God. What is it? God. God is with these two beautiful souls and I have no doubt that they are at peace. I had my last faith before the accident. I had lost, I'm sorry, Judge, just a little hard reading with the mask uh, yes, sir. <laughs> fogging up a bit. I had, I had lost my faith before the accident, but I, brought it, but I brought it back afterwards and was confirmed uh, to the Catholic Church soon thereafter. Along with my family, I will be carrying these two precious lives with me forever and wherever I go. I would also like to apologize to my friends and family for what I put them through, and I could never repay any of them for the support that I have received from them. I always pray for the Reisinger and Rabinow families because your pain must be uncon unconscionable. My life will be dedicated to repaying the cost of the lives that I took. And if given the chance, I will do everything in my power to prevent any uh, fatal accident from ever occurring again. And that would be his statement. All right, thank you. Thank you, Judge. I'd like to recall Cheryl Heron very, very briefly. She's still under oath. Mrs. Heron, uh, at, uh, at the break you had mentioned there was something about the house sale that you wanted to correct the record. Yes, I do. Thank you. Yes. Um, the house was sold at a significant loss. The market value of the house was $1.1 million. We sold the house and agreed to sell it at a loss because we needed to get out from underneath the payments. And so by buying a home that was then, um, the market value was one half of, or almost one half of what we uh, currently own, it brought our payments to, um, gosh, almost a third, uh, two thirds less. This would be your monthly mortgage payment? Yeah, monthly mortgage okay. payment. And that's what we were looking for is how we, I mean, both of us retired, we need to be able to figure out a way to make it through. Okay. Does that conclude what you want to tell the court? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hubbard, any follow-up no, on that? No, thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Michael Mayer, please. Yes, sir. I'll be glad to some water.
whenever you're ready. Thank you, Judge. Uh, state your name uh, for the record and spell it for the court reporter, please. Michael Scott Mayer, M-A-H-E-R-M-D. And uh, Dr. Mayer, uh, you are, well, tell us uh, your uh, professional credentials, what you're certified in. Yes. I am a medical doctor licensed to practice medicine in the state of Florida. I have a board certification in psychiatry. I am formally board certified in forensic psychiatry. I have been engaged in the act in active practice of psychiatry in the uh, Tampa community for approximately 40 years. I have served on various committees and was a uh, assistant professor at the University of South Florida College of Medicine for many years. I have been engaged in the practice of treating adults and children in my office. I have also been engaged in the uh, criminal justice system from various different points of view at different times uh, and qualified to testify in court on many occasions. I work with families and children regarding mental health issues and uh, with the court system regarding criminal and civil as well as dependency, which means child abuse matters in the state of Florida. Do you know Cameron Heron? I do. And has he been a patient of yours? He has. Would you uh, first tell us, um, uh, when did you first see Cameron Heron in your office? I first saw him following this tragic uh, accident uh, in June of 2018. Um, he was uh, distressed and um, his family was overwhelmed. Um, I believe he actually got my name through you, his attorney. Um, I agreed to see him for an evaluation and then agreed to see him as a patient. Uh, since um, that uh, day in, I guess it would be May or June of 2018, uh, is that correct? Yes, June. Uh, a short time after the accident, yes. is that correct? How many times <clears throat> have you uh, met with Cameron Heron? I've met with him in person in my office between approximately 30 to 40 times. Uh, I have also spoken with him on the phone and his family members probably another at least 30 to 40 times. So keeping it kind of general for a, a few moments here, were, was Cameron in some distress when you first met with him? He was in extreme distress. He was not out of touch with reality, but his ability to be rationally and logically connected to his surroundings and his circumstances was uh, weak and failing. Did you find it necessary to prescribe medications? I did. What medications did you prescribe and uh, what was the diagnosis? that resulted in those prescriptions? The initial diagnosis was an acute stress syndrome related to what he described to me as, I killed two people. And his terror and horror at thinking that he had done such a thing and that he was responsible for such a thing. Um, he was prescribed antidepressant and anti-anxiety medications in order to allow him to sleep and maintain reasonable, logical connection with reality. And from the beginning, uh, did he accept responsibility for what he did? He did indeed. I noted today in the testimony, and I've heard this before, that he called his mother and said, I killed two people. I'm familiar with these circumstances from 40 years of experience and, and training, and it is noteworthy that he didn't say there was an accident. He didn't say people died. He didn't say, I'm in trouble. He didn't say the police are here. He said to his mother, I killed two people. Right from the very start, 
he took responsibility, and my experience and information indicates he has always and completely accepted responsibility. That is the first step on the road to genuine remorse. So if you would, would you take us through um, the different uh, meetings in your office and how things progressed during uh, the course of uh, your treatment, kind of a 30,000 foot view. Sure, uh, maybe a 5,000 foot view, if you will. Um, within a few weeks, I became less concerned that he was gonna completely disconnect with reality and require hospitalization. He stabilized a bit. Uh, that was partly related to his return to his faith, his belief in God, his uh, understanding that God forgives. He might never be able to forgive himself, but God forgives. He didn't believe that God would forgive him, but he believed that God does forgive. In the initial weeks of treatment, he had the illogical, disconnected fantasy that he could somehow trade his life for these two people he killed. He knew cognitively, intellectually, that that wouldn't happen. But he repeatedly returned to that theme in his interactions with me. I noted in the testimony today that one of, the, one of his friends said something about trading his life. I had never heard that before from someone else, but I heard it from him repeatedly in the first weeks of his treatment. He knew that that couldn't happen. He knew that if he killed himself, that wouldn't bring anybody back and it would make things worse, but he was preoccupied with fixing this, with turning the clock back, with doing something magical that would change things, and was absolutely committed to doing anything that he could possibly do. I worked with him to help him understand that it wasn't an either-or thing. It wasn't bring these people back to life or give up on life that there was something in between. There was some hope to move forward, to stay alive, to work, to be a part of his family, to face up to the charges and accept responsibility that had value. That was very difficult for him because he saw it as an all or nothing thing. This was the extent of the remorse and the depth of the remorse that I saw in him in the first several weeks of treatment. As that continued, he did get better, and he started thinking about other issues and other aspects of this, always returning to the same theme of what could he do to make things better, better for his family, better for the victim's family, better, better for the community, better for anybody and everybody. He improved to some extent. He was not disconnected with reality anymore. Uh, I think that was related partly to the medications, but more to his efforts and his family's efforts to face up to and accept responsibility and do what they could to deal with these circumstances. He was not very, in, as time went on, he was not very involved in the financial settlements that were ultimately made. But he was very supportive of his mother. He made repeated statements to her in my presence that he would do anything to make up for what they had lost, that he would devote his life to making up for what they lost, and he would take care of them in their retirement if he could, if he had to. Again, a, a renewal of his, man, the manifestation of his acceptance of responsibility and remorse. He, uh, as I say, was not involved in the details of that, but was fully supportive of, of it. He also said to me, I saw him frequently with, uh, alone and with his mother. He said to me alone, not with his mother, 
that he, he didn't want anybody to misunderstand what he thought about the money. But, and as I, as I think about this, I recall he's crying and sobbing, boo-hoo crying and sobbing, saying that I, I, I don't want anybody to misunderstand me, but the money can't bring anybody back. The money can't undo this. I won't, the money, it, it matters, but it doesn't matter. He demonstrated a maturity and wisdom which is well beyond his baseline level in recognizing that nothing was ever going to make up for this. He told me in this context that he knew God forgives, but he doesn't think he will ever get to heaven because no matter what he does, that what he did was and is unforgivable. Now, um, what I would like to do, I think the easiest way is to um, <clears throat> review the sentencing memorandum that we have filed and focus specifically on some of the departure grounds. Uh, you have had an opportunity to review the memorandum. I have. So the um, first ground that uh, set forth departure ground number one, <clears throat> the offense was committed in an unsophisticated manner and was an isolated incident for which the defendant has shown remorse. Uh, focusing on the last first, uh, remorse, uh, you've addressed that in your testimony thus far. Is there any doubt in your mind at any point has Cameron Heron been anything other than remorseful? No, not at all, never. He's always been remorseful. I don't want to be repetitive, but I'm sure I will refer to other incidents of, because it was constant, his expression of remorse. All right. Now, um, In terms of uh, <clears throat> sophistication, how, how sophisticated is this young man? He's a, he's, in some ways, he's a bright kid. That's the way a teacher would describe him. But he's uh, sheltered. He's not particularly sophisticated. He's not worldly, if you will. I shouldn't say that he's not worldly. He is worldly now. He was not worldly before this happened. In terms of his psychological development, he was a very innocent, naive uh, senior at high school who hadn't had much experience in the real world with real life. Um, that's not the case anymore, not by any means. He has learned horribly and dramatically by his experience. Um, but before this accident, he was a kind of a naive kid. And I should have prefaced this by referring to departure ground number two. At the time of the offense, the defendant was too young to appreciate the consequences of the offense. So the answer that you gave, I, I guess, uh, uh, his age, what, what factors would factor into a defendant being too young to appreciate? And in specific, specifically here, Cameron Heron. Certainly the issue of his chronological age is important, 18 and a half. Some kids, some boys who are 18 and a half are more, more mature than others in terms of their social maturity and those sorts of social decisions. Some are less mature. As I've said, I believe he was a bit less mature than average in spite of his good performance in high school and so on. In spite of his intellectual development, his social development was a little bit lagging. And his capacity, as is the case with so many teenagers, to recognize and be aware of the influences of his surroundings. A bright, happy morning with a friend on the way to the gym, and you push on the accelerator of your car, 
and it feels good, and there's no thought or awareness whatsoever that what you're doing is horribly dangerous, even when there's excessive speed, not just routine speeding on Bayshore, which was the common social circumstance at that time on that road. So how would that tie in to this prong of departure ground number two, too young to appreciate the consequences of the offense? Are you speaking about, as you were just describing, consequences of his act? Yes. His act was pushing on the accelerator and driving that car at an excessive rate of speed, at, a, at an extremely excessive rate of speed. Without the cause and effect connection between one part of his brain and another part of his brain that says, doing this is really dangerous. All kinds of bad things could happen. Medical science and the US Supreme Court has recognized that the connection of the brain that makes a connection between cause and effect doesn't develop in young men until the early 20s. This is why we have the common sense social understanding that we hear all the time of how could he do something so stupid? He's a bright kid. It is because the stop and think part of the brain, the frontal lobe, where we stop and think about our action is not developed in young adolescent boys, men of his age and circumstances. And we will be addressing that in a little more detail <coughs> later on, and, uh, but that is a relevant uh, point to departure ground number two. Departure ground number three, uh, we contend that Cameron Heron poses no future threat to society. And doctor, based on all of the uh, time that you uh, spent with Cameron Heron, do you believe, uh, uh, well, does he pose any future threat to society? And please explain. I absolutely believe that he does not. And I would I was in the courtroom today and heard the testimony. I, I would add to what I've heard that not only does he not, from a lack of intent and a desire to be good to creatures, whether they be human beings or raccoons, he, he also has a, a, a terrible and powerful uh, understanding of how lack of awareness, neglect, carelessness, lack of commitment to stop and think can lead to horrible, dangerous things. And he is much less, less likely than most kids, most teenagers, uh, the vast majority of teenagers, to engage in dangerous activity that might hurt someone in the future. So it appears that you have no doubt that he is not a future threat to society. That is correct. Now, departure ground number four will involve more legal issues and other issues, so we will not inquire there. Uh, departure number, ground number five, is the defendant may be sentenced as a youthful offender. And uh, just, just briefly, uh, you're, you're aware of the statutory qualifications to be, to be designated by the court and sentenced by the court under the Youthful Offender Act. Is that correct? Yes, I am. And what, um, what impact or what, uh, do, do you think that that would be a satisfactory resolution? What I can say about that is the following. Certainly, chronological age, it, it is my understanding that he meets criteria in terms of psychological and social development and age, it is also my opinion that he meets that criteria. It is my understanding that the youthful offender process is one that recognizes that young adults are different than older, fully developed, mature adults, that when they commit a crime, they still must be punished, but there is uh, opportunity for uh, rehabilitation, and what I would also describe here uh, in the same words that former Judge Holder described, 
an opportunity for what we can think of as restorative justice in the youthful offender uh, program and strategies. And from that point of view, and I could say more about the restorative justice issue, the youthful offender type of program and concept very much applies to him. And we will be talking about uh, restorative justice here shortly. Uh, ground number six uh, relating to the uh, monetary payment, that would not involve uh, you. So now we move to the adolescent brain, and you've described a little bit of that already. And I think leading into it, it's kind of as you indicated, it's when the average person looks at something like this, as they do a lot of times with kids, how could the kid have done that? How, how, how could this 18-year-old do something so stupid, so consequential? What in the world were they thinking? And what I'd like to have you do is start out because I think a lot of people say, ah, this is just junk science, a bunch of guys in a room with little else to do but look at it and come up with these reasons. But would you start out and tell us the difference between the adolescent brain and an adult brain and why this is accepted not only by neuroscientists but the United States Supreme Court in a series of decisions and courts all over the country, that it is a true... It goes back hundreds of years. We know and common sense tells us without any doubt that a newborn has a different brain than a two-year-old, and a two-year-old has a different brain than a six-year-old, and the scientific literature and understanding of this going back decades and decades is unquestionably different. And there is overwhelming scientific evidence, as you reference some presented to the U.S. Supreme Court would be of the brain going from older adolescents, 15 to 19, to young adult, 22 or so. It is also relevant, and the, and the science is very clear, that on average, boys are about two years behind girls in terms of this development. Now, this is something our teachers and some parents and people who work with children have been, on average, than a 14-year-old boy. They just grow up a little faster. When they're talking about that, they're usually, not always, but usually not talking about academic intelligence. They're not talking about how the child performs on, a, on an IQ test. They're talking about social development, emotional development. They're talking about development. Now, the terms uh, we've set forth in the uh, sentencing memorandum, we've addressed one of the United States Supreme Court cases that addresses adolescents and juveniles and things like that. And uh, recklessness, impetuosity, heedless risk taking as criteria or factors that are demonstrated by the adolescent brain. Uh, there are some behaviors that seem to be, again, as the justice has indicated, somewhat characteristic of the adolescent brain in young males. Is that correct? Yes. And would you explain how this, if you can, in terms of runs around, then that 14-year-old might pick up a gun and be involved in a, in a gun shooting and be criminally charged. And that's often what happens in the criminal. Indeed, our society and our laws recognize that 18-year-olds have certain privileges and responsibilities and opportunities, and particularly, uh, most notably in our drinking laws, the society recognizes, says in effect to 18 to 21-year-olds, you're not old enough and mature enough to handle drinking. You're not allowed to drink. Now, you have addressed or mentioned several times uh, restorative justice, and that is a term that we hear with more and more frequency. Uh, Mr. Warren, the state attorney here, is a strong proponent in a number of public forums uh, in support of restorative justice. Uh, what, what 
uh, is restorative justice? Restorative justice is uh, an evolving uh, concept of the criminal justice system that, recognize, that recognizes that crime, there are three pillars of restorative justice. The first is repair. If there's any way to make the situation better, to fix the window that you broke by throwing a rock through it, then you repair the damage. Obviously, in this case, there isn't. Although I would add, in his fantasy, in his disconnection from reality, he imagined that he could trade his life for the lives of these two people and repair the damage. So it's not possible, but the intent and the desire was there to do it. The second pillar of restorative justice is engagement. Is the person willing to engage with the people that they hurt, with society, with their community? Are they willing to look somebody in the eye and take responsibility and engage with them? Unfortunately, that hasn't happened here. The criminal justice system doesn't particularly promote it. Various other circumstances don't promote it. And the people he might engage with must absolutely be respected and, and not be expected to engage with him in any way that they choose not to. So that didn't happen. But the third pillar has happened and can happen, and it is my opinion that it has great benefit, and that is transformation. Transformation of the defendant, him, in terms of changing his behavior, his attitude, his relationship with society, and transformation of society so that while the repair of the particular damage in this case can't be completed, society can be changed in ways that addresses the issue. He has already begun working on doing things to address the issue of motor vehicle and pedestrian safety. He hasn't done a lot, he hasn't comp accomplished a lot, he hasn't had a lot of opportunity to do it, but he's done it. And I would add, he has not done it at my lead. He has brought this to me. I'm, I'm familiar with restorative justice as a professional and an expert in a greater way than he, had, than he is. But these basic concepts he has brought to me, and I have helped him understand. I've thrown the ball back to him and said, if you want to do this, go ahead and do it. He's done things to move this process forward. It is my opinion, overall, that if he is given the opportunity in a non-incarceration sentence to address the issues of restorative justice, whether it means full-time work for decades, he has the capacity, his family has the capacity, the community has the capacity to do that in a way that will save lives. Dr. Mayor, let me just take a look at my notes for a moment. And that concludes uh, everything I have, and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, in cross examination. Yeah, um, <clears throat> Dr. Mayor, in your time spent with Mr. Heron, did you do any type of uh, physical testing, like a brain scan, CAT scan, anything like that to determine how his brain has been developed at the age that he began meeting with you? No. Okay. <clears throat> Did you give him any type of cognitive testing, IQ testing, anything like that in your time spent with him? No. So you don't even know what his IQ is? No, I absolutely know what his IQ is. His IQ is, a, is average to above average normal, that's based on his academic development. And that's a much better indicator of IQ than, a, than an isolated IQ test. But don't you come in here and testify all the time about clients that you have that you've given IQ testing to and you present that to the court to determine where that person is cognitively? I, I wouldn't agree with that statement, no. In this case, his, his IQ is, is not an issue. He's a bright kid. 
That's everything we need to know. There doesn't need to be an IQ test to prove something which is already absolutely obvious. And he's a bright that, kid. And you don't think that that factors in, the fact that he's a bright kid, if he had a high IQ, that doesn't factor into his capacity to understand driving 102 miles an hour down Bayshore Boulevard prior to noon when there's a bunch of pedestrians around. It absolutely is relevant, and I've said it's relevant. He's a bright kid. But you still testify here that he still lacked the capacity to understand the danger that he was creating prior to the crash. Yes, and that's not based on anything that an IQ test has the present capacity to reveal. And it's not based on any type of brain scan or anything that you can point to physically to say that you know for sure that his brain is not developed. You're basing that all off of literature and other things that you have studied as a psychologist, correct? I'm basing it on an understanding of science and medicine. I don't have to do a brain scan on a two-year-old to know that that two-year-old has a two-year-old brain. It, it's just silly. I don't need to do a brain scan on him to know that he has an 18-year-old brain. But he was 18. He wasn't two, right? He was 18 when he Absolutely. committed the crime, right? Absolutely. Okay. But again, so you based it all on literature, nothing that you've studied of his physical person or anything like that that would lead you to give the opinion that he failed to have the capacity to understand the dangerous situation he created prior to the crash, right? No, I based it on the fact that he's 18 years old. I haven't so suggested, I haven't, su excuse me, can I answer? Sure. I haven't suggested in any way at all that I made a specific detailed assessment of his brain functioning, I know things about how an 18-year-old brains function. The testimony that we heard today here is absolutely consistent with all of the information that I gathered upon which I reached my conclusion. Doing a brain scan might give us an opportunity to put up pretty pictures and say this is how the brain works, these are the colors, this is what goes on. That's not the point here. The point here is the testimony that we've heard, the information I gathered with him with many hours of work. This is not, if you will, from the legal point of view, a brain scan case. Your question just is not relevant. Okay. Thank you for that. I'll leave that up to the judge to determine what's relevant. But you can answer my question. That's so, my opinion. So you're, so you're going to lump him in with every other 18-year-old that's out there based on what you know and based on your reading of literature and your training and experience, right? No, absolutely not. He's right, an let's... individual, and all of the things that I've just referenced are related to him as an individual. So tell me what individually about this person tells us that he lacks the capacity, other than the fact that he was 18 years old. All of the things that we've heard in court today. That no, 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 his, no, no, no. That tell his me, character, you had to may know, I finish? You had to know may things I before finish? you came into court today, didn't you? Pardon me? You had to know things before you came in here to court today, right? To formulate Ab an opinion? Absolutely. So I want to know what, prior to hearing today, what did you learn about this individual that allows you to give that opinion? All of the things that I have heard confirmed here in court today, those things are related to his character, his pattern of behavior, his social interactions with other people, his willingness to put other people's interests before his interests, his concern and empathy for creatures, human beings and raccoons, his uh, uh, ability to gather and interact with a social network that finds him to be valuable and useful, <clears throat> his willingness to trade his life, as he told me and as he told a friend, for the victims in this case. All of these things are part of his unique character that are the basis of my opinion. I, I could go through the list more extensively. No, um, the point I'm making is that everything that you learned was all through your ears, right? Through hearsay, through things you heard other people say, things that you heard him tell you after he committed the crime, right? That's all I'm getting at. You didn't base it on anything physical, like something that you could put up a picture of his brain and say, hey, look, everybody, his brain's underdeveloped, and this is why. You didn't do any of that, right? That was a very complex question. Do you think maybe you could make it a little clearer to Doc, me? Did you rely on anything other than what you heard? Yes. What? What I saw. What did you see? 
I saw him cry in my office. Okay, I saw that's other talking people about cry remorse. in my I'm, office. I'm focused I more saw on pictures the of the accident scene. I'm focused more on the capacity. I will do my best to answer a clear question. I don't understand the question. I think it's pretty simple, but my question is, do you agree that everything that you're testifying to to formulate an opinion on capacity is based on things that were told to you and based on other things that you've read in books and studied? And seen with my own eyes. <clears throat> okay. Is it based on my perceptions? Yes, it's okay. based on my perceptions. Okay. And you talked about the age, you talked about the age of drinking, but we all know the age to get a license, the trusted age is 16, right? Yes. So somebody, apparently smarter than everybody else, has made the decision that at 16, those individuals have the capacity to operate a motor vehicle, correct? <laughs> You know, I don't want to be argumentative with you, but you just asked me a question that suggests that the people who give 16-year-olds driver's license are smarter than everybody else. That, that wasn't and, my question. And this is a case that illustrates that that, in fact, might not be true. Exactly. So of course I'm, I'm not, not, I'm not agree asking with that. you to agree if those people are smarter. Well, that than was us. part of your question. You agree that in the state of Florida, the law says that at 16, you can obtain a driver's license? I certainly agree with that. Okay, so someone, not judging whether they're smarter than us, someone has made the decision that a 16-year-old has the relevant capacity to operate a motor vehicle. Do you agree with that? I certainly agree with that. <clears throat> and to obtain, you got a license, right? A driver's license? Yes. And did you obtain it when you were 16? 17. Okay, and did you Jersey. have to take some type of a test in order to accomplish that? Yes. And did you have to become aware of the laws that say you can't go over this posted speed limit? Yes. And did you, did you ever have to take the driving class prior to that in order to obtain your driver's license? I think I did in high school. And do you recall during those classes them I know I did, and showing photographs of accidents and telling people, don't speed, right? Do you remember any of that? Oh, uh, sure, I remember you've got to follow the laws or you might lose your license. Yeah, and as a citizen and as a person that's driven a car, you know why we have those laws, right? Because you drive fast and you crash and people die, right? Yes. And again, those are things that someone has decided that's okay as a 16-year-old to learn that stuff obtain the license and go out on your own and drive a car? Yes. Now, you talked a little bit about the restorative justice. Are you aware that restorative justice isn't advocating that no one should go to prison, is it? No. In fact, there are restorative justice programs that are provided in prison, correct? Yes. And the point of that is to not to avoid the punishment, right? That's correct. It's to take the, the person that was accused and the victim and maybe at some time restore the broken relationship or to help them to cope with what they had gone through, correct? Yes. So you're not advocating that restorative justice would stand to mean that this Cameron Heron shouldn't go to prison? I'm not advocating a, a particular sentence. Okay. That's, I don't believe that's my role. I agree. I'll agree with you on that. That's all I have, Judge. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, that will uh, conclude the witnesses that we will, we will be calling. Thank you. Can both of you approach just for a moment?
We're going to be in recess until 1.30. We'll come back then, and uh, at that time, the state of Florida can present any witnesses. Thank you, everyone. Of course, in recess until 1.30.
Yes, Your Honor. Senator Yes, Your Honor. All right, State Board, may now proceed with any uh, witnesses or anything else you might need to say. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. The State will call uh, Detective Ryan Jakes. Please go ahead and state your name for the record. Corporal Ryan Jakes, J-A-C-Q-U-E-S. And back in...
your box area there, and the two cars will. All right, so what we're seeing there as far as like the reference point of that gazebo, just beyond that gazebo across the, the street through those trees, is that essentially where the impact had occurred? Yes. And the bottom portion of that video that's enhanced showing in between those two trees, is that where we'll see the two vehicles come through and pass through prior to the collision? Yes. I'll go ahead and play this at this time. Now what we just we just saw it there, I'll, I'll play it again, but I just paused it there. Is that uh, first vehicle that we see in that bottom enhanced portion, is that the Ford Mustang just prior to the collision? It is. And then, I, I couldn't stop it, but let me play it again, but the vehicle that we see right behind him, is that the Nissan Altima? It is. And did you determine during your investigation that those vehicles based on this video and based on the witness statements appeared to be very close to each other prior to the impact? They were. Okay. But with the, was the Ford Mustang the vehicle ahead of the Nissan Altima? The Mustang was in front, yes. And was there evid any evidence during your investigation that the Nissan Altima had struck either victim in this case? No, there's no evidence of that. Was there any damage to his vehicle indicating that he had struck anything that no, pertained no to this crash? No, no damage pertaining to this crash. <clears throat> now, one of the things we heard about um, today in testimony talked about uh, the capacity of the defendant and, and his behavior around the time of this. As part of the data that you recovered from the Burla data system, uh, did that show driving of that vehicle prior to the crash on May 23rd, 2018? It does. And did you document that uh, and uh, utilize that in making any opinion in this case? In this case, no, it wasn't relevant to this case. Okay. But did you document and were you able to see um, some of the prior driving history in the same format that I showed you previously of that Ford Mustang vehicle? I was. And was there uh, incidences that is documented here on this spreadsheet of uh, prior incidents, May 18th, May 20th, May 21st, May 22nd, where that Mustang vehicle was driving at excessive rates of speed? Yes, that's correct. And the rates of speed, are those indicated um, next to the AM, for example, in the very first one on 518 on 92 miles an hour? Correct. And did the Burla data, was it able to give you data points where you could find out GPS locations to see where that vehicle was in fact driving at those speeds? It was, it gave a Latin, a Latin along coordinate. And is that indicated over there on the right side where it says I-75 South? It is. And on that day on 518, we even see at 918 AM that vehicle traveling, according to the data, approximately 162 miles an hour down I-75. Correct. And then was there also data looking down at the bottom of that vehicle traveling on Bayshore Boulevard on May 21st, uh, reaching speeds, for example, at 11.02 a.m. at 80 miles an hour? Correct. And then on 5.22, 11.35 a.m., uh, which would have been the day prior, almost 24 hours and a couple minutes, correct? Correct. That vehicle on Bayshore Boulevard traveling at 84 miles an hour. That's correct. Did you also observe, as part of your investigation, did you download uh, the phones that were belonged to Cameron Heron, John Baranow, and Tristan Heron? I did. And part of the investigation into the phones by Cameron Heron, did you observe what's in the next slide were some text messages on April 23rd um, talking about the driving of Cameron Heron. I did. And up on the screen there, uh, is that accurate that there was a, an outgoing message from that 813 number stating, I, 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 GHT, bet Cam, you're going to take veterans. And the response from Cameron Heron's number, were we able to verify that was Cameron Heron's number based on the download and seizure of his phone? I was. 
and him saying, of course, the stang got to let loose. Correct. The vehicle that we just saw in the investigation, that was a Ford Mustang, correct? That's, that's correct. Judge, I'll pass the witness. We cross the motion. Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> Corporal, good afternoon. Nice to see you again. Nice to see uh, you, sir. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, as part of your investigation, you prepared something called a collision reconstruction report, correct? Correct. And we've attached that, Your Honor's Exhibit 3 to our uh, motion. And at that time, you were uh, the lead detective investigating the accident on Bayshore, correct? Correct. This is a, a standard document that the lead detective or one of the detectives completes in uh, a situation where there may be a death in, a, in an automobile accident. That's correct. Okay. Uh, I won't go through all of it, but I just have a couple of uh, questions here. First of all, um, one of the things that you always look at are some things relating to the driver of a vehicle, correct? Correct. And so in your report, you uh, noted that Cameron Heron and John Barino both had valid driver's licenses, correct? Correct. And you also noted <clears throat> that you had checked their driving record with DMV and neither Cameron Heron nor uh, John Barino uh, had any uh, infractions. That's correct. And then you also noted that uh, Cameron Heron did not display any signs of impairment at the time of the crash, correct? Correct. And by signs of impairment, you, you, you've handled like DUI cases and things like that, have you not? Yes, sir. And there are sometimes articulable signs of people been drinking, if they're on drugs and things like that, correct? Correct. And here, there was absolutely zero evidence of any drugs or alcohol as far as Cameron Heron was concerned, correct? That's correct. Okay. As you reconstructed the events, uh, you concluded that at the time of the impact, uh, the Mustang was traveling between 30 and 40 miles per hour, correct? At impact, yes. Now we saw some pictures of this here. Uh, another thing you do is you recorded, or you did, you recorded where the, the two vehicles uh, landed uh, at, at the end of the incident, correct? Correct, where they were final rest. Yeah, final rest is what you call it. Yes, yes, sir. And you reported that they were in close proximity, uh, both the two cars, at the time they came to rest. Correct. And in fact, the Nissan was uh, on top of some of the pieces of the stroller and things like that. That's correct. And then you determined through witness interviews that both uh, the vehicles, the Nissan and the Mustang, had uh, stopped at the intersection of Bayshore and Gandhi uh, to a, a full stop, the red light there, we all know. Yes, sir. And then uh, they proceeded uh, northbound on Bayshore to the point of impact, correct? Correct. Okay. And that took about, uh, Let's see, that was about, I think, eight-tenths of a mile or so. Something like that. Yeah. Close to it. And then uh, took, give or take, 30 seconds. Okay. Okay. I want to uh, focus on this. Is it not a fact that it was reported to the Tampa Police Department, your detectives, your colleagues, 
by several witnesses that at various times as the two vehicles went up Bayshore Boulevard, at some point the Nissan was leading, at another point the Mustang was leading, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. And there is no dispute about that, is there? No, sir. Okay. In fact, um, you obtained a number of search warrants in this case to search the vehicles, get social media accounts and things like that, correct? Correct. And you recited, at, at least in at least for at least one of the witnesses, Stephanie Ives, you told several different judges in about a dozen or two search warrants that Stephanie Ives, uh, who was an eyewitness, had testified that the Nissan went first before her and then behind it came the Mustang, correct? That's what the warrant says, yes. Pardon me? If that's what the warrant says, yeah. yes. And, and you don't dispute that, do you? No, I don't dispute that. Okay. No. Then, uh, have you read our uh, sentencing memorandum? I have not. Okay. Uh, one of the other key witnesses that was interviewed uh, by the Tampa Police Department was Mark Lewis, correct? Correct. And, uh, and then he was deposed. He participated in a deposition during the, what we call the discovery process, correct? I'm sure he was. Okay. Did you ever read his deposition? I did not, know. Did Mr. Uh, Hubbard uh, let you know what he said? No, I don't believe we talked about that now. And then in addition to the deposition that Mr. Lewis gave, he also gave a, a tape-recorded statement to one of your detectives, I think Detective White or one of them. Yes, sir. Yes. And then uh, that's provided to the defense, the tape recording, and that's kind of standard procedure, is it not? Correct. And you're aware that Mr. Lewis uh, told the Tampa Police Department that uh, as he was driving north on Bayshore, he was passed by the Nissan first and then uh, very shortly thereafter the Mustang, correct? I, I wouldn't dispute you if that's what you say. It, you know, I'm sorry? I wouldn't dispute it. I, I can't tell you exactly okay, what Okay, you just don't remember? I don't remember now. And uh, one of the things you had the duty of doing is you compiled the, the master uh, Tampa Police offense report. Is that correct? That's correct. And part of that job involves uh, when you have a dozen or several dozen detectives and officers on the scene, each one of them will prepare a report, correct? Correct. Uh, they call it a supplement. Pardon? They call it a supplement. Yeah, they supplement my report. So when all of the SUPs come in, you're the one that puts them in the big master, uh, and they're you have a page number, and the master report has what everybody in the entire police department did, the fire department, and everybody else, correct? Right. I, I don't put them together. We don't put it. The computer, once I do the report, it's attached to that report, and it's all done by computer. And then you're in charge of that report, though, and producing it to the state attorney who produces it to us? Correct. Okay. I wanted to, uh, I don't know if we'll need the graph or not, but at several points on the graph that showed the uh, speed, uh, it looks like there were a couple of zeros uh, on the graph. And does that mean as they left the residence of the Herons, pulled out to uh, a stop sign, they stopped completely? Correct. And then they turn and they stop somewhere else and that's where another zero would be? That's correct. And then when they get down to the red light at Bayshore and Gandhi, that's another zero? Correct. Full stop. And then uh, we see the accelerated speed as they left Bayshore and Gandhi to the point of impact, correct? Correct. You, you go up and down, but yeah, it's okay. from the time they leave there, you can see the speeds, uh, you know, speed variation. Okay. So I just want to correct this that my notes indicate that when Mr. Hubbard was asking you some questions, that you had indicated the Mustang was in front of the Nissan all the way. That's not correct, is it? No, according to the witnesses, they were switching oh, places. Oh, I'm sorry? According to the witnesses, they were switching places. Yes, okay. And there were quite a few witnesses who saw different things too, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, you also uh, presented a, uh, some information that um, showing uh, some speeds on dates other than on May 23rd, is that correct? That's correct. And you retrieved this from the 
infotainment system or the computer brains of the Mustang, correct? Correct. You were able to tell, if this was working correctly, that uh, at some point, not on this day, uh, somebody drove the vehicle apparently on I-75, is that correct? That's correct. And reached a speed of 148 and another speed of 162? That's correct. Does the Mustang do that kind of speed? That Mustang will. Okay. Do you know who was driving the car? I have no idea. Uh, were you aware that at times Mr. Heron, uh, Cameron Heron, let friends of his drive the car, let his brother drive the car, and other people? I was not aware of that. Okay. This is the first time you've heard that? Yes, sir. Okay. Then, uh, under the state's theory here, uh, there is no dispute that the Nissan and the Mustang were very, very, very close to each other at the time of the impact, correct? That's correct. And the, um, while you were able to pull the, the Burla data, the infotainment system data from the Mustang, uh, you, the, the, the Nissan did not have that technology in it, correct? Correct. So you couldn't see what it was doing? No, it didn't have the same, it was older so it didn't have the same technology. Yes, it was a little bit older car. Yes, sir. After uh, the incident and after some uh, investigation on the scene, and by the way, you were on the scene, is that correct? Yes, sir. And then a decision was made to arrest uh, Mr. Barano and Cameron Heron, correct? That's correct. Did you effect that arrest? I did. Uh, you arrested both of them and uh, I assume did the normal uh, uh, arresting processes and then they were taken to jail and then uh, different things happen as far as bond and release and things like that, correct? Correct. Okay. When you arrested each one, uh, did you, uh, you, you signed a charging document known as a criminal report affidavit, correct? That's correct. And under Florida law, that is uh, a document that you as a sworn law enforcement official can file to charge a citizen with the crime to justify the arrest. Correct. Right? And you charged both Mr. Barano and Mr. Heron with the exact same thing, correct? Correct. You charged them with uh, two counts of vehicular homicide and one count with racing on a highway. Correct. And the affidavit that supports your charging instrument here was the same for both of them, correct? Your uh, probable cause? Yes, sir. Okay. Then down the line, uh, the case moves to the state attorney's office and the state attorney filed what's called an information which is the formal charging instrument in the state of Florida, correct? Correct. And you're aware that both Mr. Barano and Mr. Heron were charged together in the same information, the same charging document. I, I wouldn't know that. Didn't know that? No. You know of course though that the charges that were brought against each one, the formal charges, were exactly the same. Uh, two counts of vehicular homicide, one count of racing on a highway. Yes, sir. Okay. Are, are you aware of how they scored out equally under the Florida Sentencing Guidelines uh, scheme? No, sir, I wasn't okay. privy to that information. Just have a moment, please, Ron. Yes, sir. Did you become aware at a point later in the case when we were getting close to making a, close to a trial date that uh, John Barano uh, reached a plea agreement with the state attorney's office? Yes, sir, I was aware of that. And were you participate, did you participate in any way with that? I did not, that was between the state attorney and Mr. Barano's attorney. 
Now, did you become aware at any point that Mr. Hubbard, by himself, uh, went and met with Mr. Barano and Mr. Barano's lawyer? I became aware of that. Were you invited to that meeting? I was not. Did you then learn that Mr. Barano uh, had been interviewed by Mr. Hubbard and Mr. Barano said the boys were not racing on Bayshore? I wasn't there for the conversation, so I don't know what was said. So Mr. Hubbard never reported to you that when he interviewed Mr. Barano in connection with Mr. Barano pleading guilty and taking a six-year offer from the state, that it was Mr. Barano's possession, position that it was not a race. Is that correct? He, he, he may have told me that. I just don't remember what he told me. Okay. You do know that Mr. Hubbard did talk to him? I do know that, yes, sir. Okay. And it would have been with Mr. Rickman, Anthony Rickman, correct. the lawyer for uh, John Barano. That's correct. Okay. So you have no information as to what Mr. Barano said at this sort of rather important meeting. No, sir, I wasn't there. Okay. Did you get any interview report from Mr. Hubbard? It, he didn't offer it, I didn't ask. Okay. But you never seen one? No, sir. Okay. Now, I just want to be sure that you are, you have never heard of the fact that John Barano told Mr. Hubbard that he and Cameron Heron were not racing. Uh, I, I wasn't there. I don't know what was said. Okay. So in other words, you don't know anything about it? Correct. Okay. That's fine. Thank you, sir. No. Thank you. Did you read right? No, you're right. Thank you, sir. state your name for the record. Pamela Reisinger. And Ms. Reisinger, um, what was your relationship to Jessica uh, and Lilia? Jessica was my daughter. Lilia was my granddaughter. And is there something that you want to tell the court uh, that the court should consider uh, prior to rendering a sentence in this case? There is. Um, We've heard a lot today about qualities in a person. And my daughter and my granddaughter possessed all those qualities too. There, you say actions speak louder than words. They were active in what they presented in their life. Jessica went on several mission trips she started programs in Girl Scouts. She got her gold award. They say right to life, she had that baby. Every action she did was kind and whole. The awards she wore in her shirts, the bracelets she wore represented who she was. Her graduation cap was all about love and kindness. And when I hear about listening to your child wake up with screams in the middle of the night for a few months, we're going on three years and we hear those screams. They can comfort their child. They can go to them and hug them. I go to a closet and sniff a t-shirt. I go to a baby picture and stroke her cheeks to comfort her. You hear about remorse and regret and, and their sympathy. And 
and, and when they say that they wish they could switch places with them, and we all know that's not possible, if you're, if you're willing to switch places with them, why aren't you willing to do your sentence? It's still your life. And we hear about 18-year-old boys that are careless and, and boneheaded um, by, by his teacher's words, um, not of Cameron, but of other students, and that Cameron was bright. I raised two sons that were 18-year-olds, and yes, they might have been a little immature, but they know consequences. I'm a preschool teacher, and my four and five-year-old class has mostly boys. Yes, they're a little more immature, but it's our duty, it's our job to teach them how to learn the rules, how to function in society, and that consequences are always there. I think we do a huge disservice to our society if we aren't willing to teach those lessons. Um, You know, we have our faith too. We also are Catholics. And I do believe that there is still forgiveness, but I also believe that there's a price to pay. Um, I think the city of Tampa, when they have the, had the memorial, <laughs> but afterwards we had a, had a watch for the rooftop because there were so many families there and babies and strollers. I think they were calling for, for justice, calling for their safety and their family safety. Um, you know, we also have a, a perspective on this. Um, so I don't want to seem that I don't feel for the Heron family, I do. But their perspective on what they've lost can't compare to two sweet souls crossing the street coming home from a parking lot. They weren't residents here. The Herons are residents here. They drove up that street every day. I can't believe that living in the, that area, there wasn't an awareness <clears throat> that people crossed that street. There wasn't an awareness that those speeds kill. That's why we have speed limits. It's, it's for all of our safeties. And if we don't abide by that, what are we telling our, our community? I really have nothing else to say. If there's anything else that you want to present, why don't you tell the court how old was uh, Jessica when she passed? Was well, she 23? I have lost track of time. It's okay. Around 23, 24, I heard from the audience. Okay, thank and you. That's okay. And what about Lilia? Lilia wasn't even two. And at that time, uh, did you have any other grandchildren at that time? Yes, I have two grandsons, Henry and, and Charlie was just a baby, he was just born. And did those two um, would have been cousins of Lilia, correct? And did they ever get the opportunity to, to see or be around Lilia? They did, yes, they were with her quite often. And you know when you look in your five-year-old grandson's eyes and he asked you, when God is going to be done with Jesse and Lilia, and that can they come back to play? And you have to tell them now they are coming back. Ms. Reiser, and, how, how has this affected you? We have heard from, from the Heron family how it's affected him. How has it affected your health, and how has it affected your everyday life after this? There's a lot of anxiety in our house. We all jump when we are on the phone. Our phone buzzes or rings, and it's not an expected call. We always waiting for the worst news. 
my son, Dan has been suffering from health issues. Michelle has been suffering from health issues. David has been suffering from health issues. And we just keep waiting. These past three years, we've been waiting and waiting, and it's like we've been let on constantly. And that stress level in our bodies has taken a toll. Is there anything else you want to say prior to the court determining a sentence in this case? Judge, I had, I've had, I have four children. And when people ask me the common courtesy question, when they meet you, how many children do you have? You have to stop and think of your answer. You know, I have four beautiful children, but there's only three of them now. Um, I just think that in, in, in raising children to be functioning members of society, I think there's hard lessons to be learned along the way. And I, I don't see how their neck, their, there can be a lesson learned if there's not a just punishment. And I just hope that everybody sees it's not for the, the wanting to see them suffer, but it's for wanting the lesson to be learned. Thank you, that's all I have for this, Roger. Do you have any questions? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Judge, next, uh, the state's gonna call David Ravenel. <coughs> Your Honor. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon, sir. I'm humbled to be in your presence. Thank you for hearing us. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is David Robinolt. I'm Jessica, Jessica Marie Reisinger Robinolt's husband and Lilia's father, Lilia Marie Robinolt's father. Uh, to be honest with everyone here today, this may be the most difficult moment for me in order to put my words together of the plaguing effects of this. I want uh, your forgiveness if my points seem repetitive and redundant. It seems like it's, uh, it's a consistent pattern in my mind when I think of the effects of May 23rd, 2018. You know, I, I like to talk back and forth about my wife and the amount of people that she impacted in an uplifting and positive way, and, and it's truly impossible to count that. You know, uh, my survivor's guilt far outweighs any remorse that's in this room by everyone involved. I've seen folks talk about the defendant's character and his age. And to be honest with you, uh, I don't believe it's fair for every young man and young woman to be defined as reckless or mischievous or of bad behavior based on age. At 18 years old, I was surrounded by many 18 year olds and 17 year olds as most of us do in, in high school. We have decisions early on whether to be involved in extracurricular activities or, or not. To be uh, friendship, to be friends with people or to be a recluse. I have to tell you that 
I have met extraordinary people that have grown into their 20s that have never wavered and changed in their excellence. Their continuity to become better people was always a consistent factor in their life. It's hard for me to put the words together because even my, my, the way I talk now is affected by trauma. And it's, it's clear as day to the point where I like to start talking more about my wife and circle back around to why it's impossible to put the words together, to even find the right flow to introduce this statement to you, sir. The importance is that my wife lit up my world and that of anyone she met. It became fiercely dark after she was removed from this earth. She studied nutrition and dietetics in college and was the founder of the Kent State Charge Chapter, which promotes health and fitness for women. It is an organization that opens its arms to anyone who seeks to improve their health and searches for camaraderie. This group included everyone from all walks of life and of all ages. You weren't too young or too old to be in the program. Shortly after this, it became the largest chapter of this organization and part of her legacy. She was the center of the group and the emotional support of anyone who needed it. She made me better. She was exemplary. She was a student athlete. She continued this all the way through her graduation. I'd like to add that I don't have very many tears for you. I have wept every single day for the past three years. I've had to see doctors at Tampa General look at me in despair and say, this is a level of grief that is at an unmeasurable scale. Let us not forget that these are two young men against a young mother and a baby, a child, an innocent, innocent child. You've made me regret so many things. You fill me with remorse. What is the price of our family's humiliation to you? The actions, your actions, of the defendant, Cameron Herring, have created further visceral damage to all who love and care for her. You inserted so much uncertainty into this community and that of everyone who loved them. You dare request a chance to live out your dreams when you eliminated all of mine and theirs. Rehabilitation. I don't really believe that you have sought rehabilitation. I think you have sought a lack of accountability. You've shown zero remorse. And your selfish behavior ranges all the way to, to a fatal state. I like to compare 18 year olds and those who hold high responsibility at that age. I know many young men and women who have entered the service and have proudly served their country with intense, extreme responsibilities, one that can be shared with men of any age in their 20s, potentially higher. These young men are entrusted with the ability and responsibility to make the right decision. I can't compare you to these men. In fact, when I look at your friends, I'm concerned for them because your leadership is one that falters and fails. I've had to hear many things from conversations that were had by the defendants and their parents, ranging from being inside the patrol vehicle to moments after when they were in jail. It was very clear and obvious that you began to communicate amongst each other your quick and expeditious retrieval from jail.
I want you never to forget that you have caused thousands of people to cry. I want you to think about that. For 30 years. The vigil alone that was held by the beautiful mothers and family members of Tampa Bay, Florida, was an honest reminder that we do not stand for your behavior. And we will not tolerate it. At an early age, I recognized a few things. Any misconduct would jeopardize my ability to create a career and thus hinder my ability to provide and shelter my family. The entire sequence of my late teens and 20s was always consistent. I knew at a very early age that there were different types of adults. The shy, the anxious, the motivated, the passive, the mature, the immature. One thing, however, is certain. I believe the vast majority of them knew right from wrong. The difference was some of them continued on with their mischief, even with that knowledge. This, folks, is when we separated the good from the bad. There is a threshold, a clear meridian between right and wrong. We can discuss anything here. Your integrity, your grit, your faith, and your actions, and they all disappoint you. Any person of good heart and faith would not have initiated your reckless actions of that day, fatal actions of that day. I could not protect my family from you because you chose to ignore the laws of this great state. By ignoring this, you selfishly made my family expendable. Based on your actions the past three years, I firmly believe you still deny accountability. 30 years from now, I will be 59 years old, almost 60. My daughter would have been close to 33 years old. My wife would have been close to 56. Based on her great health, zero vices, and great self-care, I am certain that she would have made it to old age in perfect health. <clears throat> we would be enjoying the fruits of our labor and the expansion of our family. We would feel secure because we leave behind descendants. Your actions and decisions that day created an extinction within our species. Our youngest and most need of protection was removed. It is critical for you to understand that you've created everlasting pain and depths of sorrow. Because of your existence, Two beautiful, innocent lives were denied a full life. You eliminated their voices from this earth, this time and space. You left me without access to the treasures of my heart. You left me here as a widower and childless father. Your actions terrorize me and haunt me to this day. I had to carry their ashes in a box. I'll never forget the faces of the people in our Catholic Church during their funeral service. They realized that we didn't have coffins for them, but rather a small box that I was to push at the end. It became clear then to most that they were ashes and truly gone. 
Your actions that day killed my prayers, destroyed my faith, and you allowed so much sorrow into my heart. Something I've never had any tolerance for. When I catch sight of my nephews playing, I have to picture a ghost-like version of what my daughter would look like next to him and how she would be playing with them. What songs would she be listening to? What toys would she be using? When I see the pain in my nephew's eyes, when he asks me about their death, I'm once again left speechless. <clears throat> but I realize that you took their voices and not mine. My nephew comes up to me and asks details about their death, and I cannot express the true sorrow, anger, and rage a father feels explaining the unexplainable to a child. My nephews are well aware that life can be cruel no matter what age. My nephew, that is, I would say, most attached to my daughter since he got to know her, has to carry the, bur the burden of knowing that life is short. None of us should have ever had to feel that way at six years old. None of us should have to navigate the torturous corridors of understanding grace walls. And again, when I see my nephew, I'm at times reminded of my brother and I. And to be honest, I can't believe that the child I once was would grow up to bury his own. How can a childless father assure his nephews that this is all part of a larger plan? When in reality, we know exactly what happened and what caused this. It was not fate. It was not destiny or misfortune. It was all caused by your selfish, deliberate, and criminal act. The trauma and PTSD that you created always leads me to a tragic ending. There is no other way to cut this. You made my memories and nostalgia to become painful rather than uplifting. You made memories turn cold like a carcass in a morgue without any chance of warmth returning much like Jesse. You created a permanent tragic image of Tampa Bay in the eyes of so many individuals and families. Our family now gets together to try to cope and grieve. Our family reunions hardly contain conversations about a prosperous, happy future. But rather, we live day by day in the form of coping with death. My daughter was a key and unique component to our family and thus our community's dynamic. She was a source of a manifold of good. I witnessed my daughter single-handedly change people's demeanor towards the positive. It was very difficult not to smile when you were greeted so gracefully. In church, she caused many heads to turn, smile and wave. She at times would speak up during mass as commonly as toddlers do and generate a wave of emotion. These always seem to be perfectly timed with the homily and when the church was at its highest point of attention. She was a consistent reminder of the goodness in our planet and, that, and this world that we tempor temporarily inhabit. My daughter had an ability to showcase love and care for others that was exemplary for any child her age. We felt so much love for her that we naively thought danger would never come to them. The killers of their life would come in the form of Cameron Herring driving a Ford Mustang. Let's discuss the hundreds 
and most definitely thousands of people affected by this horrendous tragedy. How many people do you actually believe are rooting for the defendants? If one were to have a graph of common sense, you'd see an enormous disparity between those that believe this was an accident and those that believe this was a full criminal act. This was a crash, not an accident. Please be aware of that. There is no way to truly quantify or explain the damage done to our family, to this community and our community back home. My wife was a true patriot, outstanding citizen, and an elite mother who certainly had equals but never any superiors. During our tenure in Florida, she admired many things about this state. She had frequented the state during holidays with her family growing up. It was our third time to this state as a family. She grew up in a quiet, distant suburb from Cleveland, and we knew that leaving our comfort zone had risks. We had no idea this risk would be fatal in Tampa Bay. The location of their passing happens to be, in fact, the same street we were staying at with her uncle's family. Their entire future would vanish on Bayshore. Their existence forcefully sent to the spiritual world, leaving us with an everlasting sense of guilt, sorrow, remorse, crippling grief, and shock. When we received information from the district attorney that the defendants had requested to suppress the data on the Mustang, I saw this as a futile and gross attempt to remove factual evidence and as an ultimate attempt to paint a nicer portrait of the defendant. The defendant's strategy to delay justice has many reasons in my mind. One of them being their hopes that time will allow this community to move on from this event and remove the city's emotion behind this tragedy. I'm here to inform you fully that no one has forgot and everyone is exhausted with this vile and disgusting attempt. We know exactly why my family is dead. We know who did it, and we are still disgusted by this awful truth. Accountability. I've seen that come from people of all ages. We demand and beg you, Your Honor, to put Herring in prison for the maximum allowable sentence in order to fully enforce this law. The maximum sentence is appropriate for the horrendous nature of this crime. The death of two beautiful, innocent girls and the behavior shown by a defense prior and immediately after the sickening tragedy absolutely allows me to collapse. The defendant placed me in a position of no hope. His actions allowed my spirit to break to an irreparable state. The humiliation of being a widower and childless father is hard to describe. The embarrassment one feels as a, as a survivor is something I do not wish upon any single living person as it is simply unbearable and everlasting. You made the world stop for so many people. You made it stop for them forever. The truth behind this is that you are privileged. You killed a mother and a daughter. You did. No one else in this city but you did, Cameron. We have an absolute necessity to ensure that the defendants are punished to the full extent of the law. Defendant, Cameron Herring. My wife was without a doubt and without debate one of the most thoughtful people on earth. 
I like to turn to talk to her to talk about her because it is important that we are aware of the soul that we lost. Of the soul that we lost, pardon me. She hated to inconvenience anyone. She was always trying to improve the lives of those around her. I will try to explain the best way to truly convey her spirit. I can recall a memory of when we flew down to Florida as a family for the very first time, and one of the one of only three and one of only three times. My wife was concerned that the passengers seated in our row would complain if our daughter cried while on the flight. So my wife decided that she would create snack bags and hand them out. A piece of paper inside the bags carried a message asking everyone to excuse our daughter if she cried on her very first flight, but that we were so grateful to have our first family vacation. This is one example that briefly describes her consideration for others. Strangers were always treated with kindness and respect. When it came to driving, I witnessed my wife never surpass the speed limit. She was always taking care of herself and was always considerate of other motorists and pedestrians around her. She did so by driving in the safest manner possible. She was a town babysitter. Anytime when a friend had a shortcoming, she was always there to greet them with snacks. Whether it was a friend not making a sports team, their wisdom teeth removed, or in need of an uplifting chat, she was without a doubt the most reliable person for that job. She flawlessly would handwrite letters of encouragement and love, and she was consistent with this. I remember she was complimented thoroughly by our daughter's pediatrician on her outstanding and natural parental skills. I have heard stories of my wife handing over her pink balloon as a very young child to another girl simply because they wanted it. When in reality her favorite color was pink. But if it meant that another girl smiled, then so be it. My wife was a preferred choice for anyone as a babysitter. Every parent in her neighborhood knew their child's safety and best interest was my wife's highest priority. Even as her husband, I came across many children that had been partially raised by Jesse. They all had a beautiful consistency when describing my girl. In fact, our marriage was made stronger daily due to this. I wanted to be more like my wife. How many people can actually say that? I most certainly can. There's simply no way to properly describe the prestigious role my wife had in the community as an early teen. Even as a young Girl Scout, her, per her participation was always extraordinary. My wife was always employed. She was always working. She had an outstanding work ethic that was instilled, to her, but instilled onto her by her family. She held jobs as a server, food provider, excuse me, server, I guess, food provider at a rest home, which manager of her college cafeteria, and always greeted people with warmth. Out of all the people I have met in my life, only her mother shares such bolstering similarities. We still agree, however, that Jesse was just slightly improved. How could I not feel confident that we were raising a child that would benefit society and her peers? She enjoyed every meal. She valued it and was grateful for it. She understood that to become strong, you need to feed your mind and body with good, nutritious food and good habits. Something she immediately fell into routine when it came to feeding our daughter and providing nurture. She made her own baby food from scratch, 
purchase the highest quality ingredients in Hawaii, you may ask, so that she could raise a strong daughter that would then grow up to become a woman and a positive and productive member of our society. In, in Girl Scouts, she earned her bronze, silver, and the prestigious gold award. The awards were largely based on community service. To obtain her gold award, she was required to lead a self-sustaining project that would continuously benefit her community. It is without coincidence that this was done for little children at a Christian preschool. The project was named Grow Green and had many volunteers join the cause. She helped lead an event called Women in Sports Night, where younger girls and their mothers had the opportunity to participate in a variety of physical activities, empowering them with a can-do attitude. There is no surprise that she immediately fit into her motherly role. She was the embodiment of nurture, and it was all in her nature. There are two rooms in our house that remain untouched and unchanged. And when I step foot into this room that is decorated to the fullest of our parental capability, I'm left gasping for air. Inside of this room is a crib and bed which we so eagerly waited to acquire for her. The small layer of dust that now coats all of her soft toys makes a room feel like an ancient tomb. Something happens to me in this room. My heart begins to break, my body begins to sweat, and I feel a chill. It is at this moment that my soul splices and remorse floods. The image of my daughter playing in this room, rolling around her giant teddy bears and her dog, which she so gracefully and gently petted, destroys me. Something happens to me in this room. More images then begin to flood my memory. I can't get the thought out of my head of the entitled monster who killed them. Something happens to me in this room. I begin to sweat because my mind wants what it can no longer ever have. When I hear the ghostly echoes of memories past, lullabies such as Baby Shark, Five Little Ducks, No More Monkeys Jumping on the Bed, and an endless plethora of music, I'm filled with pain. I learned these songs at the same rate that my daughter Lilia did. In fact, you could tell, you could say that my wife was my teacher. My daughter, even at, a, at an early age, had a routine. She had a life. She was sentient. She was aware. She was so eager to learn, and she did so very rapidly. It was very impressive. Lilia began communicating to us from the very beginning of her life as she cooed and snuggled up against, up against her mom. I knew we had a priceless, priceless soul in our hands. And everyone knew that she was an irreplaceable beacon of light. Instinctively, my wife Jessica became ruthlessly protective. She did so in the form of radiating love and nurture. I'd like to discuss the importance of safety in our lives. My wife and I had mutual agreements on how we would handle any type of emergency or danger. In the event of a house fire, we strategically place our bedroom next to our daughters in order to ensure a successful egress of our family. When shopping at a grocery store, we always kept our eyes on our baby. When we put our daughter in her car seat, 
There was a thorough and safe way in which we secured her on board. We learned all of this with the help of our local volunteer fire department, and we're grateful for it. We always had our daughter in front of our eyes and never let her roam behind us. We didn't relate to parents who would so blissfully ignore the hazards that may arise for any toddler. So we took it as our God-given duty to mitigate all risk, hazards, and danger. We also were big fans of our local safety town. And we looked forward to showing our daughter many things, such as safely crossing the street. We never calculated that you, Cameron, would not give them that opportunity. You eliminated the chance of them crossing that street forever. I remember my wife, she would lock the door after she would place our daughter in her car seat in order to ensure her safety as she walked around to the driver's seat, where then she would open the car door. This is just a small example of her mindset when it came to protecting her daughter from people like you. We were very aware that danger is present in this world. We just didn't think it would be tragic. I cannot describe the torment and torture of the sequence of events of that tragic day. In fact, I like to read off script. I'll never forget driving northbound on Bayshore after I left the park minutes after talking to my wife on the phone. We were headed to Pompano Beach where I, were, where I was scheduled to start a certified flight instructor academy. It's our reason for being in Florida. We came to Tampa on a very, very short vacation. On my way up northbound from Ballast Point Park, I was shocked to see the amount of vehicles and the enormous amount of service vehicles and emergency responders, patrol cars. And I thought to myself, oh, something terrible had happened. I hope I'm not late. But something terrible has happened. And I began a prayer for a stranger. The traffic was so intense that I decided that maybe I should cut across to MacDill, where there was a gas station. I proceeded to fill up my vehicle with fuel in order to prepare our travels back to the south of, no, excuse me, north of Fort Lauderdale. As I left the gas station, I pulled into West Knights, which is where we had been staying. And I walked in her uncle's house. I grabbed our luggage. Before I could leave the door, I realized my girls aren't here. Something terrible has happened. And it's them. Your throat begins to shut and fight or flight takes over. I cannot express the amount of fear in my soul. I arrived to the scene. Before I placed eyes on the stroller, I saw your vehicle. One of my initial thoughts was, I hope whoever's in that car is okay. And then I began looking for my wife, thinking maybe she's a bystander right now. Maybe she's at the scene. When I, when I walked over to a lady who definitely seemed emotionally distraught, I said, ma'am, I'm looking for my wife and daughter. They were, they were coming back from Ballast Point Park. She was pushing the stroller. I'll never forget the strength in this woman's hands when she dug her fingernails into my forearm, closed her mouth, and pointed at law enforcement officers. 
they would provide me with information of where my daughter and wife was. When I was told that they were in Tampa General, I knew something terrible had just happened. I had no idea where this hospital was, but I knew I must reach them. Because if I find Jesse, I find Lilia. They were never to be apart. I can't tell you what it's like to have to have a bystander give you a ride in their car and hand you a rosary, letting you know something terrible has just happened. Time seemed to stop at this moment. The fear of my ancestors filled my heart, and I was scared of God for the first time in my life. After arriving at Tampa General, as I was running through the maze of this hospital, as most hospitals are, it can be confusing. I remember seeing a chaplain walk out, and I knew she was dead. I can't explain to you the effort and courage it takes to walk into that morgue and see the injuries that you created on her body. It is impossible to describe this day. I've had three years to digest it, and I'm disgusted. I'll never forget that run that exhausting, tragic run. You know, I watched as people stood here and discussed your character, teachers, friends, family members. I'd like to read an excerpt from one of her best friends. She said, Some friends are with you through a few stages of life, in and out like the breeze. They are with you during small fractions of your life, and as life changes, so does that friendship. It's rare to find a friend that remains steady and unchanged throughout many years and stages of life, but that is what I had with Jessica. Jesse and I were best friends since kindergarten, and our friendship remained steady and strong through all the new seasons and stages of our lives. We ventured elementary school together, living a street away. We would meet each other in the neighborhood after school to play all the time. We relied on each other during middle school when we didn't quite fit the mold of any clique, but we always knew we had each other. In high school, our bond grew closer since we knew who we were and what true friends were like. All my memories from high school have Jesse standing right next to me. Sports, school events, class, training, ACT tests, prom, graduation, family vacations. On to college, where we stayed in touch across Ohio writing snail, ma snail mail letters back and forth, always keeping each other in the loops of what was going on in our lives. As we moved out of college and into our careers in adulthood, we always made it a priority to see each other and spend time together, no matter how much time had passed. Our friendship never missed a beat. Now here I am, venturing into, into new stages of life by myself. I don't have my best friend with me anymore to laugh about our favorite memories, to squeal in excitement about a new chapter of my life, to share my new apartment with, or to tell her about my new nephew. She has been gone for almost three years, and I'm in a new stage of life that she will never be a part of. In a blink of an eye, the friend that was my constant since kindergarten was gone. The day she was killed, I could sense something bad had happened from my family's response and persistence in getting a hold of me. I was preparing for the worst, but I did, I did not think I knew what the worst could be until I heard it. 
I fell to the ground in a heap when my sisters looked at me with pain in their eyes and said, it's Jesse. I prayed and prayed that she was just an injured. She was just injured. That I'd get to hug her again. I kept asking, is she dead? Is she dead? My sisters, who also loved Jesse dearly, had to be the ones to look me in the eyes and tell me that she was dead, that she was gone forever. Jesse and I had hopes and dreams about the upcoming stages of our lives. Never once did we think that one of us wouldn't be alive for it. We would talk about things we looked forward to in our futures, like her guiding me through future wedding planning, asking her advice when I would become a mom, introducing our kids to each other, buying first homes, class reunions, growing old and looking back at our hilarious memories. And in a blink of an eye, all of that is gone. All of it is gone without a chance to say goodbye to the person who was by my side in every stage of our lives. Now here I am, alone, moving to new stages without my person who had been through all the other stages. This is one person that's impacted. One. I love and loved my wife more than I loved my own life. Because she was the reason my daughter was given a life. This is not because I misplaced value on mine, but because she lived with so much love, it was hard not to compare. She had incredible ability to heal all my wounds. She was the soul of this family. Now you force us to come back to Tampa Bay three years later. How dare you think you're worthy of stalling justice or attempting to acquire a lower sentence? I'm disgusted by your actions. Every mother on earth that loves their children also is disgusted by your actions. You owe every single mother of Tampa Bay an apology. The only way to do this is by removing yourself from our society and paying your debt in the form of imprisonment. Your actions eliminated the most precious amongst us, a mother and a child, my wife and my child. Three years. Three years of misery, uncertainty, loneliness, sorrow. Can't describe the silence in a house where there's no longer life. There's no longer hope. I thought about this day over and over again. I know I'm, I'm a sympathetic and empathetic being. I always have been. And I was at an early age. I've met many 18-year-olds in my life. Many 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds. I had been their peers at one point. And there is a difference. There are those that know right from wrong. This isn't about forgiveness. This is about what you owe the mothers of Tampa Bay. There are no more tears left. Your actions are self-explanatory. I believe that had I another child that was your age, I would not want them to be near you because you could lead them astray. My health hangs in the balance, and it has for quite some time. Your Honor, I, 
I respect your power. I'm humbled by your power. And at times fearful. I hate to beg, but I beg you for the ultimate sentence, which is 30 years in prison. 15 years for each count. For two beautiful lives that had many more years to live. At 24 years old, you wouldn't want to be killed by a car. The autopsy report explains in detail those injuries. I believe if you've ever gotten the wind knocked out of you, you could hardly compare the pain that she must have felt as she let go from this earth. It's the only way that she was to leave because she loved life so much. Your Honor, I firmly understand that this is a difficult day and a very difficult decision for you to make. I just hope that you understand that you would have wanted Jesse and Lilia in your family as well. They would have brought much joy to you. And I hope you take into consideration her soul. Because it was very pure, sir. Thank you so much for your time and your resources and helping us out in the state of Florida and trying to convict you with a proper sentence, which is the maximum. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? That's all. No more questions. Nothing. Mr. Rappel, Yes, sir. The yes, state will call on Michelle Clark. State your name for the record. Your Honor, I am Michelle Clark, sister-in-law of Jessica Reisinger Robinal, and godmother of Lilia Robinal. I am also the sister of David Robinal, the sole survivor of his family. Your Honor, I would like to thank you for your time and attention today. This day is one that has taken too long to arrive. This is a day in which no possible sentencing could begin to repay what has already been lost. It has been more than 1,000 days since Jessica and Lilia took their final breath on this earth. Over 1,000 days since I last saw Jessica smile. Over 1,000 days of not being able to hold Lilia and tell her how much I love her. Over 1,000 days of knowing my brother sleeps alone. Longing to be near his wife. Longing to tuck his sweet baby girl in bed and sing her a lullaby. Instead, he is reminded of Jessica and Lilia's broken bodies and their last tragic moments here on earth. Over 1,000 days of mourning, grieving, irreversible, irreparable loss. Since Jessica and Lilia's death, Cameron Heron has been a free man longer than Lilia was alive. She was only allowed to live 21 months because he killed her. There have been over 1,000 days of Cameron living his life, including attending college, when Lilia did not even have the chance to go to preschool because of him. 
over 1,000 days of Cameron spending time with his family while we have longed for just one more day with Jessica and Lilia. All of this time has been granted to Cameron Heron, a man who killed an innocent mother and her 21-month-old daughter. Your Honor, as my brother stated, there are men, 18-year-old men, who serve their country, their communities, and society for the betterment of this world. And then there are men, such as Cameron, who live to serve themselves, even at the cost of innocent lives. Your Honor, the act of street racing, which it was street racing that day, Cameron engaged in street racing by definition. The act of street racing is an act of entitlement. It is a criminal act. More specifically, it should be seen as a terrorist act to make the conscious decision to street race on a well-known frequently visited pedestrian boulevard is not just an act of malice, but without question should be considered an act of terrorism. To use your vehicle as a weapon of fear, to make thunderous sounds with your exhaust system, making the announcement that you are the predator and pedestrians are your prey to take ownership of a public street and use a Mustang, a 3,500 pound piece of metal roaring down a pedestrian boulevard at 100 miles an hour is a monstrous act. And ultimately, and this is the difference that puts Cameron Heron in a very different category than John Barano worlds apart, to use this momentum of speed and weight to strike and kill a mother and her 21-month-old baby is without question an act of evil. Cameron Heron did not choose to street race on the highway that day, nor did he choose to race on a racetrack. Instead, he chose Bayshore Boulevard. Bayshore Boulevard is connected to one of the longest sidewalks in the United States, a crown jewel of Tampa, Florida. Cameron Herring is familiar with Bayshore Boulevard, one of the longest sidewalks in the United States, a continuous visual cue telling Cameron Heron to stop street racing because without question, someone was going to die. A pedestrian was going to die. And not one, but two pedestrians died that day. Jessica and Lilia did not stand a chance with a man like Cameron behind the wheel. A street racer like Cameron Heron is a pedestrian mother's worst nightmare and her child's greatest threat. Your Honor, today I am here before you with feelings of deep sorrow because what my family really <clears throat> wants, we will never get. We want Jessica and Lilia alive, but they are not alive, all because of Cameron Heron. And here he is before you, hoping for a light sentence. He has continuously used his resources with the aid of his attorney to stretch the law to its thinnest point even though all of this happened because he broke the law and killed two innocent human beings. Cameron Heron lives 
a life of privilege. I am here before you defeated because no words exist to describe the monumental loss of Jessica and Lilia. To show you pictures and videos, to talk about them, does not begin to describe how extraordinary <clears throat> they really were. They would light up this entire room with their presence if they were here right now. Instead, here we are to witness the privileged sentencing of Cameron Heron, the enormous privilege of time in prison. You see, the moment he took Jessica and Lilia's lives, time on this earth stopped for them. And time with them here is something we will never be granted again. This sentencing is a merciful sentencing. Even though Cameron Heron showed no mercy when he decided to race in the middle of the day, knowing mothers and children, pedestrians would be crossing the many crosswalks on Bayshore Boulevard. Your Honor, we are not asking for revenge. I stand be, I am here before you brokenhearted, begging for some semblance of justice. The maximum allowed 30 years of time in prison for Cameron Heron. You see, Cameron has already won. He will always be better off than my brother. Because even when he is sitting in a prison cell, he is still far more fortunate than my brother David will ever be. Because Cameron has stolen from him the one thing my brother cannot get back, time with his wife, a lifetime of memories ripped out of his hands time to raise his daughter, no longer a possibility for him. Instead, here before you now is a fatherless widower who in the next hundreds of millions of seconds left in his life, not one of them, not one of those seconds will ever be spent with his wife Jessica or his daughter Lilia. Your Honor, this necklace I am wearing today is the rosary I held in my hands as I sat next to Lilia in the hospital. I prayed and prayed for a miracle I knew would never come. God had taken her with him because the damage was too severe and not reversible. I looked at her beautiful face her once perfect nose, now broken and twisted to one side, no longer able to function. When I kissed her forehead, I could smell the blood from all of her wounds. I read her books, book after book after book, hoping for a reaction, a sign that she could hear me. The doctors routinely came in and tested her poked, prodded, pinched, caused pain to see if there was any reaction, but there was none. My heart hurt because I thought of how tenderly Jessica and David cared for Lilia, and to see her now being pinched, deliberately hurt, to see if she reacted to the pain was never, ever something Jessica or David would have imagined for their daughter. Lilia's big, beautiful brain, which had been filled with so much wonder and endless potential. This same brain was now dead. A ventilator was keeping her body warm, even though it was already dead. This ventilator was there to save other people's lives, allowing for Lilia's organs to be donated, but it was not there to bring her back to life. As I sat next to Lilia, I felt an emptiness from the lack of Jessica's presence. Watching our sweet baby girl laying on the hospital bed, so broken, so damaged.
thinking of how Jessica and David had worked tirelessly to keep their daughter out of harm's way. To be sitting in this hospital room without Lilia's mommy was sickening. By the time I was ready to visit Jessica at the morgue, it was too late. They had already taken her away. Both her family and mine said I had been spared of seeing her in the horrible state she was in. And my heart broke all over again. Uh, I asked myself in that moment, what kind of a man would do this to Jessica? What kind of a man would do this to her sweet baby? And today I ask myself, what kind of a justice system allows for the same man to go about his life freely for almost three years after killing Jessica and Lilia? Many times my son, who was four years old at the time of their death, many times he has asked me, Mommy, why wasn't I allowed to say goodbye? Why didn't you take me to the hospital to see them? And every time I have to explain to him their bodies had been so damaged and his little heart would not have been able to handle the pain from seeing them in this state. And so he cries all over again at the horror of all of this. Before I got on the plane to come here to Tampa for the sentencing, my son cried, worried that something was going to happen to me here because this was the same place where Jessica and Lilia were killed. Think of the many years of, ser of therapy my now seven-year-old will have to go through in life. Think of the innocence he lost from these deaths. My son William asked me to buy a little stone with an angel on it so he could visit Lilia and Jessica outside our house in nature. He reads them books to show them he can now read. One of the last conversations I had with Jessica was dreaming of the days our children would go to college together. Maybe they'll all go to Worcester College or Ohio State, or better yet, maybe a Christian college. We dreamed. And I pictured Lilia, William, and my son Christian staying up late, ordering pizza, and having an ordinary but incredible college moment. That moment will never come. And yet somehow the man who killed Lilia, who made any moment like that impossible for her, impossible for my son to have with her, that same man has been going to college and having those very moments he killed for my children and for my brother's only child. And I hope that my words are allowing for some understanding of the real disparity between Cameron Herring and my family. Finally, Your Honor, I leave you with this perspective. My sister-in-law, Jessica, found great pleasure in the smallest things. She practiced deep humility. Humility is not something we are born with. It is something that we choose. She would say, 15 minutes outside is all you need to brighten your day. A little sunshine can go a long way. She emphasized how important it is to nourish one's body with food. She believed in getting proper rest and starting every day with a positive attitude. And most of all, she cherished time with family and friends. All of these very important luxuries will continue to be afforded to Cameron Heron when he goes to prison. Your Honor, you see my pain and you hear my pain. And now I want you to think of my brother's pain. I have no words, none, that would really capture the hell that he lives every single day. Please, Your Honor, bring some semblance of justice to this never-ending injustice. The maximum sentencing is generous. 30 years passes in a blink of an eye when you're alive. 30 years is not an option when you are dead. Jessica and Lilia did not reach their 30-age milestone. 30 years of living, breathing, eating, sleeping, and visiting with family. Jessica and Lilia will have none of these moments, but Cameron will. Your Honor, if these two murders do not call for the maximum sentence, then what does? 
Anything less than the maximum sentencing sends a clear message to my family, to the residents of Bayshore, that if a man chooses to use his vehicle as a loaded weapon to strike and kill innocent pedestrians, he will get almost three years to carry on with his life as if nothing has happened. He will not get enough time to pay his dues to society. Anything less than 30 years sends a clear message that the diseased matter less than the criminal. Your Honor, the loss to our families cannot be measured by 30 years of prison, but the laws are bound to this number and therefore <clears throat> the victims, we are at the mercy of that law. Please, Your Honor, bring some semblance of justice to this. It's easy to forget the dead, to push them to the side, but our families will never forget. Jessica and Lilia were here. They were real and they cannot hold less value than the living. They matter as much today as they did when they were alive. Please, Your Honor, think of the mothers and children of the city of Bayshore Boulevard. Your Honor, if we are to discuss a teenage brain, an 18-year-old legal adult and its development and use this as a reasoning for a lighter sentence, then we must question why the law allows for a teenager to operate a vehicle in the first place if their brain is not able to handle that responsibility. We would bring into question why 18-year-olds of this country are able to enlist in the military and be the protectors of this country. This, Your Honor, is an insult to all of the law-abiding 18-year-olds in this country. This reasoning gives every 18-year-old an excuse to use their developing brain to justify murder. This is unacceptable. 30 years of time in, pri in prison is a sentence my brother would take if it guaranteed his wife and daughter would be safe, unharmed, and alive. We are not asking for a death sentence. We are not asking for revenge. We are asking for justice to these killings. I have nothing further, Your Honor, and I thank you once again for your time. Mr. Hill, do you have no, any other no, no, no questions? Hold on, Ms. Clark. Do you have any follow-up questions? No questions, Judge. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Thank you. Mr. Hubbard? Yes, they will call uh, Brian Rabinal. Go ahead and speak into the microphone. State your name for the record. My name is Dr. Brian Anthony Robinald. And tell us your relationship uh, to the victims in this case. I am the brother of David Robinald, the brother in law of the late Jessica Risinger Robinald, and the uncle of the late Lilia Marie Robinald. Thank you for allowing me to speak today, Your Honor. My God, sir, I cannot tell you just how much I have yearned for this day for the last three years. Today, we are here pleading for justice in the case of one of the highest crimes known to humankind, the killing of a mother and her child. <clears throat> the death of our Jessica and Lilia at the hands of Cameron Herring. If we were living in a different time, in a different place, you would have started a war and we would have ended it. However, we are the Robinolds and Risingers of Northeast Ohio. We are families of honor, faith, integrity, respect, tradition. But most of all, we are law-abiding families. And as of May 23rd, 2018, we are also families of massive grief. So rather than act on the natural instinct to seek vengeance, I place my faith in the hands of this court in the hopes that justice is granted to those we lost and for those of us who have survived. I respectfully request, sir, that the maximum sentence of 30 years be placed against Cameron Harry, and please allow me to elaborate why. First and foremost, for Jessica and Lilia, 
I want 30 years, Your Honor, for the direct loss of life of Jessica Risinger Robinald and her daughter, Lillian Marie Robinald. They are ultimately the victims here, and they should still be alive. No one deserves to die young, and more so at the hands of someone else, in such a violent and traumatic manner. The number 70 feet stands out, Your Honor. <clears throat> it was determined that my niece Lilia's trajectory upon impact was 70 feet. Your Honor, I can tell you that there are very few events in nature capable of displacing someone with such force. Jessica and Lilia were legally crossing the street. <clears throat> Something that thousands of innocent people and young mothers do every day in this beautiful city of Tampa Bay. We all have nightmares thinking about what that last moment was like for her. The sound of the Mustang's engine as Cameron was driving towards them was unfortunately and tragically the last sound they heard on this earth. <clears throat> they are no longer with us solely because of the reckless and entitled behavior of Cameron Hare. He knew what he was doing, sir. The thrill that he was seeking, the rush that he was enjoying, was due in large part to the risk he consciously knew he was taking. This was no accident, sir. This was deliberately dangerous behavior. And as the evidence has shown, it was something he regularly engaged in. Their death was no accident but rather a product of Cameron Herring's true character, which is one of gross entitlement, arrogance, and an overall disregard to human life. Short of not having raced that day on Bayshore, Cameron could have veered off into the median or perhaps driven the car into the water. Instead, his trajectory didn't change at all. And after having previously accelerated upwards of 102 miles per hour, he plowed straight into them. After going that fast, Your Honor, no amount of braking power could have stopped that car in time. I want to point out that the defense brought up the fact that upon impact it was 35 to 40 miles an hour, as though that's some sort of excuse given that the speed limit is 40 miles an hour. Had he been traveling the speed limit, it would have stopped on time. <clears throat> Your Honor, mothers and their children are the most sacred members of our society, sir. In any emergency, in any disaster, I asked this courtroom, who do we save first? Women and children, always. So I am compelled to ask, my good sir, is it thus not only logical and morally obligatory to pursue with equal vigor the punishment for anyone who harms, or worse, as in this case, kills a woman and her child? Jessica and Lilia became heroes when they saved lives by donating their organs, something we are all so proud of, and try to sign Try to find some sort of comfort in, sir. But the sad reality is that their heroism came about because a villain killed them. <clears throat> and that villain is in this courtroom today, and his name is Cameron Heron. They were supposed to come back safely, sir. They would have continued their life together, and by now, Lilia would have likely even been a big sister and Jessica would have continued to glow as the amazing mother and wife she was always meant to be. It will take lifetimes before this world sees anyone as beautiful as Jessica and my niece Lilia. You can only find souls like them in heaven, sir. Here on earth, they were each one in seven billion, and they are dead now because of Cameron Harry. <clears throat> you have to forgive me for not crying, sir. I've been doing that nonstop for three years. Next. <clears throat> For the survivors and the life we face now, I want 30 years, Your Honor, for the devastating life that we, the survivors, are now forced to live. Most of us knew better than to bring our physicians and psychiatrists to this hearing today, although they would have perfectly been able to articulate the symptoms of post-traumatic stress that we are all suffering from every waking moment of our existence. I, for one, now tremble at the sound of roaring engines. There is a rage and a fury that lives inside me that flows through my veins. 
that I never knew I was capable of experiencing. There is a sadness that overwhelms every attempt I give at happiness now. And your honor, sir, I'm just the brother-in-law. I'm just the uncle. <clears throat> Can anyone in this room imagine what it must be like to walk in the shoes of my brother David, in the shoes of Mr. Robert Reisinger or Mrs. Pamela Reisinger? What it must be like for Danny, Tommy, and Katie, who spent their entire lives with their sister, Jessica. <clears throat> or perhaps Henry, Charlie, Samuel, William, Christian, Lilia's cousins. I, for one, was also looking forward to having my own children one day and raising them with Lilia. We were robbed of so much, sir. Aaron, if you're able to, you can put those pictures on there so this courtroom can see how beautiful my niece was. And feel free to shuffle through them. <clears throat> that was her approximately one month before she was taken from this earth. She was the most beautiful soul I've ever known. <clears throat> we were robbed of so much. We have all morphed into versions of ourselves that we never could have imagined. What individual grieving does to the relationships among the survivors is something that is often not discussed in the aftermath of loss. We all love each other dearly, but we cannot control how each one of us grieves. Aside from mourning the loss itself, there is mourning of what our relationships used to be. <clears throat> how could we possibly express love to one another like we used to when each one of us is constantly drowning <clears throat> in sorrow and regret? Before the anger, before the rage, before the anxiety, before the overwhelming sadness, it was all so different. How each one of us is grieving affects each other drastically and slowly, like a virus. It starts eating away at the remnants of the relationship. It is so difficult to continue on with our own sorrow, but it is much more torturous to witness the suffering of the other survivors. Grief is a much more compounding <clears throat> process than most think, sir. The effects keep trickling through your life like a falling stack of dominoes, until you're just a shadow of who you were and the relationships among your families, family members become a fraction of what was meant to be. My God, sir, what a sad reality we live in now. I ask you, Cameron, do you know what it's like to dread holidays? Do you know what it's like to truly not be able to sleep? To wake up from the sound of your wife and daughter screaming for your help and you can't do anything? You know, we've we, uh, talked a lot about two-year-old brains uh, this morning. Do you know what it's like to look at brain scans for three days straight of a two-year-old's head, hoping that something will light up, that that radioactive fluid will make its way up to the brain, telling us that, yes, she now has blood in her brain. She's going to make it. Do that for three days straight without sleeping, with nothing. Do you know what it's like to identify a body in a morgue? Do you know what it's like to have to mentally prepare yourself for a deceased loved one's birthday? You want to celebrate their life and who they were, of course, but it will always involve acknowledging their death first. Do you know what it's like to love and miss someone so much that their departure from this hurt earth makes you hate the fact that you're still alive? Do you know what it's like to whisper into a dying toddler's ears on her deathbed I promise I will always take care of your dad. <clears throat> Do you know what it's like to be forced to sign your own child's life away? To look at her lying in a hospital bed as though she could wake up from a nap at any moment, only to hear doctors tell you that there is no hope. To hear hospital staff say she's starting to decompose. And if she is to be an organ donor, then we must act quickly. There isn't a place, sir, not even in the deepest chasms of hell itself, where a person can suffer such torment and tragedy. You did this to us, Cameron. You killed them. <clears throat> We're now serving lifetime sentences full of sorrow and mourning, pain, regret, trauma, anger, torture, and misery. No physical incarceration is remotely comparable to living in our hearts and minds, sir. I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy, not even on you, Cameron. 
What we hold on to now is only the hope that perhaps when it is our time to pass, that we will all be reunited again. Without this, there is truly no point in continuing to live this miserable excuse of a life that we have been sentenced to. It is the most hellacious nightmare of an existence I could have ever fathomed. <clears throat> because there is no remorse, Your Honor. I want 30 years, because from the very beginning, the concept of remorse has been non-existent, regardless of anything that was said in this courtroom today. <clears throat> Actions speak much louder than words. And this is how I found out there was no remorse. First Cameron, wanted his, first, Cameron wanted his license back. The very same day, Lily was pronounced deceased. It was truly unbelievable to see it in the news that evening. <clears throat> right after they carried Lily away, right after David was forced to sign her life away, to hear of that request just hours before, just hours after David held his daughter one last time, changed her diaper once more, and gave her his last kiss was almost as unbelievable as the very tragic event itself, sir. <clears throat> to this day, in three years, he's been in jail less than 48 hours, which came to my surprise when the defendant's mom used the word finally when he got out of jail. <clears throat> to add, they then proceeded to try to suppress the hard evidence and proved that proved he was far exceeding the speed limits that further validated all the witness testimonies. Finally, they moved to obtain Jessica's phone records in a last minute attempt to falsely uncover any quote unquote human factors. In other words, to insinuate that perhaps their deaths were in some way her fault. Just how awful can these people be? Time and time again, they really took things too far. Since May 23rd, 2018, there has not been any sign of remorse. No matter what was said in the courtroom today claiming otherwise, rest assured their actions spoke much louder. There is no remorse, only entitlement, sir. Their deaths, our suffering, and all of these legal proceedings have been nothing more than a simple inconvenience for Cameron and his family. <clears throat> and I want to read here one thing. That man is an adult. He was an adult when it happened. He is an adult today. By law, an 18-year-old in the state is an adult. So do not be fooled by this trickery by the defense of repeatedly using the word kid or boy. A kid was my niece, Lilia. A kid is Samuel, Henry, and Charlie. Christian and William, not that. <clears throat> I'm very sorry to hear that you had to downsize your house. I'll let you know that my brother and his wife and his daughter created a beautiful home in a 200 year old farmhouse worth $75,000. That's the house that him and I live in today. <clears throat> to establish a new, much needed precedent. Your Honor, I request 30 years for the implication of this sentencing hearing go far beyond the impact on our family. This is not only an opportunity to grant our family and the girls justice, but to establish precedence. While I understand that there are guidelines and statutes in place, sir, the power you have is truly remarkable and admirable, and I truly mean that. This is a chance to send a roaring message to this fair city of Tampa Bay to this great state of Florida and beyond. One that clearly establishes that when someone chooses to drive in such a reckless and entitled manner, leading to the death of innocent pedestrians, of mothers and their children, they will simply not walk away from it with a slap on their wrist. Regardless of the offender's intention, age, or prior record and background, this is a vital and necessary change, sir. Within this last week, Another street racing incident involving a 17 and 19 year old in the Orlando area led to the death of an innocent 11 year old girl, sir. This is plaguing the state. <clears throat> the city of Tampa Bay and the state of Florida at large continue to host the highest rates of pedestrian deaths in this country. Since our tragic loss, there have already been a few more deaths on Bayshore Boulevard from vehicular homicide. These crimes should be prosecuted and punished to the fullest extent of the law. The people of Tampa Bay deserve safer streets, 
The city needs a new precedent. The state should no longer be played by this. Your Honor, vehicular homicide is no less tragic than death from a gunshot. Trust me, sir, my family knows this very well. <clears throat> the punishment should meet the crime. It is time for a change. And on this subject, I'm gonna to touch on something because I kept hearing the concept of whether or not this man poses a continued threat to this society. That doesn't matter. What worse of a crime than killing a mother and her child? There's nothing worse than that. It happened already. It's about punishment. Lastly, sir, for my brother David, I would like to request the maximum sentence of 30 years for the complete destruction of my brother David's life. For any spouse or parent to overcome what happened to him is simply impossible. No amount of religion, faith, or therapy can create an easy path to perseverance and survival in a case like this. I can, hold on to, I can only hold on to hope, sir, that he is one day able to rebuild his life. Truthfully, I at least have to try to thank God himself every day that, he is with, that my brother David is willing to open his eyes and breathe, even though he always wake up from the most torturous nightmares every single day, sir, like any parent and spouse would in his unfortunate, <clears throat> horrific situation. To add to what is already the greatest of all tragedies, we cannot overlook the impact this has on David's oldest dream in life, being a pilot. For as long as I can remember, David has had such a beautiful admiration for aviation. He became an amazing pilot, sir. And it's truly a privilege, and I'm honored to go up in the skies with him. But you see, it all changed when Jessica and Lily were killed. You see, they were down here in Florida specifically for his career, sir. <clears throat> David was pursuing his commercial pilot's license in Fort Lauderdale, something he successfully accomplished right before their death. Jessica and Lilia were so proud of him, and he was looking forward to the subsequent prosperous and fruitful life his career in aviation was going to give them. Since Lilia was born, he dreamed of taking her up in the skies. Most parents look forward to their child's first day of school, playing sports, their college years, a wedding, and finally, them becoming parents themselves. David was robbed of all of this, ladies and gentlemen, and also of his beautiful dream of having Lilia become his co-pilot in the air one day. <clears throat> there is nothing with wings that he cannot fly, Your Honor. <clears throat> <clears throat> but getting up in the clouds now comes with a heavy price. He is forever reminded that his pursuit of this career with Jessica's unwavering support brought them here to Florida, where Cameron Herring ultimately killed his family. The Robin Hood Reisinger farm used to be such a beautiful place, Your Honor. It shined with Jessica and Lilia. It was so special, the home the three of them created. David used to wake up next to his beautiful wife to the sound of his daughter's horsey little voice. There are not enough iterations of the word love, sir, that could describe his previous life. If there was anything remotely close to heaven on earth, it was their company, it was them. <clears throat> Nowadays, him and I live together at the farmhouse, picking up the pieces, trying to rebuild our lives and make the best of what is left. We desperately search for signs in an empty sky, looking for answers when there are none to be found. We spend most of our days working on old tractors and farm equipment. We make lunch and dinner for each other in an empty house every day. We are now raising two wonderful dogs, Odin and Lancey, who fortunately bring us a smile every now and then. Your Honor, he's raising animals when he should still be raising his family. He's caring for dogs when he should be caring for his baby girl. I cannot think of a sadder alternate reality for him. We have each other like we always did, but it'll never be enough, sir. They say that when we die in our old age, the past dies. When children die, however, ladies and gentlemen, it is the future that dies. They say the strongest steel is born in the fires of hell, and the strongest timber is fortified in the winds of a hurricane. Rest assured, sir, we have been through hell and back, and we are strong people, Your Honor. We are men and women of steel, and we have to continue to endure the unthinkable. 
But even the toughest steel can buckle under this weight, and the strongest timber can break in these winds. Short of raising the dead, it is difficult for me to imagine what will make things better for my brother David. The mountain is too high to climb, sir. This storm is impossible to weather. But giving Jessica, Lilia, and David justice, sir, is the only start we can think of. Your Honor, I beg of you, sir, please grant Jessica and Lilia justice. In any given society in the world, across all of human history, there has never been a greater crime, a greater sin, than the killing of an innocent mother and her child. This was no accident, sir. This was not mere chance. At some point, someone was going to inevitably die because of Cameron Herring. It just so happened to be Jessica and Lilia on that day on Bayshore Boulevard. Once again, I re respectfully request that you give Cameron Herring the maximum sentence, sir, in conjunction with a lifetime ban of his driving privileges. I also request that his incarceration begin immediately. He's had three years at home. They've had enough time, sir, to make the proper arrangements and preparations and get ready for his imprisonment. <clears throat> Please, sir, recognize just how much 30 years in prison pales in comparison to their death and the terribly traumatic way they left us, sir. I would gladly take 30 years in the worst prison on earth. I would gladly sacrifice my own life, sir, if it would bring back Jessica and Lilia and my brother David would still have his family. But that's impossible, it's not gonna happen. But just to give you an idea, sir, just how much as you weigh this 30 years in prison is nothing compared to what happened here. <clears throat> The defendant still has his life intact. He will have an opportunity to rebuild, to make up for lost time, and to learn from his actions after his imprisonment. We, on the other hand, sir, will perpetually remain in this hell of a life until we die. The only hope that we now have is that this court, that you, my good sir, makes the right and just decision your Honor, please take my words into consideration. I thank you so kindly for your time and allowing me to speak. No other questions, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. No questions, Judge. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Judge, uh, the state would now call uh, Bob Reisinger. Bob Reisinger, um, father of Jessica Reisinger Robinal, and grandfather of Lilia Robinal. And uh, administrator uh, to the estates of Jessica and Lilia. Um, duty that I uh, volunteered to take off of David's hands. Um, I uh, insisted uh, to other family members that uh, I be the only one that uh, address uh, some of the financial aspects that were brought up earlier today. Um, I had the fiduciary responsibility uh, to my daughter's estates <clears throat> and officially um, it was called uh, wrongful death settlement that I was involved in. It, it wasn't called a payment, okay? Um, as I uh, entered into those duties, I took them very seriously and um, my expectations were that it would have zero impact on the outcome of the criminal court proceedings. Um, I knew uh, 
Um, as I was forced to sign a one-way non-disclosure agreement several years ago, that they would take this opportunity. Um, and to actually see it happen, um, it, it, it's, it, it was just appalling to watch. Um, and I guess, you know, I will, I will say, uh, I believe that I'm not violating anything. A significant portion has been set aside for charitable purposes, a very significant portion. Um, I almost want to say thank you for doing it um, because the effort to bring up that wrongful death settlement in an attempt to persuade the judge to soften the sentence and soften justice for this horrific crime is it cements in my mind the true character of that family <clears throat> and you know I as well have have worked very closely with the state attorney's office um, the last three years and you know my my view of the remorse and responsibility effort you know attempt to bring that to bear here after three years I mean the early and absurd attempt to get driving privileges reinstated then they proceeded to delay justice with a lengthy, lengthy and slow deposition process. Then threatened to deposition me to conduct forensic search of Jessica's mobile phone. It just, <laughs> in my view, that's a very unremorseful attempt to find a way to place blame in her direction. The, the morning that I sat and watched the gentleman download the phone, I received via email the motion to suppress uh, the information from the Ford Mustang infotainment system. And I couldn't, I can't tell you how sick, I sick to my stomach I got that day. Um, and, you know, it basically was an effort to suppress the truth. Now, how can, how can you today bring in people to give testimony that you've been remorseful, you know, from day one, when just, this is just several months ago that the effort was made to completely skirt your responsibility for this for this crime. And I, I believe over the three year period, they had plenty of opportunity to play the remorse and the responsibility cards. But each time, and yes, everything they did was legally allowed, okay? Whether it was what hits me in my mind is, was it ethically and, and morally uh, appropriate? Um, today, what we've heard about the remorse just, to me, came across very hollow. Um, one of the things that, a uh, few things that I uh, had the pleasure of uh, learning about were uh, Florida regulations. And uh, I have, uh, you know, it started with uh, 921.0026, 
mitigating circumstances for downward departure. Um, that was one of the first ones I learned about. And um, then I um, uh, spent some time with the criminal punishment code score sheet and uh, could see where the mitigating circumstances that they attempted here today uh, plays into your decision. And uh, statute 921.002, where it states the primary purpose of sentencing is to punish the offender. Rehabilitation is a desired goal of the criminal justice system, but is subordinate to the goal of punishment. Uh, I'll come back to the criminal punishment code score sheet. Um, I'm pretty good with numbers, but the uh, mathematics and computation, uh, I had told Aaron Hubbard were, were pretty intense and pretty confusing, but I questioned why the primary offense was 56 points and the additional offense of homicide, negligent manslaughter with the vehicle was only 28 points. And amazingly, racing that caused the whole thing was only 0 0.2 points. Um, certainly, two deaths at 240 points. Um, you know, the, the computation per the, the Florida regulations, 222.15 months. Uh, which equates to 18 and a half years. And if, if um, by chance, if both the primary offense and the additional offense were 56 each, you would round up and it would be a minimum sentence of 20.3 years. So um, then I, I guess for three, you know, I, I believe I've had almost three years to figure out what I'm going to say for my victim impact statement because I was told early on uh, that's going to be, you know, our best opportunity um, to say what's on our mind. And because there was so much uh, math involved, and I'm kind of a numbers guy, if you could give me the, the next slide. Um, I guess you can, I don't know where you could probably see it better over here if you can. So um, I attempted to, you know, based on the average life expectancy of, you know, at least the immediate family members, uh, Jessica's three siblings on the left, Katie, Tom, and Dan, and then Pam and myself, uh, I attempted to estimate there that the number of years that we each lost with both Jess and Lilia uh, separately. And uh, then I did the same for years lost with Brian, Michelle, and David's parents, uh, Rosie and Dave, and uh, did, you know, pretty simple math, just added the numbers up together didn't include cousins, um, and it just so happens that it adds up to 750 years of, of lost time with Jess and Lilia. And I struggled with this because I, I kept trying to figure out how to include David. So I kept saying to myself, well, you know, I can't count David's years the same as ours, and, you know, maybe I should double them or triple them. And I came to the conclusion that David's years lost with Jess and Lilia are, are absolutely immeasurable. And so I left it like it is, 750 years. Next one. Uh, 
Uh, being a parent comes with challenges, um, but being a parent comes with many great moments. I call them proud parent moments. Um, you know, in, in, in terms of this illustration, I, I couldn't bring myself to put nine and a quarter to 15 for Jess and for Lilia. I, I simply, it seemed appropriate to round up to 10 years to 15 years for each of them. Um, being a grandparent of my first grandchild, Henry, uh, is a little bit past five and a half years old. And I've been, I've been saying for about five and a half years to people that being a grandparent is the best phase of life. And uh, what I came to realize um, was that by now, we would be enjoying um, Lilia's sibling. And not illustrated there is I have three grandsons but I have essentially lost two more grandchildren. One three years ago, and the, the next one that would have come along, I'm sure soon. So I've lost 40% of my grandchildren. And uh, that's awful. And since I couldn't include David uh, in the last, in the second previous illustration, it definitely seemed appropriate since I witnessed his life being wrecked completely. Um, they've, his, himself and his, his brother and sister have done a great job, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pile on. But the purpose of, the, of this, I know full well that you are bound by the Florida regulations and the score sheet to a 20 to 30 year sentence. The true impact, from my view, equates to 40 to 60 years. I know full well that you can't do 40 to 60 years, okay? But all I ask is that you consider the total impact on our family when you make your decision. Thank you. Judge, um, the only thing, is that all you have for now? Yep. Okay. Um, Judge, just while he's there, um, the last thing I would just want to play the video. And um, Mr. Graham, uh, Mr. Weisinger had prepared this. Um, some of the family members in the video had already spoken, but it was prepared sometime prior in anticipation of different statements and different times in their life. So that's the last thing I have to present. It is about 42 minutes, so I don't know if you want me to go ahead and start it or if anyone needs a break. Do you have any, uh, any, any questions for the witness? No, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, let's, let's maybe take a five minute recess uh, and then you can kind of get everything set up. Okay. Of course, you recess for five minutes.
Mr. Hubbard, you, I believe you have a, a video. You yeah, just, just for the record, um, this is a video impact, it's a victim impact statement that uh, Mr. Rising or another family members had um, put together with their victim impact statements with some photographs and also some video uh, that's sprinkled throughout. So at this time, the state will go ahead and play it out. This now, to, uh, May 23rd of 2018 was such a catastrophic I'm sorry, Mr. day. Hub I'm sorry. The day yes, sir. that. I'm sorry. What was that? I just I just want to ask for the record if if you provided this to. Judge, he has not seen it. Uh, it was a victim impact statement, okay. so our position was that he that we weren't going to provide a copy. I have reviewed it. I mean, there's nothing in there that pretty much um, is. is not something that I would normally present through witness testimony. Okay, so. And for the record, Judge, we asked for it. We believe it was discoverable. Uh, the state declined, right. but well, they refused. They said Mr. Reisinger did not want us to have it. They wouldn't give it to us. I will have to take Mr. Hubbard's representations that it's what it is. I don't, I didn't make a big deal of it, and I'm not going to object, but I, I think for the record, it should have been produced to us, but that's, that's all right. If they don't want, to, want us to see it until now, that's fine. You're not raising an objection? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. All right. All right. Thank, thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Hubbard. A woman was pushing a 21-month-old child. You know, May 23rd of 2018 was such a catastrophic day. A day that, that changed our entire existence um, and it's a day that we're reminded of every day since we wake up to the same reality and the same nightmare that Jessica and Lilia are gone. It's scared many people. It's changed many people. <clears throat> and the pain does not subside. And there is no way to make this truly right. And they were taken in such a way that we will never come to terms with. There will never be any peace. I was studying abroad in Australia, about to board a plane to our next destination, when I got a phone call from my mom. Uh, I was gardening with my mom in our backyard, and we kept hearing the phone ring, but we were outside and enjoying ourselves. So we ignored the first phone call. Um, the phone kept running, ringing. We wanted to answer the phone and we were too late, but we got a voicemail from David. It sounded like he was running. We could just hear him breathing. We couldn't really make out what he was saying. Um, so we put the phone down and went back out and continued gardening. I could instantly hear it in her voice. She was in the car with my brothers and my dad. And she said something bad had happened. In my head, I thought maybe something had happened to our old dog or an aging family member. <clears throat> but never in a million years could I prepare myself for what came next. You know, the phone rang again. I remember feeling like um, absolutely nothing, like uh, just confused, like what do you mean? Are you, why are you saying that? Are you joking with us? Why, why, we just kept saying why, no, why, no. And um, completely disbelief. She told me that Jesse and Lilia were hit crossing the street, and Josie had died, and Lilia was in critical care. She said Jesse 
was pushing Julia in a stroller at a park. And we were hit and killed. Jesse was hit and killed, and we don't know if Julia's gonna make it. I remember like not being able to walk really, just like falling on my knees, and I tell my mom to get to sit down. We drove straight to Santa Bob's house because we didn't know what to do. Uh, my aunt came over and we thought we'd never be in this position. We looked at each other, we're like, what are we supposed to do? Um, my, my head, I'm like, well, I need to go to Florida to see if this is really <clears throat> happening to us. I still didn't believe flying in the airplane. I was, I figured I would get there and uh, we would get find them at the hospital and they would, you know, we were laying on a bed and we would fly home on that plane together. And so then I went to be with my mom and my brother came over too. And we were in so much shock together. My heart shattered and it felt like the world was standing still. I just remember sinking down into a waiting chair, holding my head in my hands and crying, but not even being able to feel that I was crying. And maybe if I could get home soon enough, some miracle would happen. Maybe if I just fell asleep on the plane and woke up, it would all just be a bad nightmare. The first words that came out of my mom's mouth was, um, they ran over Jesse and Lily. The news I heard before that was, David got his commercial pilot's license. He, I believe he got at least a 90%. Um, it was fantastic news. Things were looking great, you know. Um, they were on the mission, the mission was being completed. Um, so when, when I heard those words come out of my mom's mouth, it was just an immediately state of disbelief. There's, there's no way. This, this makes no sense. I mean, how could they have, in any way, shape, or form, been in harm's way? Two perfectly innocent, beautiful girls who were out exploring nature, their God given right on a sunny day and they were coming back and crossing the street <clears throat> to have lunch with my brother and they never got a chance to cross that street and they never got a chance to have lunch with my brother it didn't occur to me that that massive amount of traffic was there because because my family had just died. And that's why there, the traffic was backed up, because they had just died on that road. Jessica and Lilia had broken bodies on the street. My beautiful goddaughter, broken, completely broken. And my sister-in-law, Broken. I can tell based on the detective's looks that uh, some irreparable damage had just happened. Teenagers were drag racing on Bay Shore Wednesday when one of the drivers hit Jessica as she was pushing her stroller across the street. There's no way to describe seeing a chaplain walk towards you and not able to truly tell you what's happened until you follow them into a room. I didn't want to go in that room. This is the room that I walked on with my children. I got a call from my father when I was in the office and I could tell by the tone of his voice that something was wrong. I was uh, doing my job uh, as I normally would on a, a Wednesday morning I was at uh, my largest customer I got the phone first phone call from David then I got the second phone call 
from David at the hospital uh, where he put on um, the hospital chaplain uh, and gave me the news about Jessica. When the chaplain said, the mother is deceased, my soul left, if I can describe it. It, it left. And it started searching for him in the realm that's not even here. I collapsed in absolute fear and terror at what has just happened. I, I thought that someone was prank calling me, that it was not really my father, that this had not really happened. Um, I was confused, uh, anxious, scared, upset, angry, all at the same time. Three weeks after that, when I went back, tried to go back to work, I had a really difficult time uh, going back to that customer um, <clears throat> and sitting in their facility, and it, it brought back the visuals of what happened that day. I remember driving home to my house and pulling into a driveway, and my wife was smiling ear to ear. Our boys were in the backyard playing. They thought Daddy had just come home for uh, an early day to get off work and play with them. Um, and as it turns out, I had some of the most heartbreaking news from my wife that she had ever heard in her life. And um, to this day, when I get home early from work, there is that same look on her face when she sees me come through the door. Uh, a look of, oh my God, what's wrong? What happened? Um, you know, please don't tell me that you're home. Um, you know, to share more bad news. She was such an amazingly beautiful young woman to see what had happened to her, to see her face, um, was something that I will never forget, something that is ingrained in my memory. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's hard because I don't want to remember that aspect of her. I want to remember her for the beautiful, fun, loving, happy, young woman that she was, um, but that, that image will never leave my mind. I can never describe what it's like to see the corpse of your bride with a tube hanging out of her mouth. It was the most awful thing on earth. I have relived that day in my head over and over. For a long time, I was scared to answer any phone calls from my family. I would see my mom's name come across the screen and automatically assume the worst, and I still do it to this day. Before I pick up the phone, subconsciously I think to myself, what is the worst thing this person could tell me? And I guess that's my way of protecting my heart from reliving that pain. May 23rd, 2018 is a day I'll never forget. It's the day when that uh, the, the worst possible thing could have happened. Um, a young mother and her child were killed entirely in the hands of someone making an awful decision. I would talk to anyone who would listen.
listen about my adorable niece, Lilia. Everyone said she was the most beautiful little girl they had ever seen, and I was so proud to be her aunt. Chessie was an amazing human being. She always did what's right. She told the truth, you know, if something was wrong, and she, you know, helped so many people through her work with the Girl Scouts at the highest level, her mission trips, helping people in other countries that she didn't even know to help build them homes, to help bring them clean water. I mean, if there was one thing that Jessie was really looking forward to in life, it was being a mother, right? And she got that blessing and that came in her life and she had two years of it and then it was taken away from her. When you get was born, I my princess is that or my princess is that. She beautiful. And Jessie's so lucky being a mom. But I know that she had dreams of at some point starting her own private nutrition practice. I look forward to cheering her on as she chased those dreams. The dreams that would never come to fruition. I often play through in my head, you know, what ifs. You know, what if she would have been here to see the birth of my third son? What if um, she would have been here for his baptism, for her godson's um, first graduation? You know, there's there's so many what ifs that play through in my head of you know what if they would have been here for this you know Lilia's third Christmas, um, and they're all things that will only ever be what ifs because. They, they can't happen now. Lilia loved animals, and I was convinced that she was going to be a vet someday. I was so excited to get to share my love of science with her as she grew up. As I play through those scenarios in my head, I try to remember the positive aspects that they brought to my life. Um, I mean, my, the, the random phone calls that I would get from my sister where she would have an absolutely hilarious accent, um, you know, and just one of the only people that could get me out of, the, out of a funk through a voicemail. Um, I, I really don't know that many people who can call me, leave me a voicemail, and immediately just pull me out of a funk, you know, that it will be something that, it's something that I don't have anymore. Um, you know, I mean that. It, it's just that's just really hard. The one thing I remember about Jess, I truly admire, is how she can uh, turn a small negative into a positive. How she can turn a frown, you know, make someone smile. She was so beautiful, but even more beautiful inside. She. She did anything for anybody. And she was so humble. She was so humble and so, so self-giving, you know? Oh, everybody was always first. And she grew up so much happiness. She didn't stress about life. She didn't let little things bring her down. <clears throat> And I'm like looking at this world right now, COVID, so many things are going crazy and so many questions. And I'd love to, you know, have a conversation with Jess and say, hey, what do you think? Well, what would you do about all these world problems right now, you know? And she would probably say, let's just all be nicer to each other. Let's treat each other better. Um, but I can't, I can't call her, I can't ask her what she would do. You know, it's just, 
It's just I wake up and she's still not here. And Lily is still not here. And I can't be an uncle anymore. And I can't be her brother anymore. Having Jesse and Lydia in my life for the short time of my Adam, he's always going to be the biggest privilege in my life. No matter what happened before, no matter what happened after this. <clears throat> I, I consider them the needle in the haystack. You don't find it twice. You never will find it twice. I was able to FaceTime my sister and niece a few days prior to the accident from the hotel lobby in Australia. And my sister was so excited to hear about my adventures and kept asking me if Australians really say things like mate and shrimp on the barbie. And Lily was sticking her tongue out and making silly faces to the camera. We were all <laughs> laughing. And then the connection dropped. I never got to say goodbye. One last time. Her phone number remains in my favorites, but I will never see her name light up across my screen again. My career kept me away for a long time. I was never really able. Said now, every single holiday that passes by is just a torturous moment doing nothing but reminding us that they're not there. The biggest mistake I ever made in my life was to bring my family to Tampa Bay, Florida, because that's where the killers of my family mm -hmm. were. As a father, you always hold yourself accountable for my mistakes. Where did I go wrong? Why wasn't I there with? I know that David carries a significant amount of guilt as a, as a burden going forward uh, with the rest of his life. And uh, my, my hope is that um, it's a, a substantial sentence will help relieve part of that guilt Part of that grief, it, it will never go away uh, totally. Every day my brother wakes up with the reality that they're his girls, that he worked so hard. 
guards protect or take it from him. He's always going to have in the back of his mind that that it was his fault, and it truly wasn't. Um, he should carry no guilt uh, forward, but um, I understand why he does. I have three boys who were um, some of Lilia's um, cousins, and one of them may remember her if I get very, very lucky, and I continue to pray for them every night in front of my boys. Um, the middle one was too young, and he won't have any memories of them aside from his, aside from pictures and videos that we share, and the youngest one, Sam, uh, unfortunately never got to meet either of them. The accident happened before my senior year of college. What most considered one of the best, most fun years of my life. And instead it was a year filled with grief, anxiety, and fear at a level I had never experienced before and that I'm still dealing with today. Part of me feels like I was robbed of paying her back for all the good things that she did for me. Um, you know, my wife and I would always talk, well, oh, if you can just watch our boys for, you know, two hours or something, like, you know, we promise to watch Lily at any time. And it absolutely crushes me inside that we never had the chance to repay that favor to her, that we never, um, our niece was on this earth for such a short time that we didn't get to watch her. We didn't get to have her over for a sleepover with her cousins. I was 21 when they died, and my sister was 24. This October was the only time in my life I haven't looked forward to my birthday because I turned 24. I'm now outliving my sister at 24. Something no one should ever have to do. I've lost um, the ability and the experiences of having more grandchildren from Jess and David. Seeing Lilia be a big sister, I've, I've, I've missed you know, Lilia, you know, growing up and turning into the, to the fine young woman that Jess was on her way to, to bring her up to be. There were just so many things we looked forward to with them. You know, um, Jesse had this great birthday party for Lilia and she, um, pineapples everywhere and they were so cute and she was so excited to make it special for Lilia. Now, instead of talking to Jesse about fun birthday themes and um, celebrating every little milestone that we would celebrate together, the words she would say, the new words she would say, and the songs she would sing. Um, yeah, instead of that, we go to organ donor benefits. <laughs> and we're glad we can do that. And we're glad that people can benefit from that somehow. So we don't need to celebrate birthdays. All of those things you know, lead us to continue to live a life of um, absence and missing something that, you know, wondering what if, what it could have been, um, what her life would have been like. And those are all questions that will never be answered for us. That we'll continue to think about, dream about, worry about, wonder about, but they're questions that will never possibly could never possibly be answered for us. 
I came back to the United States with a suitcase full of souvenirs that I would never give them. I didn't get to see them one last time. What I saw was my parents and David coming out of the crematory with their ashes and my mom holding a lock of my sister and my niece's beautiful hair. So, we keep pictures of them and we keep videos of them. We have an ornament on the Christmas tree for them. And we have candles for them. We grab them. My life is different because of them. And my life is different because of losing them. <clears throat> Too. She never got to go travel. She didn't get to learn how to dance, and she didn't get to have more siblings. She didn't get the chance to celebrate all these holidays. She was two years old. She never even got to drive a car, ride a horse, you know, have a all these things that life is so amazing for all of us to to do. She didn't get to have any of that. And my sister Jessie got 24 years of an amazing life, but she could have had a way, you know, even more amazing future being a mother, being an aunt, being a daughter, being a sister. 30 years from now, my daughter would have been nearly 32 years old. Maybe we would have been grandparents. Maybe we would have got to meet her siblings. Because we had plans to. And it tortures me every day. Every day. Every day. Four and a half years into this, my son, David. Last night, Mary, every night, you know, trying to find them, trying to look for them. Every night, he's tortured with those nightmares. And he gets up, and it takes him two and three hours. You know, it's like when you have one vivid dream, you know how that affects you? Well, he has them every night. We hope that every day our son can <laughs> continue to cope. It almost took him down to the point where he ended up in a hospital and saved by the ounce of machine from a bacterial infection that obviously was taking advantage of his weakness and his stress and, you know, sorry, and um, and so in, in getting that, uh, that feeling that you're like, what, 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 oh my God, what's going to happen next, you know, I mean, waking up every morning, crossing your fingers. It's like a, a new life, um, you know, there was me before this tragedy, and there's now me in this new life that I have to figure out and live with. Um, and it sucks, it really sucks. It sucks that I like, am stayed up you know, all night last night trying to figure out what I gotta say for a victim impact statement that I shouldn't have to make. And then, like, we shouldn't be, this, you shouldn't have to make this video. You shouldn't have to watch this and have to make a decision on what to do. I couldn't run away from this. And neither should the defendants at any point. Because the prison that they sent me to is one I'll never leave. And the rest of my life, <coughs> I'm always going to want to take it back. I'm always going to want to 
to keep them as far away as possible from Bayshore Boulevard as I could. We followed the rules. We followed and obeyed the law because we were fearful of consequences. There are consequences for destroying an entire life, a family, friendships. I think of all the witnesses that day. I can only, ima I can only imagine my reaction had it been another family and my hopeless attempts to try to help, which a lot of people in Tampa Bay tried to help. And I just cannot put into words how opposite the people responsible for this are to us. Within several weeks after the crime, the drivers and their, or at least their legal representatives, uh, attempted to get their driving privileges and driver's license reinstated uh, by the court. That was just appalling. It came out in the press. There was some much coverage by the press of the city. And the, the, the thing is that the judge replied, there are no words that could come out of your mouth that would let me do that. And then over a span of almost two and a half years, the men used financial resources to delay justice uh, and not be held accountable you know, for the actions that they took that day. My opinion is that's a true statement to their character and should be considered as part of the sentencing decision. This wasn't fate, this wasn't destiny. This was created by them when they chose to do what they did that day. For every vehicle they passed, for every person on the sidewalk that was at risk, and ultimately for the girls that they killed. They made a conscious decision that they were gonna use public property, a street paid by taxpayers and law-abiding citizens they decided to turn their vehicles into loaded weapons, and they decided to kill that day. They knew there would be pedestrians crossing that street. At 10.30 in the morning, you know, not drunk, not, not in drugs, completely sober, you know, didn't care, didn't care. Somebody was gonna die. And it just happened to be our tools. And we have to live with the nightmare and reality that the people that ended up being their target were me, Jessica, and Julia. And the hardest part is that their deaths were 100% preventable. We've suffered enough the last two years. We're gonna to continue to suffer because what's the reality is you have a, this, t this kid who has his life full ahead of him right now, you know? But we're sitting here with two of our family members that we love so dearly that we'll never have again. So we all just have a bunch of big holes that will never be filled again the same way. And we're gonna sit here and struggle trying to figure out how to fill these holes. And there's no answer to that because they're not gonna get filled. Um, the sentence that has been given to us, we've been sentenced to life in a different form of prison. It's a life full of regret, anger, misery, torture, sadness with absolutely no light at the end of the tunnel. It is a sentence that cannot be commuted. It is a sentence that has no visitation rights. It is a sentence that we cannot do anything about other than just 
hold on to our faith and hope that when it's our turn to leave this earth, we will see them again. There is nothing that can be done to bring them back. Every day, I have to explain to my children that we live in an unfair world. And as a parent, I tell them that I will do everything in my power to try to make their world better. And I expect the court to do the right thing to protect the most innocent and vulnerable. Even though as a society we failed that day because we couldn't stop what happened. I don't want I don't want his life to be ended. I don't want you know him to lose a family member. I don't want any other people to lose family members from people driving irresponsibly. But the only way to stop this type of killing <clears throat> is to punish those who abuse their freedom to terrorize, torture, and kill innocent people. Otherwise, we live in a broken society, an uncivil society, where there is no hope for our children. And I pray that you do the right thing for all of our children, for Jessica and Lilia, who are not here, whose voices were taken from us, whose breath was taken from us. I hope you do the right thing. I, I would respectfully request that uh, that a proper sentence would be issued in this case when reflecting the crime. Um, regardless of intention, the risks were known, and they took them. They may not have intended to kill Jesse and William, but the moment they drove their cars at the speed they did on that street, they knew very well that it was a dangerous thing to do. Nothing, nothing will replace Jesse and William, and this is an extremely difficult for all of us to sit here and do this. Um, so if you could please bring justice to this situation, it may help us a little, uh, but ultimately our two loved ones are gone and they will never be replaced. Thank you for your time. Judge, with that, the, the state will uh, end its presentation. All right, thank you. Uh, any closing remarks, Mr. Fitzgibbon? Yes, just, just, just for the, I, I do just want to put on the record, um, and, and it, I, I think I mentioned this morning in advance of the hearing, I did read the. Uh, the motion for downward departure, I, I, I read all four of the uh, exhibits attached there too. I've also read and considered the pre-sentence investigation report uh, from the state of Florida. I've also um, read and considered the score sheet. And, um, and Mr. Fitzgibbons, I, I, during the course of the day, I was provided with the, uh, I, I believe, 41 or 43 letters that you have submitted. I have not read those, but I will read them prior to sentencing this evening. I just want the record to reflect what I've considered so far um, in the uh, course of the sentencing. Thank you, Your Honor.
Your Honor, now that all the um, evidence is concluded, uh, it's my chance to visit with the court for a few minutes on how we view the evidence and, and the law. And I think everyone agrees there's nothing good about this case. It's not good, certainly, for the Reisinger family. It's, a, it's an unimaginable tragedy. It's also been a very uh, unimaginable time for the Heron family and their friends. It's just, it's just no good for anybody. One of the things, because there is so much emotion on both sides here, is that I think we need to look at the law and the facts. A lot of the law that deals with departures uh, has been uh, developed by the Florida courts, as courts around the country have developed. There are emotional cases uh, frequently, unfortunately, in the court system. And I, I think as a result, the courts and the legislature have set up a framework for a judge in your position to, to work within that framework to give you guidance as to what, what you should do. Uh, what do you do in a case like this? Uh, that's the question, and that's the one you'll have to answer uh, ultimately in the case, of course. Now, the first point I want to make, and I address this just briefly at the beginning, the uh, Statute and the courts, of course, and you know all of this, has set forth uh, a, uh, the guideline system in Florida, and then it has uh, the legislature and the courts have set forth reasons why those guidelines don't always apply and give the court, as you know, a discretion to do certain things. There are certain enumerated reasons that would allow the court to, to depart if you see fit. And then there are other reasons that are not enumerated that the uh, Florida Supreme Court and other appellate courts in Florida have recognized as being reasons for a trial judge to depart. In the second district uh, uh, of Florida where we reside, of course, uh, the Second District Court of Appeals provides uh, guidance uh, in cases to trial judges within the Second District. We have set forth in our memorandum uh, the Camacho case, which uh, clearly is the leading case in the Second District Court of Appeal to give you guidance as to how do you handle these types of hearings. And the Camacho K court has indicated that there are basically three questions or three issues that have to be addressed at these types of hearings. Uh, and we cite the pages in, the, in, the, in, in our uh, memorandum. But bri briefly, number one, is there a valid legal basis for a downward departure? Obviously, you can't just say, the defendant's a nice guy, and therefore give him a break. It, these, th there has to be valid legal reasons, either by statute or by case law. So that's the first question. And the Camacho case court indicates that it's purely a legal issue uh, for the court. And on appeal, it's reviewed uh, de novo uh, by the appellate court. Then once, uh, say, there's a yes answer to that, then the next question, number two, is, is there competent substantial evidence? And that's a term of art in all of the cases, competent sta uh, substantial evidence to uh, uh, show that um, factually the defense case fits within the framework of a legally recognized reason to depart. And it's, uh, uh, when it's reviewed by the appellate court, it's under the competent substantial evidence test 
Uh, and then finally, the third criteria the Camacho case sets forth, if there's a legal basis for a downward departure that's supported by competent, substantial evidence, was the trial court or is the trial court's discretionary decision uh, uh, to depart an abuse of discretion, and that is reviewed on the abuse of discretion standard. Now Camacho went a little further uh, than I generally have seen in cases, or most of us, and gave some explicit instructions to lawyers uh, presenting these. And uh, I, I want to refer to these because some of the arguments uh, uh, that I have to make, I think I have to make uh, as a lawyer to be uh, effective. Uh, the Camacho case, of course, said specifically, and I quote, the attorneys involved in downward departure hearings need to assist the court so that the record on appeal will provide answers to the three important questions, which are basically, the, they frame it a little different there, but it's the same thing. So it puts a real onus or a burden on the defense to make sure that we have explained it and that our presentation covers valid legal grounds, the way I interpret that. So with that standard uh, set forth by the second DCA in Camacho, uh, we move to our, well, let me back up and move to the facts, the statement of facts, which do not seem to be disputed in the record, certainly not at this proceeding. And to make sure that we have competent uh, substantial evidence, we've uh, tried to make sure that the record is full of that. And we've attached four exhibits that, uh, that uh, support our arguments. We also have had testimony from 10 witnesses on the defense side. So I believe that the record is, is substantial uh, for the arguments that we make. Uh, we've also put in the collision reconstruction report from Detective Jakes. And then, very importantly, as we will discuss, we have set forth the transcripts of the uh, guilty plea proceeding by Cameron Heron, of, of Cameron Heron, and particularly of John Barano's guilty plea and sentencing. And there seems to be little dispute, and the court heard a lot of this during the suppression hearing uh, that we had in regard to the uh, 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 computer system in the car, that May 23rd, Cameron and, and John Barano uh, leave their house to uh, leave the, the Heron house to go work out. It's late in the morning on a clear sunny day. Uh, Cameron was 18, had just graduated from uh, Tampa Catholic two days before. John was 17. They're both driving their own cars. Cameron has the black Mustang, John has the uh, gold Nissan. No dispute in the record that, uh, and I think that was even confirmed again by Detective Jakes, they pulled up to the intersection of Bayshore and Gandhi that we all know about and then proceeded northbound. And in the next 30 seconds or so, about eight tenths of a mile is when this case uh, occurred, this accident. The, uh, the, uh, there's, there, the, 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 there, there is no doubt that these two young men when they set out or when they woke up that morning, there was no plan to kill somebody or kill two people. Just wasn't. There's not a shred of evidence in the record anywhere in this case. And we've deposed 45 some witnesses or something in this case. Just nothing. And there's no dispute that when they left in the Gandhi Bayshore intersection, they had stopped to a zero uh, speed and then they moved north. Now, the, where I'm going on this argument is that it could have been, but for the grace of God, for John Barano, that John Barano's vehicle could have struck uh, the two individuals and killed them. And we set forth in detail the testimony of the state's witness, Mark Lewis, who is critical uh, in this case. He was driving on Bayshore. He uh, was driving an SUV. Uh, he, had, he saw everything unfold in front of him. A, a classic eyewitness. 
Uh, he said, because I'm in my SUV, I was up above and I saw everything. And he testified, and that's uh, an excerpt, I think, Exhibit 4 of our uh, motion, that as he's driving along in the left-hand lane, John Barano pulled up behind him in the Nissan, then pulled out to the other lane and went past him. Uh, uh, very quickly uh, came the Mustang, and the Mustang was uh, behind uh, him, uh, behind uh, Mr. Lewis, and then moved to the right lane, went forward, and then went to the left lane, the same lane that Mr. Lewis was traveling in. With the Nissan in the lead and with the Mustang behind. Then Mr. Lewis uh, testified under oath that he saw uh, 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 Jessica uh, start to uh, leave the sidewalk side of the Bay Shore and step into the street. He then saw the uh, gold Nissan, uh, and in his opinion, the gold Nissan saw uh, Jessica move into the street. The Nissan then makes a hard left and gets in the lane in front of Cameron's car. He said Cameron then made a hard right and got in the other lane, and he, and he testified that Cameron's car was blocked by John Barano's car. He could not see Jessica and Lilia enter the street. He said then when the Mustang pulled out, and now he uh, spotted them, and within moments, the, the accident occurred. The detective, uh, Jakes, uh, reported that the two vehicles ended up, we saw pictures of them right near each other, and he said there was no way that when John Barano moved his car into the left lane, if Cameron had not gone around him quickly, uh, they would have collided. So the argument, yeah, and then that was supported uh, also by another witness that the state mentioned during the uh, plea colloquies with both of the young men, uh, a witness by the name of Stephanie Ives. And the court may recall in the search warrant uh, uh, affidavit that we litigated, uh, uh, Stephanie Ives is mentioned in there uh, in uh, Detective Jake's uh, affidavit under oath. And Stephanie Ives was also right near the scene and saw it happen, and she also saw the Nissan leading the Mustang. Uh, that is uncontroverted, Judge. It's just there's no dispute. So, uh, uh, and where this is going to segue into is the deal, the plea agreement that was reached uh, by the state with the approval of the Reisinger family for John Barano to get six years. And I will address that in, in uh, just a moment. But that's the basic setting of what happened here. And uh, uh, there's nothing in the record to show any distinction. Well, maybe I'll just stay on this for a minute. The, the state arrested both uh, John and Cameron that day. The criminal report affidavits charged both of them with two counts of vehicular homicide, one count of racing. Then, uh, when the state attorney took over, they uh, returned and filed an information with both John and Cameron named in the same information, same case number, and the same two charges, uh, vehicular homicide twice and one count of racing. They're being treated as equally culpable, equally culpable by the state that has obviously charging uh, discretion. Now another backdrop here is that uh, there were no drugs involved here. There was, there was no alcohol uh, involved here. And what it boils down to is 30 seconds of the worst mistake that this young man ever made in his life, not a premeditated uh, event, uh, event. Uh, the state never charged anything like that, and nobody disputes that. So with that backdrop, uh, the state 
uh, then offers, well, and then the other thing, as the score sheets were provided to us by the state attorney, both score sheets were absolutely identical. Uh, same maximum time, same 18.5 years, scored out. These are two individuals being treated as equally culpable by the state of Florida, by the prosecutor with all the discretion that they have. Then, as we came close, the court will recall to the trial date. Uh, the, uh, we were advised that the state had entered into a plea agreement with John Barano that he would plead guilty in return for a stipulated sentence of six years, a plea bargain uh, sentence. The state uh, declined to offer us any uh, uh, offer. We made no offer to us. Now, I have not seen any evidence whatsoever in this case, Judge, that, that explains why the state of Florida, under the circumstances and facts I have just outlined, the undisputed facts, decided to give John Barano six years in prison. And very importantly, the court will remember that Robert Reisinger spoke uh, at the uh, sentencing uh, proceeding of John Barano. And the court even asked, uh, what's the family's position on this? Mr. Hubbard said uh, they're in favor of it. And then at that point, Mr. Reisinger uh, confirmed that on the record that the Reisinger family supported uh, the six years to John Barano. And again, I can't emphasize this enough because as I talk about the cases, there, there's, the, the case law is very strong in Florida that uh, two defendants who are equally, sit, equally situated and who are equally culpable that a disparity in their sentences without some reason is improper. And the court can read some of the cases we have, and the court knows this, that when you look at some of them, maybe one defendant did 90% of the crime and one did 10%. So there's, there's a reason for disparity in the sentences. Or uh, in one of the reported cases, one of the defendants had like 20 convictions and the other one had none. Uh, so there was a lot of differences between the two. Here, and I just can't emphasize this enough, there's no, it, it could have been either one. And if the state's theory is that they were engaged in this uh, mutual uh, a conspiracy, if you would, or whatever, they're equally culpable under the law. Not one higher than the other, not one lower than the other, they are equally culpable. And we think that the record, uh, where we are right now is there is no difference between these two young men. No records, no, no criminal history, nothing. And I can't think of any reason why the state uh, agreed uh, to give uh, a, a tremendous break to John Barano from 18.5 years to six. They've never told us. They've never revealed it to us. We don't know, and you know, and there's nothing in the record. So as we stand here today, this record, uh, if we have to pursue this some way, is totally void of anything that explains why. And the Reisinger family, as I indicated, are uh, were fully supportive of the six years to John Barano, but want 30 years for Cameron Heron. There's no explanation in the record why. The two young men who were clearly, from all the evidence, were both at uh, a high rate of speed driving down Bayshore. Why give this uh, consideration to John Barano and not to Cameron Heron? Now, maybe one reason is uh, Heron's car, Cameron's car, was doing 102 miles an hour. But what is not said is within a car length or so behind him, who's going at almost the same speed, if not the same speed uh, at some point? Mr. Barano. And so uh, it's not like 
Uh, Cameron Heron was 40 car lengths ahead doing 102, and Mr. Barano was going along at 40 miles an hour. And furthermore, if uh, the stage theory is correct that they were racing, it's clear that they were uh, right next to each other. So I, I can't find a reason why that's in the record that would justify legally the disparity, and that's something the court says I can't emphasize enough, look at really closely. Why does one defendant get such a different sentence than another one? And I'd say one more time, there's nothing in the record uh, to support that. And as I've said before a couple times here, it could have just as easily been John Barano. Now maybe the, the strong feelings against Mr. Uh, Cameron Heron from the, the Reisinger's side of things is because it was his car that struck and, uh, and killed uh, the two people. But how do you excuse John Barano? How do you excuse the state's agreement to give him the break? How do you excuse the family supporting it? Now, moving to, uh, that really is our argument, uh, departure number four, ground. Uh, and I'll stay with that for a minute too, Judge. You know, we slight, cite the Sanders case uh, of the Florida Supreme Court. We also cite the Slater case and some other cases. Slater stands for the proposition, as a general principle, defendants should not be treated differently on the same or similar facts. And there's a whole line of cases that talk about that. And uh, so I think that would be my arguments on that point, which I think is, Judge, it just, it, it puts you in a position here, and I, I, I know it comes with the job, but this is, this is one that is not an insignificant uh, reason. It's a very, very significant reason, the disparity argument here. And uh, we would ask you to give that strong consideration uh, for the reasons we've set forth. And again, if the court reads in our sentencing, mem sentencing memorandum the uh, explicit testimony of Mr. Lewis, it's very clear. And the same thing with uh, Stephanie Ives. And one other thing I forgot to add, that at the time of the uh, two hearings on December 31st, in which at the first hearing, Cameron pled guilty, and then you set off the sentencing that we're, you know, we're here today. The, the court uh, received, when, I, when you asked the prosecutor for the factual basis, he read the factual basis or recited it and sent the record. And then that hearing closed, the next hearing took place with John Barano with the uh, plea agreement put on the record and then the sentencing. And it was the exact same factual basis because the prosecutor didn't even read it, didn't even set forth, just said that we'll go on the same, and th th this is entirely appropriate, uh, said we're just, we'll just basically incorporate what we said earlier with Cameron Heron. Barano indicated he'd heard it and agreed, and that was it. But they're just mirror images. This whole case, mirror image between Barano and uh, Cameron Heron. Now, when we uh, move to the specific reasons that we have set forth, our first departure ground, number one, the offense was committed in an unsophisticated manner and was an isolated incident for which the defendant has shown remorse. That is one of the enumerated statutory reasons that the court can uh, depart. Uh, the Romans case that we cite talks about unsophisticated being where the acts constituting the crime are artless, simple, and not refined. Uh, another uh, court, the Furman Court, says uh, courts have considered evidence of several distinctive and deliberate steps as, as analytical uh, uh, factors to determine sophistication. I don't think there's any dispute that this was about as unsophisticated as you, as you could get. Uh, the 
it, it's a, it, it took place in 30 seconds. There was no pre-planning. It involves putting a foot on an accelerator and driving, and that's it. Uh, so we would argue that that is a legitimate reason uh, for the court to, to depart, that uh, it's a, it was done in an unsophisticated manner. Now, we have presented uh, substantial testimony relating to remorse. A number of the witnesses that we have uh, presented have talked about the remorse that Cameron Heron has felt during this case. Now, the Reisinger family disagrees, and uh, I can uh, certainly take the blame doing my job as a lawyer. I would uh, never allow a client while a case is pending to, do, to make any statement about a case to anybody, not to make any admissions, not to apologize, not to do anything. <clears throat> Citizens sometimes have trouble understanding that, but there would not be a competent defense lawyer in the country that would allow that uh, to happen. And just an aside too, there's been controversy over, gee, we took all these depositions, we strung it out. Part of that was COVID, there's no doubt about it. Part of, it was, part of it was we had over 45 depots scheduling different people. And as the court does every time, and as you did here in the pleas by both of the defendants, you ask them, what, what has your lawyer done? Is there other stuff your lawyer should do? And, and one of the reasons the court does that, because somebody goes to prison for a substantial period of time, and then they file what we in Florida call a 3850, and they now come back before the court, want to throw out the case because the lawyer was ineffective, and he and she didn't do their job. Citizens don't understand this, but a lot of times lawyers are doing things because they have to, and I just want to say that. Now, the next uh, departure ground is that at the time of the offense, the defendant was too young to appreciate the consequences uh, uh, of the offense. Now, we, we've tried to tie that into adolescence, and uh, there's no doubt that some adolescents do remarkable things. Uh, others, uh, you know, they go to the military, they do different things. But also, it's, it's not even a dispute anymore in legal or uh, neuroscience circles that the adolescent brain is different. And the reason we do this is not to make some excuse, but to explain to the court the question that everybody has. You know, I can't walk into the grocery store at times and somebody will say to me, why did, they, why did these kids do this? What, what, what caused them to do this kind of thing on Bayshore Boulevard? And as we search for answers on it, especially because this is an offense that is not a premeditated, I'm, I'm going to go uh, rob a bank and shoot the teller. Uh, this was clearly not premeditated. So as we look for reasons, why? Why would somebody drive 102 miles an hour on Bayshore Boulevard? I wouldn't, court wouldn't, because we understand the risks and the dangers of doing it. But the science is strong that young men, particularly, just don't even process this. Uh, we heard it from the teacher uh, who brought both teachers, uh, the uh, aunt and from uh, the Tampa Catholic teacher about just the, the things that people, that young people do. And I can't begin to tell you the number of times I've heard people come, people come up and said, boy, some of the stuff I did when I was 18, oh, I'm lucky to be here. I'm lucky somebody didn't get hurt. It's, we, we, we all know instances like that. So the question is, why? And I think uh, when the neuroscientists recognize this, and particularly the United States Supreme Court, and one of the reasons I put in the sentencing memorandum the uh, uh, passages from some of the cases, well, the quote from the Miller case by Justice Kagan, and what stood out in that were just a, a consistent theme of immaturity, recklessness, impetuosity, 
or heedless risk taking that the Supreme Court has recognized for juveniles and adolescents, they, they, they do that stuff. It's just the nature of it. They do stupid stuff that mature people don't do. And so we, we believe that that segues into that the defendant was too young to appreciate the consequences of, his, uh, of the offense. Uh, he was 18 years old. He uh, had just graduated two days ago, two days prior from, from high school. He uh, uh, had always lived at home. Uh, I think uh, there's a theme from some of the couple of the witnesses that he, he wasn't, he's not stupid, he's not, he's a bright kid, but he might be a little bit immature, a little bit naive, seemed to be the theme that, uh, that the witnesses talked about. And the cases we cite uh, allow the court to downward depart if, um, for instance, on a, if someone's emotionally immature, if someone uh, is uh, young chronologically, and those things. So that gives the court a reason that is allowed and specified by the statute. Then the third departure ground that we argue is that Cameron Heron poses no future threat to society. And uh, that uh, is not in the statute, but it's in the case law. And the leading case in the area is State Against uh, Sachs, which is a Florida Supreme Court case giving guidance to all the courts in Florida. And the Supreme Court of Florida specifically stated, we agree that a downward departure may be based on a finding that the defendant poses no future threat to society and that his misconduct was uh, isolated. Uh, then the Second District Court of Appeal has uh, uh, ratified that in the Bingham case that we cite. The, the Second District stated, they were referring to a couple of different reasons given by the appellant. The second reason given, that Bingham posed little or no threat or danger to society, has been upheld as a valid reason for departure. And they cite the Sachs case. So that is good law uh, in the Second District Court of Appeal. And we believe that um, it, it's, it's I, I haven't heard a thing in our entire case through these 40 some depots, discovery that must be four feet high of reports, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of page, well thousands of pages of, of uh, materials that we received, nothing to suggest that Cameron Heron is a future threat to society. Just nothing, zero. Uh, uh, so that we believe, we, we certainly have met all the requirements for that ground. Uh, the next ground that we allege, the one I addressed uh, 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 previously, the disparity argument, the sentence that John Verano, uh, the, the agreed upon sentence uh, that everybody uh, was on board on, uh, and I don't think there is, anything more. Again, I think, uh, I think I, I'm pretty sure I cited the Slater case in my previous comments, but Slater held that as a general principle, defendants should not be treated differently on the same or similar facts. And uh, we cite some other cases too. So I think that we've addressed that in, in detail, Judge. Uh, the next departure ground is the defendant may be sentenced as a youthful offender. Uh, that, of course, is uh, uh, one of the departure grounds, one of the, another departure ground that's set out by uh, the statute. The court knows the Youthful Offender Act. We believe that because it's, it's there and it qualifies, we, we believe the court has to at least address that as to why, if, if you agree to impose it, yes. If you decide not to impose youthful offender, uh, why you didn't. Uh, the, um, the other thing that is kind of interesting here is the court well knows the YO, the Youthful Offender Act, uh, has a maximum sentence of six years for the uh, defendant. And it's an extraordinary coincidence that is exactly the six-year sentence that John Barano received. Uh, I think the reason clearly 
is that Mr. Barino was hoping for youthful offender, didn't get it. They didn't, the state didn't want to call it youthful offender, but they gave him for all practical purposes, youthful offender, six years, which is another factor, uh, I think, for the court to consider here. It's just, it's just too coincidental, six years and six years. The next departure ground relates to the uh, 6 million, 6.4 million paid to the Reisinger family. Uh, we can call it a pre-suit settlement, we can call it a payment, uh, whatever people are comfortable calling it. I, I think what's important here is for the court to understand the sacrifices and the effort that the Heron family uh, undertook particularly uh, as it relates to the $5 million umbrella policy. Uh, now the Reisingers can always give it back if they disagree, but when the policy specifically, as you heard the testimony, excludes racing, and the state's theory is racing, I don't know an insurance company in the world that wouldn't be fighting that thing for the next 10 years. Insurance companies just don't surrender very well, yeah, very quickly, not on $5 million. And I was not directly involved because I don't practice in that area, but I was well aware of the uh, lawyers that had been hired by the Herons to compel the insurance company to pay the money to the Reisingers. And it was uh, some very fine lawyers in this community uh, that um, uh, some of the best in the state and they just did a, did a hell of a job, Judge, frankly, to get the insurance company to pay this family $5 million. And the other part that is important here is that one of the lawyers that had been brought in was a bankruptcy lawyer. And I was aware of those different conversations and bankruptcy lawyers, and Mrs. Mrs. Heron testified to this, they, they would, um, in a heartbeat, put, put people into bankruptcy. Florida is one of the most favorable bankruptcy states in the country, as we all know. That's why I think OJ and everybody else moves to Florida because of the bankruptcy protections. And it protects uh, a lot of your assets, homestead, things like that. It protects retirement. It protects all kinds of things. And we, again, we all know that. And if the Herons had just said, you know, forget it, Reisingers, we're, we're just, do whatever you got to do. So I presume at that point the Reisingers would hire a lawyer. Uh, they didn't have to here. I think there was a real estate lawyer that helped a little bit at the end, but they never, as I understand, there was no personal injury lawyer taking one third or 40 percent. And the probate records show that the 6.4 million, just a little bit went to a lawyer. So anyway, we accommodated them, the Herons did, knowing that they wouldn't have to now go hire a lawyer to sue. And even if the lawyer had sued, and even if the lawyer had gotten a huge verdict, in the bankruptcy court, see ya, and you'd get it discharged in bankruptcy. And I don't want to belabor the point, but sometimes it looks like, and I know the Reisingers are, uh, very, have strong feelings of not hatred for Cameron Heron. I understand that. That's, that's what happens in cases like this. But it's important that the records show that the Herons did some things that maybe people don't understand that, that they did. That this, this was trying to undo what Cameron did. It, it's a small part, but it's $5 million. And it would not have happened without a substantial effort on the part of the Heron family. And you can quibble over uh, selling the house and the value and things like that. I was aware of that. And, uh, they, you know, when you pay out 500000 when you're retired in cash, that's 500000 you counted on for the rest of your life. And you start calculating mortgage payments and things, and the mortgage of the new place was considerably less. So I won't belabor that, but I think it's a very, very important point that uh, these people, uh, the Herons, went to some extraordinary efforts that, frankly, most people wouldn't. <clears throat> Go to bankruptcy court. Have a nice day. Now, the, um, uh, the Kim case that we cite is a federal case 
uh, from the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. Kim was a restitution case. This is not, we don't view these funds as restitution. Uh, if Mr. Reisiger wants to call it a personal injury settlement or whatever, that's fine or whatever, or wrongful death, wrongful death. But in Kim, the important part was that the U.S. Court of Appeals recognized the extraordinary, extraordinary effort the Kim family went through to uh, make restitution. They got loans, they sold stuff, they did an incredible amount to make the restitution payment. And we believe by analogy that that is uh, uh, a factor uh, that the court should consider here. And we believe that it's the type of, uh, it, it, it's, it's one of those cases or one of these situations that um, under Whiteside, which we cite in different places in the uh, memorandum, Whiteside is the second uh, district court of appeals co case, of course, and it, tight, it's, it holds that the downward departures can be for reasons other than by statute. I've addressed the adolescent brain, and I won't address that any further. Uh, restorative justice, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on that. I think Dr. Mayer explained that, uh, that uh, part of that is to try to uh, make things equal as best as possible. Then uh, I want to briefly address the pre-sentence report that was ordered in this case because there's a comment in here that I, I don't think I've seen. Usually DOC says all the time, uh, uh, follow the guidelines. But, and maybe they do this, you've seen many, many more of these judges than I have. But under, the, the DOC has a, a portion on their uh, report, alternative recommended dispositions. And they, the, uh, Parole off, probation parole officer states that if the court elects to depart from the recommended sentencing guidelines uh, or cr criminal punishment code sentence, the following alternative dip disposition is provided for the court's consideration. 20 years probation with special conditions, 100 hours of public service per year, speaking about the dangers of street racing with local law enforcement agency victim impact panel, and driver's license revocation for 10 years. And the reason I note this is that my experience, again, has been, uh, I don't see these things from the DOC. Just max them out, do this, and they move on. And something, uh, and I have no, I, I don't know, I haven't talked to the probation officer, something motivated or in her uh, experience and judgment that this was an alternative sentence suggested to the court. And I think that's something the court gives weight to as you fashion a sentence here, because again, I don't see that a lot. So I think that touches on our reasons, Judge. I didn't mean to speak so long, but this is obviously an important moment for my client and his family. And I think as we look at things, and Mr. Hubbard will speak, and I'll have a chance to speak afterwards, of course, but what do you do here? What do you do? It, it's a very, that's why I'm glad you're a judge and I'm not, because th these are the decisions that have arguments on both sides. We have horrible facts of what happened. We have, from all accounts, a normal, nice kid. So what do you do? Do you put him in a, in a Florida state penitentiary for 30 years? So what does that accomplish? Well, some people might be happy with that. But in the big scheme of things, warehousing someone like Cameron Heron doesn't accomplish anything, in, in my opinion. Uh, I think there can be punishment, but there are degrees of punishment. And 18 years, 30 years, you're, you're, just, you're just ending his life in many respects. I know people can come back from several decades in prison. Uh, this young man is young. Uh, he's not a 
product of the system, that is the justice system. He hasn't been in and out of jails where they're almost a second home to him, uh, for some, like some people. And it would seem to me that uh, the court should grant our departure motion and fashion a sentence that is fair, that will give him, uh, that will punish him, but also give him hope for the future, that we just don't end this life sitting in a at warehouse in the, in the Florida uh, prison system. Uh, I think it is very hard to fashion an argument that Cameron Heron should receive any sentence more than John Barano, that the state fully agreed was appropriate for these facts, and the Reisinger family fully agreed that it was appropriate for these facts, that it was appropriate to take John Barano from 18.5 years down to six years. A, a very, very deep, steep uh, sentence, a, a, a plea bargain. And we believe the evidence we have presented and the arguments we have presented uh, prevent, present, I believe, Judge, a, a very, very strong case as to why, particularly on disparity, a uh, departure sentence is appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hubbard? Your Honor, we're, we're here today uh, because of the actions of Cameron Heron, and quite frankly, Cameron Heron alone. Mr. Fitzgibbons is correct that this isn't good for either side. It's not good for either family, but, but for the actions of Cameron Heron, and quite frankly, but for his mother's own statement stating that buying him this rocket this 500 horsepower Ford Mustang vehicle which everyone described the loud exhaust as it was pulling away driving recklessly reaching speeds of 100 miles an hour up Bayshore Boulevard his own mom took the stand and I give her credit to stand here today and say that was a mistake to put that vehicle in the hands of an 18 year old kid or an 18 year old whatever you want to call him adult, juvenile, but all that, we wouldn't be here today. I would have never met this family. We would have never been in this position. And the reason I say that is because Mr. Fitzgibbons makes such a big deal out of the, the, the offer and the plea that the state had given to John Baranow. But what's interesting, and I, I know Mr. Fitzgibbons will have another chance to talk, but what's interesting is that he hasn't advocated for a specific sentence. He didn't stand here and say, give John or give Cameron Heron the same sentence because Cameron Heron doesn't want to stand up here. I guarantee it. And his mom and dad don't want to stand up here and say, judge, sentence my son to six years in prison. Take him away tonight, book him in the Hillsborough County Jail and send him to prison for six years. He hasn't advocated for that here today. And that's the difference. That's the one main difference between Cameron Heron and John Baranow. John Baranow's attorney came to the state and said, he is willing to go to prison. He knows he's going to prison. Let's talk about terms of years and let's talk about legal arguments. So I will make the record clear why the state did make an offer to John Baranow that the state wasn't willing to extend to Cameron Heron. Because A, the biggest thing was that, again, John Baranow's attorney presented extensive mitigation and legal argument as to arguments that they were going to make at trial. And the main argument, which is the most obvious and glaring in this case, is that John Baranow did not strike Jessica Reisinger or Lilia. And again, Mr. Fitzgibbons can stand up here and say, but for the grace of God. Well, but for the grace of God, we wouldn't be here. But for Cameron Herring driving 102 miles an hour on Bayshore Boulevard just prior to noon on a busy day where people are out jogging on what is a correctly stated gemstone here in downtown Tampa, four and a half miles of sidewalk, exercise equipment right off to the side of the roadway in the grass. But for him driving 102 miles an hour in that vehicle, we wouldn't be here. 
So to stand here and say, well, but for the grace of God, John Baranow could have been the one to strike the victim is absolutely false. Because the evidence in this case has shown, and even the court was able to, to observe the video evidence that right prior to the crash, that Cameron Harum was directly out front. And John Baranow was the vehicle coming behind Cameron Heron. So the state took all of that into consideration. The state also took into consideration that, and Mr. Rickman, his attorney, pointed out that we didn't have evidence of speed of his vehicle. So the state was going to go to trial with these two individuals, and all the evidence of speed was going to be as to Cameron Heron and not John Baranow. All of the witness statements, as Mr. Uh, Fitzgibbons had pointed out. Multiple witnesses describing the black Ford Mustang, multiple witnesses describing the sound of the Ford Mustang's exhaust, things that Mr. Rickman again presented to us that was going to go to his argument that his client was either A, not guilty, or B, less culpable than Cameron Heron. John Bear now again, we didn't have any evidence uh, from his vehicle, so we didn't have any evidence as we did uh, as far as prior incidents with that vehicle. And again, Mr. Fitzgibbons will probably address it, and he's right, we, we don't have any video, we don't know who was driving that vehicle, but we do know that that vehicle was at least captured on the data, and that vehicle belonged to Cameron Heron. So in formulating and fashioning who we believe to be more culpable, the state was able to take that into consideration. There was nothing that prohibited us from considering the fact that at least on one occasion, the vehicle data from that vehicle showed it traveling almost 160 miles an hour down I-75. And what a coincidence that the day before this crash on Bayshore Boulevard, an area where Cameron Heron lived, that there was evidence that that vehicle was traveling almost over 80 miles an hour. So that's another thing that the state took into consideration. John Baranow was a juvenile. He was 17 year old. 17 years old when this happened. And this court's well aware that the sentencing options for him would have extended to arguing for juvenile sanctions, youthful offender, uh, or some other type of uh, sentence as an adult. John Bear now gave all that up and was willing to plead guilty and willing to say, I'll take a term of years, let's talk about it. And we went back and forth, as Your Honor knows, there's always negotiation. Uh, I can't, the family, you know, there was a lot of talking back and forth, uh, but all of those things were taken into consideration. So to sit here and say that there's no difference in these two individuals, of course there is. There's always different levels of culpability. Your Honor knows the law in the state of Florida with felony murder. If two people walk into a convenience store committing robbery and one shoots and kills somebody, and the other just grabs the cash or the other one drives the car away. They're both charged with the same thing, but of course, Your Honor would hear arguments as to culpability. So there are clearly two different levels of culpability here. And again, the most glaring one is that Cameron Heron was driving the vehicle that actually struck these two individuals that we know just prior, seconds prior to this crash, was doing 102 miles an hour with John Baranow behind him, trying to keep up following him. So the state has made the record clear in this case as to the argument by Mr. Fitzgibbons about this disparity. And the state does this all the time, and there's nothing that prohibits the state from distinguishing these two individuals, and there's nothing prohibiting the state or this court from fashioning a different sentence for Cameron Heron from John Baranow. The other thing I wanted to address was the, the adolescent brain. Again, that's not a, it's not a statutory uh, reason for downward departure, but one of the most glaring things when we hear evidence of the adolescent brain, and this court may have heard similar arguments on different cases, but the one thing that was lacking in the testimony today was anything other than the fact that he was 18 years old at the time. We didn't hear any testimony that he was underprivileged, that his mother or father were drug abusers, or that he was developmentally delayed, or that he had low IQ. In fact, Dr. Mayer, I, don't, I think he said he didn't even do an IQ test, but he reviewed some records and said 
that Cameron Heron was a bright guy, that he reviewed some academic records. So when we talk about adolescent brain development, using that as an excuse or using that as some reason to fashion a sentence less than the guidelines call for, trying to distinguish him from a 25 or a 30 year old person that had committed this. Cameron Heron comes from a very different background from the type of individuals that we hear and we see in the research and we hear brought up in court on the adolescent brain development. So I say this because there's, there's two reasons for departure that I'm not gonna go into arguing against those. The bar is very low for the defense when it comes to establishing uh, reasons for departure, but I wanna talk about them because when you look at things like unsophisticated or too young to appreciate the consequences of their actions, at 16 years old, you can get a license. And I'm sure I remember my dad telling me, and I'm sure there's a lot of fathers in the room that have told or will tell their kid at some point as they hand them those keys at 16, and they say, okay, you can go drive that vehicle, but remember, you're driving a weapon. You're driving a very heavy automobile. You're taking on a lot of responsibility at 16 years old, and someone, I think smarter than me maybe has decided that that's the age that's appropriate. So to say that you can get a license at 16 and that you're able to legally operate a motor vehicle and drive anywhere you want, but then to turn around and say, well, the people that are doing this at the age of 18 are too young to appreciate the consequences or they're uh, operating in an unsophisticated manner, th those things just don't go together. Those things don't work. They may be a reason for downward departure legally. There's not any case law talking about incidences like this where uh, we're talking about vehicular homicide and people driving. But if the court was to use that, I think the court would have to pause and say, does it really make sense that 18 years old, that someone would be too young to appreciate what they're doing when they get behind the wheel of an automobile. Because again, we know from the evidence, and the reason I showed that graph was to show the court that in this case, the facts, as Mr. Fitzgibbons has stated at this point, are undisputed, that over that four minute period, Cameron Heron had to go and open the door to his car. He had to get in the car. He had to sit down, he had to put the key in, he had to start the car, he had to put it in drive, he had to drive out onto the roadway, he had to look around him, probably stop signs, stop lights, he had the wherewithal to drive up to the stoplight at Gandhi, and that's the reason I showed that graph, because his vehicle you see accelerates and then comes back down to zero. And then he has to have the wherewithal to know that when the light turns green, that his buddy's there and his, you saw the pictures, it's not a Ford Mustang, the Nissan Altima, it's a less capable car. I doubt it was really the coolest car at Tampa Catholic. I'm sure the Ford Mustang was. So as he looks there at the light and decides that he's gonna show off, that he's gonna begin to rev the engine and race up Bayshore, risking the lives of all those around him, is that something that sounds unsophisticated? It takes a lot to get behind the wheel of a car. It takes a lot of wherewithal to drive. It definitely takes a lot of wherewithal to reach speeds of 102, not losing control of the vehicle. It definitely takes a lot to, as the witnesses stated, maneuver your vehicle around other individuals so that you can go around them and that you can pull away so that you can reach speeds of 102 miles an hour. Those are things, Your Honor, that I would argue are not unsophisticated. They're not things that an 18-year-old person would be too young to appreciate. He just didn't care. Cameron Heron is a privileged kid. He's going to private school at Tampa Catholic. He just graduated. And good for his family. They worked hard for the money, I'm sure. But they brought it up. I didn't. She brought up the fact that they lived in this house, that they had to downsize, that it was $1.2 million. Not a lot of us can say we were raised in a $1.2 million home. 
But Cameron Heron had everything going for him. He had all the tools required to be a successful person, a successful adult. And he just chose to throw it away. He thought it was going to be cooler to go flying up Bayshore, to go 102 while people are jogging, people are riding their bicycle. And don't forget, too, Your Honor, that they lived in that area. So this isn't an area where he was just visiting, where he could say, you know what, I really didn't realize that road was that busy. They lived in this area. They knew the dangers on Bayshore Boulevard. I'm sure he had driven by those people on many occasions. But again, it wasn't that he was too young to appreciate the consequence. He just chose not to. He chose to ignore the consequences, ignore the speed limit signs, race his friend, and go 102 miles an hour until it was too late. Because as you heard some of the evidence from Detective Jakes that at that point at 102 miles an hour hitting the brakes, it wasn't going to be enough. And it wasn't enough to stop him prior to crashing and killing Jessica and Lillian. Your Honor, his actions are not the actions of a juvenile. They're not the actions of someone who should receive a sentence that would reflect him being a youthful offender or a juvenile. Again, why even bring up the youthful offender thing when this court knows that John Baranow, when he pled guilty, gave that up. He waived his rights to juvenile sentencing. He waived his rights to a youthful offender sentence. And he took what we had come to the resolution, a sentence that we believed was appropriate and we believed was much different from the culpability and the level of culpability of Cameron Heron. Your Honor, I, you've heard from the family. Um, you've seen, obviously, the devastating loss to this family. Uh, Jessica was 24 years old had her life ahead of her, Lilia, 21 months old. You've heard the statements. Uh, Brian Rabinalt probably said it best, but what, what more of a awful crime, what more... I mean, there's nothing worse than killing a child. You could kill 20 people, and you kill a child, and people will remember the child. There's nothing worse than driving 102 miles an hour in an area where you live, an area where you have been on that road, killing and taking the life. The, the, the loss to the Reisinger and the Rabinal family, uh, as, as uh, Bob has stated, you know, he came up with the, that term a year, 750 years, and I don't even know if that's accurate because to, to live the life, the hell and the prison that uh, David and the Reisinger family and the Rabinalts have to suffer through because Cameron Heron chose that morning to show off his car and chose to put his foot down and push that accelerator, weave around other traffic, and eventually, when it was too late, hit the, the, the brakes on that vehicle and kill a mother and a child in a stroller. <clears throat> Your Honor, the state would ask, well, one, Your Honor knows the case law that the, if the court was to find that uh, there were grounds for departure, one, the court has wide discretion, the case law is clear, uh, that the court has very wide discretion, the court does not have to depart even if it finds that there are uh, departure grounds proven. Uh, so the state would ask that you not depart based on the wishes of the family, which would give the court a range of the bottom of the guidelines around 18 years up to 30 years uh, for this defendant for taking those two lives. And again, I can't stress it enough. 
I don't know why it's so difficult to comprehend the difference between this defendant and John Barron. Now, Cameron Heron killed them. His vehicle struck them and killed them. And, Your Honor, the families, uh, you've heard them state, which, again, is understandable based on their loss. Uh, and then the last thing, Your Honor, I would ask that if Your Honor finds it uh, necessary to depart from the guidelines, uh, the state would definitely ask that the court fashion a sentence that would, and I believe the state has made the record clear, put more punishment on Cameron Heron than John Baranow. But the state's going to ask that Your Honor uh, fashion an appropriate sentence, and we know that you will, taking into account the facts of this case and the devastating loss to the Reisinger and the Rabinal, and quite frankly, the Tampa Bay area. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Can you uh, rebut? Can I have one moment? Yeah, yes, sir. Talk here with the panel for just a moment. Yes, sir. Thank you. Judge, thank you. Um, first of all, Mr. Hubbard indicated that we had not asked for any specific sentence or anything. I generally leave that up to the judge, but uh, I think I can, I can tell the court I've consulted with my client, I've consulted with his family, and if the court were to impose a similar sentence of six years, uh, the same as John Barano, uh, we would accept that. Uh, so I won't. I guess I was challenged a little bit there, so I want to tell the court that. Number two, I think we fleshed out a little bit, but not very much, as to why the state <clears throat> offered the six years to John Barano. Uh, and the best I could glean was, one, that um, they didn't have any speed on him uh, because of his vehicle, and number two, uh, that uh, it was Cameron's uh, car that struck and killed uh, the two people. Now, having been, again, through this case for a long time, there were some videos that uh, the state's seen that they produced to us from houses on Bayshore. They showed the one here in court that's on the record. Uh, when the two cars were traveling up Bayshore, they were either neck and neck, one was just barely in front of the other. Th this Nissan is not, a, is not your... Uh, granny's Nissan. Nissan. These things move fast, and if and it and it seems to me from everything I've learned in this case, a rookie prosecutor, first year out of law school, could have made a substantial case that the first car, Cameron Heron, or the car that was right next to him, Cameron Heron, was doing 102. That Nissan was up there, maybe 95, maybe 92. But the degree of separation and everything we saw in this case and that we heard from all of the witnesses is that they were very, very, very close to each other. So I think the state's kind of in a tough position here. I understand. Uh, but uh, I think what, but it doesn't really explain the disparity because they had that. They had plenty of evidence. In fact, the video that was shown here in court from the pool uh, if I recall correctly, the two cars were going. At that stage, Cameron was ahead, just barely of the Nissan. Boom, boom. They come into view. But Cameron's in the left-hand lane. John Barano is in the right-hand lane. The accident happened in the right-hand lane when Cameron somehow got to that lane and, and struck, which is very consistent with uh, what Mark Lewis uh, has said. So I think... Again, the record is clear or not clear as to why uh, the offer was made to Mr. Barano. I think the reason really is, is that uh, because Cameron Heron struck the, th the two people. If it had been John Barano, you would be sitting here listening to the John Barano presentation. And I believe that that's not the law, that when the culpability is the same and uh, 
that at one at this particular moment, Cameron was had slid out according to Lewis, and and he was there. But moments before, it was Barano saw the uh, issue and cut to the left. So anyway, I don't want to belabor that, but I think that uh, the state is uh, very very weak on uh, on why they've given the offer. I think that the the record is such that there, there's not. There really isn't an explanation. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say, uh, Mr. Hubbard was talking about, I guess this came to the sophistication argument that Cameron Heron had to pull out of his driveway, go to a stop sign, turn right, do this or that. And that might all well be true. But in all the evidence that's been presented, this, this case started at Bayshore and Gandhi. That moment in time is when it started. They stopped at a red light and in the next 30 seconds is when this happened so during those 30 seconds which are the critical that which is the whole case here it, it just was it was it was just a spur of the moment type thing it was not a sophisticated plan pre-planned uh, you hit the gas pedal and that was it So Judge, uh, I think in conclusion, if you feel it would be appropriate, uh, and we, we suggest that it's clearly appropriate from the record to avoid disparity, uh, the six-year sentence would, would, would be uh, acceptable uh, to us, the same as John Barano, because the facts in this case are just layovers, almost identical for the two individuals, equally culpable. And I just don't see where there's anything in the record that would su suggest an argument other than equal culpability. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, th thank you both for your presentations. The court appreciates all of the uh, witnesses who have uh, traveled and testified today. I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the, uh, I put in the record already all the things that I have considered. Um, I, I do still need to read the 43 letters. So um, I'm going to take a recess now and do that and then consider uh, everything, uh, so reflect on all of the testimony and arguments that I have heard, and um, then we'll, we'll come back. M my best guess is I will pronounce sentence sometime between 7 and 7.15, but uh, that's, that's just a guess. Uh, but we'll be in recess now, and as uh, so soon as I'm ready to pronounce sentence, I'll, I'll come back up and we'll be back in session. All right, thank you.